Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting to order, please. Uh, morning, Mr. Mayor, members of council, and staff and the public. Members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton, temporarily archived on the city's website. Other individuals and media may also be audibly and or visu visually, visually recording this meeting. Madam Clerk, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, good morning, Mr. Deputy Mayor, members of the committee. There are uh, just three changes to the agenda this morning. The first one is item 4.1, uh, presentations. On the agenda, there's a typographical error. It should read the 2013 tax-supported operating budget, not 2012. There's also an added delegation request from John Slobodzian of the Ministry of Transportation. He is requesting to provide an update on the Niagara to GTA corridor planning and environmental assessment study. Uh, his request is to present at the March 20th meeting of the committee as there is uh, um, a report on this issue which will be presented at that time. And since there isn't another regular GIC meeting before that for the committee to consider his approval, it's being presented today. So this can be added as item 8.1 under general information for the committee's consideration. And also, um, item 5.3 on the agenda, which is the staff report on the 2013 tax, op tax supported operating budget, was distributed by paper copy to members of council yesterday afternoon. However, if you don't have, didn't bring it with you, I do have some extras for distribution. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Councilor Pearson, Councilor Farr, all in favor? Thank you. Members of council, any declarations of interest today? Seeing none. Members of the committee, have before you the minutes of the previous budget meetings. May I have a motion to approve items 3.1 to 3.6 inclusive. Councillor Pearson? Moved by Councillor Pearson, second by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? All in favor? Thank you. Members of committee, item 4.1 is a staff presentation with respect to the 2013 tax supported operating budget. I'd like to ask Mike Zagarik to approach the podium to provide the presentation. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. The floor is yours. You, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, today marks uh, the first actual uh, deliberation uh, date with respect to 2013 uh, operating budgets. Up to uh, this point in our process, uh, committees received 
departmental presentations and overviews. And uh, you have before you today as part of your agenda uh, report uh, or agenda item 5.2, the 2013 tax supported operating, sorry, uh, agenda item 2.3 the tax, 2013 tax board operating budget recommendations. Um, as part of today's presentation, before I get into the budget presentation, uh, we'll be providing information with respect to the 2012 net growth, 2013 reassessment as context leading into the uh, budget presentation. So uh, in advance, I'll apologize for the length of the presentation, but we thought it would be helpful for committee members to receive uh, a summary through a presentation with respect to 2012 net growth and the uh, reassessment uh, prior to getting into the um, presentation uh, of the 2013 tax supported budget update. In terms of the presentations, there are, uh, I think are only seven slides with respect to the 2012 net growth. Uh, I can uh, take any questions during the presentation or if it's the will of committee, uh, I can take questions at the end of the presentation. The uh, reassessment presentation uh, is longer and has more detail and uh, I'm more than happy to take any questions during the presentation. And similarly, with respect to the 2013 budget update, I can take any questions during the, the uh, presentation. Council Jackson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So, Mike, um, procedurally today, um, I know committee will deliberate on whatever we wish to or not wish to, but what is staff's hope today, just so that I'm understanding timetable, process, uh, what's before us today, your presentation today. I'm just wondering what's staff's hopeful expectation, any action items today, still information updates through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Mike, please. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, in terms of the process we have, we've tried, staff have tried to do, is set up the recommendation report in such a way that will allow committee to deliberate on, for instance, the volunteers, committee budgets, the boards and agencies, uh, the departmental. Uh, if it's the will of committee, you could uh, approve or defer those budgets. Uh, we do have additional GICs set aside uh, one on the 4th of March, one on the 7th of March, one on the 21st uh, of March. Uh, there are a series of recommendations. Uh, it would be helpful if through today's deliberation, committee could either approve, sorry, the reductions. So there are a series of further reductions as part of uh, the budget update. Uh, if uh, based on your deliberations today, there's uh, a will to support those reductions. It would be helpful to understand which reductions we are building into our updates. Uh, if there's additional information, staff would come back either on the 4th, 7th, or 21st, depending on our ability to turn that information around. Uh, but in terms of the process, we've tried to set it up in such a way that will allow committee to start approving budgets uh, if, for instance, under boards and agencies, there are specific boards or agencies that uh, you would like to defer, you have the, uh, the opportunity to approve boards and agency, the boards and agencies budget, for instance, uh, but for instance, recognizing that there are still discussions with respect to Hamilton Police Services uh, budget, you could defer that particular budget. So, Mike, uh, to, to interpret what you said then, if we want to, the volunteer uh, budget committee requests that are here before us, if we want to uh, hypothetically approve those, some of the ABCs, agencies, boards, commissions, uh, some we don't, departmental budgets, some reductions, but overall departmental budgets, enhancements, still want to keep that over. We still have time, and just for members of council that may not be familiar, the absolute drop-dead date that council needs to make a decision to get the tax bills out without any negative impact is what? End of April as the absolute latest, Mike, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? Through you, Mayor. Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, our, to meet that date, we need to come back with our tax policies in April. In April. Thank you very much, Mike. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Just, uh, again, uh, Mike, through just you, Mr. Councilor Deputy Johnson. Mayor. Mike, Sorry. one moment, please. Sorry. 
Councilor Johnson. Sorry, thank you. And, and I'm glad Councilor Jackson raised that just to, to understand this a little bit better. Um, I believe that we're missing something in this budget, and it's another, um, it's council appointed uh, committee, and that's the Ag and Rule. Um, and it's not here. Their budget's not here. Their request for, for a $1,500 increase is not here. And I just don't know whether or not we figured that out yet. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, Councilor Johnson brought that to our attention this morning. And so staff are trying to determine where that's being budgeted for, whether it's within a departmental budget or whether it's a volunteer committee. We don't see it as a volunteer committee, so it may be in a departmental budget. But uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, similar to the uh, Hamilton Police Services, uh, the uh, boards and agencies, it may be, um, committee may, may want to defer the boards and agencies budget uh, as community partnership program is budgeted within boards and agencies and there's an enhancement for community partnership program and to avoid the need for a uh, reconsideration, if committee may want to defer the boards and agencies uh, as well. HECFI is in the boards and agencies budget and uh, I'm still following up with uh, Mr. Tolis with respect to uh, any potential savings in 2013 with respect to the HECFI transition. So again, there are, uh, it is a fluid process and there are still some, uh, some issues within the boards and agencies budget uh, that committee will be considering. Uh, again, Hamilton Police Services and Community Partnership Program being two. I think you're okay to go, Mike. Okay. So with respect to, uh, you have before you um, agenda item 5.4, the 2012 uh, assessment growth. And uh, as we reported previously, uh, 2012, the net growth is approximately 0.8% or $5.2 million. And this includes increases in assessment from new construction or supplementary taxes, as well as decreases in assessment from write-offs and successful appeals. The uh, 0.8% or $5.2 million, I'll note, is used to uh, offset 2013 budgetary pressures and it was uh, reflected in our January uh, update and it continues to be reflected in today's update. Uh, in terms of the 0.8% relative to previous years, uh, it is lower than previous years. So you see here that uh, over the period 2008 to 2011, annual growth ranged from 1% 1 to 1.3%. 2012 is 0.8%, as I mentioned previously. Uh, I'll just note that the growth in 2012 was reasonable, but offsetting that growth uh, are appeals and lower value new properties. And I'll speak to that in a few slides. In terms of the assessment growth, you'll see uh, the change in the unweighted assessment by property class. Uh, we apply the tax rates for each of the property classes to determine the change in the weighted assessment and it's the weighted <laughs> assessment that we use to determine the uh, municipal uh, taxes. So you'll see in the various classes the change in municipal taxes accruing from the uh, net growth in 2012 and you can see that residential is very much a driver in the net growth uh, 2012. Of the global 0.8%, you'll see that uh, the change in residential is a uh, significant contributor to that 0.8% net growth. Uh, in terms of uh, assessment decreases, uh, again, the net growth was 0.8%. Uh, the gross growth was 1.2%. So uh, there was approximately a uh, a reduction of about 0.4% uh, and that's due primarily to successful assessment appeals in 2012. And we've noted in the footnote here some of the, uh, some examples of significant appeals in 2012, including golf courses, McMaster Innovation Park and development lands uh, in the area of Highway 5 and 6, I believe they're related to Flamborough Financial. 
So in terms of uh, the 0.4%, that 0.4% uh, reduction translates into uh, a reduction in municipal taxes of about $3.1 million. And you'll see here in terms of the uh, breakdown of the change in growth, uh, assessment increases in existing properties of about 1%, and you'll see here that 0.4%. And that's assessment decreases in existing properties related to appeals. And again, some examples of the appeals are noted in the footnotes on the bottom of slide five. In terms of the assessment uh, growth by ward, uh, again, we, uh, we're showing both the unweighted assessment, uh, the weighted assessment, and how that weighted assessment translates into uh, municipal taxes. I'll just point out that of the 0.8% net growth, about half of that is attributed to activity in Ward 11. About 0.4 or half of that 0.8% is attributed to activity in Ward 11 uh, and some gains in Ward 12 and uh, Ward, uh, Ward 7 and 8 as well. Uh, the question has come up previously as to the relationship between the positive uh, building permits and the positive news around the uh, increases in our building permits relative to our assessment uh, information. And so there's three main differences between assessment growth and building permits. Uh, there's a lag of about uh, of potentially two plus years from when building permits are issued uh, and the property is uh, included onto the assessment roll. There are differences in valuation. Uh, assessed value may be years behind current market value. Some items included in construction, such as equipment, uh, while they are represented in the building permit values, are not represented in the assessment values. And property type also has an impact uh, government institution properties over the last five years have accounted for about 20% on average of total construction. And we know that uh, these properties are either exempt or subject to payment in lieu of taxes or uh, subject to uh, heads and beds. And so uh, there is a difference in terms of the assessment impact relative to the size of the impact in terms of building permit values. So again, the intention is just to provide a summary of uh, the report. There's additional information in the staff report with respect to the net growth, uh, as well uh, to provide some context to uh, your 2013 budget deliberations. Hey, Mike, I have Councilor Marula. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Mike, uh, with respect to, I guess, a, a growing concern from my, from my angle is the, not all assessment growth is created equal, meaning when we have assessment growth, for instance, in the suburban area, it is primarily residential versus that of the inner city, which is um, in essence already, uh, when you look at the residential component in, in the suburban area, what, what representative percentage is that versus commercial and industrial? Uh, for you, Mr. Deputy and Mayor, I'm not sure if uh, we have the splits, but I'll, I will point out in terms of uh, where we saw significant growth in Ward 11, that would have captured the Red Hill Industrial Park. Uh, so there would have been some industrial assessment growth. I think Canada Bread was included on the 2012 okay, uh, so assessment role. But I think splitting that is very important. Yeah. I, I understand the, this, the importance of Red Hill. Um, and that's why I supported it. But as looking at the suburban area and the residential component, I, I like that split because I think they're not created equal in the sense that anytime we're, we're dealing with uh, assessment growth residentially, we have to provide policing, fire, ambulance, parks, rec, and so on. And it, it, we're in a deficit situation uh, as a direct right. result. My, my primary objective over the years through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, has been with respect to the commercial and industrial growth where we don't have to provide those additional services, where we're basically, we're, we're in a surplus situation rather than a deficit situation. So splitting that for me is essential uh, because that really tells us the true story of who's contributing what and right. who's actually taking 
sucking away financially for, from the community. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, how can we get that information? So, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, staff will look at the splits in terms of the different property classes in an effort to try to isolate the commercial industrial versus the residential and try to do that. I'll see if, whether or not that's available by board. But I will just point out in terms of the commercial industrial is uh, that 0.4%, uh, we are seeing some significant pressures with respect to tax appeals and write downs in some of our existing commercial and industrial. And uh, our director of, of taxation, Larry Friday, will come back with a report in 2013 highlighting what's transpired in 2012 with respect to appeals and uh, as well through our 2012 year-end report we'll be reporting as to the impact uh, of those appeals in terms of their impact in 2012 with respect to write downs now through you mr Deputy Mayor, what would that number be had the appeals not been successful do we have have you captured that so through you uh mr deputy mayor You'll see here that the assessment decrease in existing property taxes is driving the reduction of 0.4%, and that 0.4% translates into about $3.1 million in foregone tax revenue. And again, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, has nothing to do with the municipality and everything to do with the appeal process set legislatively by the province. Is that correct? There is, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, there's a process, uh, MPAC, and the uh, and the parties who are appealing go through that process of, of assessing the uh, merits of the appeal and uh, as well uh, the process uh, allows for uh, consideration at the assessment review board and so uh, when Mr. Friday comes back in 2013 with the report highlighting the uh, what's occurred in 2012 staff are considering bringing forward a recommendation to provide authority to staff to uh, to seek out some assistance in terms of ensuring the municipality's interests are protected through that process and to assure that if there are any issues that uh, that the municipality feel needs to be considered as part of that process that we have representation as part of that process. So again, as part of that report, uh, we will be considering bringing forward a motion asking uh, that staff have the authority to uh, seek out some external support through that process as required. Yeah, uh, and I guess the, the, the brunt of that is the fact that it's out of our control and it's in the hands of the province and we're simply being a creation of the province, being yeah. again victim, victimized by that process. Um, on, on that front, with respect to the, the ratio between residential and commercial, I believe it was um, 80, is it 87.13? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm going to turn to staff. I thought it was three quarters, one quarter, but uh, we, we can get you this uh, exact split. Uh, but just to that point is what is reoccurring in terms of the reassessment impacts are not helping our efforts in trying to redirect some of that burden from the residential sector uh, out to the commercial industrial sector. Which brings me to my another point, which is very contentious and about 10 years old now, is the business tax reduction program uh, back in, that was supposed to increase or, or, or bridge that gap, which frankly we've seen a reversal of that. So I'm, I'm just wondering if we have an analysis of the shift from from the commercial residential, uh, sorry, commercial industrial component onto the residential back, and how much we've lost, we've been bleeding since, and really how futile of an endeavor that was, it'd be good to analyze this so that we don't repeat these ty types of mistakes in the future. Because frankly, we we shifted the burden onto the residential taxpayer and basically paid for, for industry to leave, we paid for their moving bills basically by doing that on the backs of the residents. So I would prefer, I'm not sure if I need a, an official or formal resolution, but an analysis of how that really was, went awry and how we can prevent that from happening in the future. Because far too often that, that type of mentality is utilized to try to rationalize what I believe to be an ideological battle more so than a constructive financial argument. So on the appropriate time, I'd like to pursue that accordingly. Um, but at this time, uh, that's enough of the questions for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Marilla. Uh, Councillor Collins. 
Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And Mike, I think we've all watched with great interest the, um, the record growth, but it's been coupled with record appeal numbers. And, and so it seems like there's a burgeoning industry across the province because I, I've read articles in the Toronto papers that this is happening in other municipalities. Um, and we're seeing great shifts between commercial industrial sectors and then the increasing pressures that, that go along with it to the residential sector. And so I'm, I'm wondering what role we, we play in that whole appeal process. And you know, when I look at what you've provided here, the golf courses, um, I, I don't think there's a golf course in the city that hasn't appealed. And it's no small, small coincidence they've all done it at the same time. And the same would hold true for the, the industrial sector, especially those in the lower city. We've seen this Delcos and the Defascos, and and they are again they're record numbers. I mean they're they're cutting their bills, not just in double digits, but in some cases um, I think almost in half. So I, I I'm wondering, you know, how we can play a more proactive role, and, and maybe that means inserting ourselves into the appeal process, and um, and, and maybe it means um, pulling back on some of the. I mean, Councilman Marula referenced the, uh, the BRT, but there are all kinds of incentive programs that we have here locally. The ERASE program, we have um, a, a number of other economic development tools, and, and those tools are offered to everyone, and I'm wondering how they can be used as well to curb the, or stem the tide of the appeal process. We certainly can't take anyone's legal rights away as it relates to appeals, but there's certainly a role for us to play in terms of trying to ensure that those appeals are legitimate and in fact, they represent um, maybe the the, um, the true cost of of what it takes to service those properties from a municipal standpoint. So I I know I've asked maybe a couple of questions in, in that statement, but I'm, I'm I'm concerned that this seems to be not just a growing trend here locally, but across the province. And I think it speaks in sole part to the fact that the legislation needs to be changed to ensure we don't see these wild swings. It's hard to budget under these circumstances. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, the Councillor is correct, is, is this isn't isolated. These are trends that, uh, uh, again, our Director of Taxation, Larry Friday, is uh, following across the province. Um, in um, certain municipalities, uh, they are being more negatively impacted if they don't have a diversified economy and they're very much reliant on one primary industry and if that industry is successful in terms of their appeal as I believe Dom Tar was in Dryden is that represents a significant shift in the tax burden from the industrial to the residential. So we are seeing some uh, common activity uh, across the province. Um, uh, I know that uh, Mr. Friday uh, in my discussions is helping me to understand uh, what some of those common factors are in terms of the successful appeals. There's a reference to economic obsolescence, which is somewhat concerning. Uh, if uh, that is a consideration through the appeal process, uh, you know, that, that term economic obsolescence may uh, translate into uh, activity in communities that are very much uh, heavily weighted in old industrial commercial uh, property classes. So again, it's, it's not just the industrial sector, we're seeing it in our commercial uh, sector as well. Uh, it's not just uh, the, um, the merits of the uh, applicant's appeal, what we're also seeing in the case, for instance, of uh, Highway 5 and 6 is some um, incorrect assumptions made by MPAC. And so when the preliminary assessments come out, and they assume commercial uh, activity, but uh, the site isn't fully developed and a significant portion of the uh, land is still agriculture. Uh, you know, the applicants are successful with the appeal. So again, some of that feedback and some of the work that uh, Larry and his staff are being proactive and trying to work with MPAC early on in their assessments so that uh, what we don't experience are overestimates with respect to the assessment and then appeals a year or two after. Uh, so in terms of uh, the efforts of staff, we're trying to get ahead of those initial assessment, uh, that initial assessment process and trying to ensure that those assessments are as accurate as possible. 
uh, as well. Uh, staff are uh, monitoring what's happening provincially, and as I had mentioned uh, previously, we are considering looking at how do we protect the city's best interests through that process and whether or not we need to secure the efforts of external support. And, and as you mentioned earlier, Mike, you've, you've monitored this process very closely, and, and I think the common theme throughout is that when NPAC makes an error, it costs municipalities, it doesn't cost the province. Is that a safe uh, statement to make? So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the uh, example I just cited with respect to Flamborough, you know, there were some incorrect assumptions in the initial assessment made by MPAC, and the consequence is that we see a uh, successful appeal in 2012, which drives that reduction of 0.4, which reduces our uh, growth and reduces our net growth. And it wasn't too long ago that municipalities rallied um, together through AMO and other avenues to uh, petition the, um, the ombudsman uh, at the provincial level to intercede and, and review the impact process. And I think there were a series of 26 recommendations or so, 23 might be the number. And um, the, the, those recommendations from the ombudsman were largely, I think, implemented by the province, but for the most part, they dealt with the rising costs of and the, and the dramatic increases. And, and I, if memory serves me right, there might have only been one or two of those recommendations that dealt with the appeal process. One of them, if I cor can, can um, correctly recall, dealt with the, um, if you purchased a property, then the, the purchase price then became the, the new assessed value. And it was one that residential homeowners would always argue, you know, I just paid 250 for this uh, property last year and you've assessed me at uh, 275. And so that was one of those that they, they immediately um, corrected, and I, I think that's now uh, part of their process. Uh, but not much of it, if any, dealt with the whole appeal process and, and these wild swings that we see in both the commercial and industrial sector. So I'm, I'm wondering if at your level, Mike, through all of the Ontario treasurers and, and those um, people who would be considered uh, Mr. Friday's counterparts across the province, whether they've come up with a series of recommendations that might seek to address this, again, to ch channel our, our energy and our, and our comments through the ombudsman, uh, hopefully uh, there's an investigation again as, it, as there was a few short years ago with the other complaints, and we try to close some of these loopholes that um, you know, are costing municipalities millions and millions of dollars a year. And, and you know, how far can you take that economic obsolescence? I mean, basically, you know, the Stelcos and the DeFascos could be arguing that the vacant parking lots they have, you know, shouldn't be assessed and, and there should be reductions associated, associated with that. But at the end of the day, there's a cost of servicing that area of the city and those specific properties from a municipal service standpoint. And so there's a counter argument, I'm certain, to, to theirs. And, um, and so I'm wondering if, if, if we're formally dealing with it or addressing it at another level. Right. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, I haven't had the chance yet to participate through the uh, treasurer's group. I will ask that it be on a future agenda as I'm seeing this as a common issue uh, across the province. I am aware in uh, Northern Ontario, there are uh, some municipalities uh, who are working uh, together in terms of uh, reviewing that the process and uh, impacts um, participation in that process. Uh, as I mentioned previously, in those municipalities where they are heavily weighted in one traditional industry, they are seeing some significant shifts uh, and challenges uh, through the tax appeal process. So again, I will uh, raise it uh, as a future agenda item at a treasurer's meeting. I'm not sure if uh, Larry, through uh, his involvement in uh, other discussions or associations, uh, is aware of any discussions. I'll ask Larry now if, if he is. If, uh, if not, we can report back at a future date. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, there's a number of groups that we do have. There's a, uh, a group of, uh, we, we have a person with an assessment background and there's basically every municipality has a person with a, an assessment background and they get together on a regular basis and look at trends, look at uh, things that are happening. Uh, the assessment review board process has always been a, a, a problem as far as I'm concerned. It takes far too long uh, for an appeal to go through the process 
And by the time that appeal goes through the process, that's when we're hit with a huge, huge reduction, uh, a huge cost. If these appeals were dealt with quicker, uh, we could budget much better because we'd have uh, correct numbers uh, on a much quicker basis. Uh, they have their own challenges at the ARB, um, but I think that I think we need to put some pressure on the assessment review board process to deal with these things much quicker. That's great to hear, and and you know our our record building numbers and the cranes that we see across the city uh, really don't mean much if there's a back door for businesses to find a way to reduce their taxes solely through the appeal process and some of the loopholes that exist within that system. So I. I think this needs to be on our radar screen. I, I know that, as staff said, they've been monitoring it, but I, I'd like to place this on our own outstanding business list and ask that, um, Mr. Chairman, if we could at the appropriate time, a staff report back on any measures that we can take, both internally here within our own uh, the resources that we have at our avail, and um, through AMO and other avenues with other municipalities to try to challenge some of these issues that we see as uh, that, are, that are detrimental and, and holding us back as it relates to assessment growth. So. At the appropriate time, if you can come back, maybe at the end of the, um, of the presentation, I'd, I'd be prepared to put a motion to that regard. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Collins. I have Councillor Johnson, Councillor Powers, and then Councillor Mueller for the second time. Councillor Johnson, please. Thank you very much, and thanks, Mike. Um, when I get a lot of numbers thrown at me, I get a lot of questions in my head, so please bear with me. Can you please go back to slide four? I guess that one. I noticed that you said that residential is still the main driver. But I noticed that multi-residential has has increased, decreased significantly. What is that all about? I'm not getting this. Yeah. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I should point out that this really represents activity that occurred through 2012. Right. And so uh, that change, for instance, in the multi-residential, and I'll, I'll try to capture this correctly, and if I don't, I'm sure my staff can jump in and, and clarify. But. In 2011, in the case of multi-residential, there might have been some developments, for instance, in Ancaster and Dundas that had a higher per unit cost uh, and, uh, or assessed value. And uh, when we look at 2012, depending on where that activity occurs for multi-residential, for instance, if it occurs where market rates are lower, the assessed value for those units will be lower. Oh, so in part it's capt well in, through you Mr. Deputy Mayor in fact in part it's capturing uh, where that activity is occurring if in the previous year it occurred in an area with higher market values uh, in 2012 we might be reporting a decrease in that particular sector which is just capturing the fact that year over year uh, activity could be occurring in different parts of the city with different market values for those units. Okay, thank you for that. Um, this slide looks a little bit different than the one on page four of your staff report, whereas industrial went from 21 million, but I think you've based it, you've cracked her down, 21 million to 80, and went up to 80 million instead of these numbers. So this is where, and, it, and you, you credit <coughs> Canada Bread for coming in and a few others. But Canada Bread was the main driver here. So I'm assuming that Maple Leaf is not included in this as of yet? So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I don't believe Maple Leaf is included, but I'm gonna ask staff in terms of what, what the difference is in terms of the tables right. that, uh, Councillor, you've identified versus uh, this slide. Through you, Deputy Mayor. On uh, page four of the report you were mentioning, right. that's just showing the the um, the point one that's making up the the increase in assessment. The slide shows the total increase uh, split by by property class. So this slide is is rel is the same one as is shown on page two of the report. Okay, I've got the page two report and the one that's on page four. So can you please again just describe what the difference is between the two of them again? Okay, so page two simply breaks down the point eight growth by the major property classes. Okay. And then page, on page three of the report, it breaks it down into how the, uh, the point eight was arrived at with either assessment increases, assessment decreases, or new construction. And then page, sorry, page four simply breaks down the detail of just the assessment increases. Okay, 
Thank you very much, Maria. Um, also, uh, if you can go to slide six, please. That one. And, I, and please bear with me when I, when I ask this question because I want to make sure I get the right answer. Very often, no matter where you live in this city, one area blames the other for subsidizing. If you're in, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a word out of the blue. If you're in Ward 3, you're claiming that you're subsidizing the suburbs. The suburbs are claiming. So to, in order to, to kibosh this right now, when I look at Ward 11, for, for, for instance, the average person reading this is going to look like, in fact, that's true, that Ward 11 is, is but it's not. Can you please explain again what this, what this chart is? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, this chart is simply capturing the changes that occurred in 2012 as it relates to assessment. So in, in Ward 12, again, uh, we're reporting the unweighted. We applied the tax rates to determine the weighted assessment. Uh, that translates into a municipal tax impact. So in Ward 12, the uh, municipal tax impact is $2.9 million in additional municipal tax revenue related to that assessment growth in Ward 11. Within the ward, that represents a 5.1% increase. And across the city, it's driving about half of that 0.8%. Okay, to be clear, increase. this is not the amount of people, because it, it did increase in population and, and dwellings. It's not the amount of, of development, it is the actual price of the development, correct? Uh, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it's the assessed value of each of the uh, units. Of, of, the, of the growth, of the overall growth. Uh, so in Ward 11, the uh, assessed value and the overall growth uh, is approximately in terms of the weighted, because we use weighted for setting municipal taxes, it's 280 million. In terms of additional municipal taxes, that generates an additional two point, just short of $2.9 million. Uh, but again, in terms of within the ward itself, that represents an increase of about 5% okay. in assessed value. So this 280 million also includes the Red Hill, well, all a big chunk of the Red Hill, not all of it a big chunk of the Red Hill. It includes everything, commercial, industrial, yep. agriculture, residential, multi-residential, it includes it all. Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it includes it all with the exception I'm assuming institutional would be, if there was institutional activity in Ward 11, it would be reflected as a pill or uh, as a head in bed or an exemption. Okay, so to be clear, this is not to, to point out who's paying the most, it's actually just who is been assessed so, more. Yeah, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it is, uh, we are trying to reflect, uh, in, in the case of this slide, where the growth, where the activity occurred across the wards and what the impact was within the wards, but as well how it contributed to the net impact for the city as a whole of that 0.8% or $5.2 million. So the 0.8% reflects how much we are we are putting against our levy or we're adding to the levy? Yeah. So through you, um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that 0.8% is helping to offset that the 2013. So it's, a, it's reflected globally. It's used to reduce pressures on the 2013 levy. Okay. Thank you for that, Mike. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Powers, please. Councilor McCaddy. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. And this is obviously a key item for us as we get frustrated all the great growth we're uh, trumpeting and then uh, we end up with a uh, somewhat less than that. Uh, Mike, I, I think I may have asked this question in the past, but if you can remind me, um, looking ahead, do we, just, do we see a light uh, at the end of the tunnel, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, for the, the large uh, assessment challenges? Uh, you know, have the top uh, eight out of 10 companies in Hamilton uh, gone this route and we're, we're almost through with those or we know there's perhaps 10 to 15 more to go or do we have any uh, sense of that uh, that may uh, affect how we respond to this, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor? So, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll start and then I'll ask uh, Larry Friday to jump in. Um, we are just 
preparing our 2012 year-end report and we're seeing some significant pressures in terms of our write-downs relative to what we budgeted for for 2012 uh, and uh, we are seeing some significant appeals that are still coming in uh, industrial as well as commercial uh, so in terms of whether or not this was isolated to 2012 uh, I would suggest we there are some pressures going forward uh, again in terms of uh, what the risk may be or how significant those pressures are I know that uh, mr. Friday staff are still working with MPAC to try to evaluate uh, what the uh, those pressures may mean in 2013 and going forward but I'm not sure if uh, mr. Friday wants to add to that uh, through your deputy mayor I wish I could say yes but uh, unfortunately every new reassessment brings new potential problems so once we have a reassessment the consultants get out there they bang on doors they look to see where uh, there's a potential to get reductions uh, for an example in 2013 multi-res are seeing a significant increase in values i'm anticipating that there will be a province-wide multi-res appeal against MPAC because they've changed a methodology. That will be challenged. That's what they did with the golf courses. They changed the methodology and how they assess them. They were challenged, they lost, and it cost every municipality millions of dollars. I'm anticipating that with multi-res, we're going to see the same. There's going to be a mass appeal by multi-res owners and whether MPAC can justify their change in methodology and their values remains to be seen. So I, again, I, I, the reason I'm asking these questions is that it, it may inform us on overall strategy, for example, ec economic development strategy uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what, what kind of economic uh, uh, activity we focus on to try and bring to Hamilton uh, it could it could uh, also perhaps inform our uh, our thinking around the new DC bylaw uh, we're getting into is that 2014 2015 uh, and uh, historically we've uh, provided a significant discount for industry for the industrial class uh, and part of the argument there is that's how we attract industry to to Hamilton um, yet we're being hit on the, the reassessment side of the industrial uh, initiative, uh, including some, it uh, sounds like some of the new uh, uh, companies we've attracted. So I, I, I'm not saying we need to do one thing or the other. It, it just, it, if this is something that we're gonna continue to face for the next five years or 10 years or pick a number, you know, if we, if we can get a sense of that, then we may want to look at other policies we have, Mr. Deputy Mayor, other decisions we have to make and maybe uh, make those differently knowing that this is a fact of life that we're uh, liable to face. Um, again, I'd, I'd, I'd be a bit more comfortable in making those kind of decisions if we were, if we were asked to make those kind of decisions or, or, or directing staff to consider those kinds of things uh, and come back to us. You know, whether there's the, the top 50 companies in Hamilton and 25 of them have already tackled this, uh, Larry just mentioned the multi-res uh, challenge, and that's that's new information that we'll have to plan for. Uh, I, outside of that, I'm, I, you know, you hate to sort of deal with this on a year-by-year -year basis, and you know, it's it's nothing but bad news. Uh, we we may actually try and intervene in some of these uh, cases, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, that uh, Mike was saying, we may actually uh, try and have somebody assist us in those. That would be a different step, um, which would be, I think, probably warranted by the sounds of things. But what other things are, should we be doing, uh, changes in how we do our business here at the city based on this reality, I'll call it a reality. And, and again, I don't know how long a reality it is, how large a reality it is, whether we've seen 50% of the impact uh, so far and whether we've still got 50% to go or, or whether this is just the tip of the iceberg. That's the kind of thing I think uh, we need to know uh, in, in order to, to respond in a strategic manner. And, you know, a guy like Chris Murray and stuff will, ne and, uh, will need to provide guidance to us, given the new world, you know, that, that we see here with reassessment, 
uh, what do we do as a city um, with other things that we do, uh, whether it's DCs or or other subsidies that we provide for uh, for industry or uh, focus on a particular type of economic development versus another type of economic development. Those are the kind of things I think we're going to need to know. Um, other, than, if we don't know that stuff, I think we'll just carry on as we as we are today, saying, "Oh, geez, that's bad news." So, thank you. Thank you, Councilor McCarty. Councilor Partridge, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and um, and I guess if we can go back to the. Um, uh, well, this one's good, yeah, for the for the assessment. And I, some of the things that I want to point out too, and I, and I like Councillor Collins' suggestion of, of putting it on our work pan, plan to just see where those discrepancies are. But when I look at Ward 15, and I look at, um, I, you know, you drive through the ward, there's this huge growth going on, and yet it's not, it doesn't appear to be reflected here. So I just want to confirm that we're really with with the um, with MPAC we're operating on a two, two and a half year time lag. Is that correct? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, absolutely there are, there is a time lag uh, and it may uh, extend out to two years, two plus years. Okay, and uh, you know, and, and I think uh, to other comments around the table, we get very excited when we hear that there's, you know, 1.5 billion in, in uh, value uh, for, for tax, uh, for permits that are being issued every year and so we're, we get excited about that the tax base that's going to be growing and yet um, you know we're still going to be two two and a half years and I know um, I guess I'll ask this question through you Deputy Mayor to uh, to Larry Friday but certainly in Ward 15 one of uh, one of the issues when it comes to tax appeals is um, properties that are in the green belt that are uh, trying to sell and um, they, they just are not able to sell them. So the building is empty and they're paying their, their high taxes. So they then go for the appeal to have their taxes reduced. And I'm just wondering, my question is, looking at the overall green belt throughout the city, is, is that something that's starting to occur more and more through you, Deputy Mayor? For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, the only real one that we've seen is, is the Flamborough Downs, and, and that's obviously with other issues. It's not just the Green Belt, but exactly uh, because um, because it is in the Green Belt. Impact looked at it, said they're you know potentially losing their slots. Uh, the horse racing industry is in trouble. What could be done on that property? Very little. Therefore, there was a significant reduction this year that Impact uh, mm -hmm. took it upon to to do. Um, we've had other properties, we've had other uh, uh, businesses up there, Meisner Antiques, for example. She's very limited in what she can do, but yet she's paying a, a commercial tax and a, and a high tax, and it affects uh, what they can do. And I mean, she has appealed, she's won a little bit, but uh, I think if there's any industry up there that, that um, is at the end of its life and they're looking to to sell there's very little opportunity for someone to come in and do something different yeah so exactly and and thank you I, I appreciate that we also have complete tree services and there's different ones like that where they, they've been trying to sell for over a year year and a half the buildings empty they can't sell it because of restrictions also around just just uh, you know uh, site specific so we have those challenges and um, and I think it's good if we get if we get a, a list of them so that we can really address them going forward um, but I'm, I'm I'm surprised that those numbers are as low as they are for Ward 15 but it makes sense if we're looking at a two and a half year time lag uh, because the growth up there is uh, significant good presentation Mike thank you thank you Councillor Partridge Councillor Pearson please thank you Mr. Deputy Mayor thank you Mike appreciate uh, the information so far and Larry did touch on the uh, question that I wanted to be sure that it was clarified it is it is the policy that changed with regards say to golf courses etc it was totally out of our control but also um, Mike when you mentioned specifically this side the slide assessment growth this as you mentioned it's not just new development this could also be factors that affect existing development where they have new development around there and their assessed values have now increased correct right. so that could have been a major uh, effect also so through you uh, mr. deputy mayor in this uh, table we're we capture assessment increase in existing properties 
uh, as well as a decrease in existing properties, assessment increase and decrease in existing properties, and then uh, these two items are related. For instance, if you have a vacant lot uh, that uh, moves forward in terms of a development, that vacant lot is deleted from the roll and then comes back onto the roll as a uh, developed uh, and, a, and a reassessed property. And along with that, the neighbors on both sides or in that whole neighborhood are also reassessed and their assessments could potentially go so up. So through also. you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through every reassessment cycle, they would be uh, captured. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, uh, Mr. I, I'm just wondering um, what is not caught here, and I, I haven't seen the slide, and I did arrive late, and apologize for that. Uh, you know, there's a $1.2 billion uh, investment on West Mountain, for example. Mohawk College has uh, got extensive uh, uh, building taking place in, in, on the front in the new rec center. Uh, Heads and beds is, uh, even though it's, it's um, obviously well below what the assess assessment would be, uh, nevertheless, it is revenue coming to the city. I don't see it uh, uh, categorized by ward by ward in any of these uh, figures. So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we uh, budget for the pills, heads and beds in our non-program revenues. Um, I think I presented that in the middle of February. Uh, and uh, in terms of the, the uh, current development, uh, the institutional development, uh, I expect that will come back as a heads and beds. So again, that, uh, that heads and beds, that hasn't uh, been adjusted at $75 per head in bed in 2010. Uh, council looked at uh, some recommendations and referred to the province to amend it in 2010. One option was simply to index it. Had it been indexed up to 2010, that head in bed would have increased from $75 to $125. But, but those are not taxable uh, properties and we capture pills and heads in beds through our non-program revenues, we budget those in our non-program revenues. Okay, and I guess my only concern when you make these presentations, uh, and I understand this is cons uh, uh, focusing on assessment, uh, it, 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 sends, it doesn't t send the full picture in regards to the amount of development that's taking place in, in, the, in the community either. It doesn't give a, a, a sense of uh, what, what are the other gen uh, revenue generators in this community in regards to non-taxes. Uh, that has been provided to the corporation. So this is just one piece of the story. There's another piece of the story, and there's been some significant institutional uh, developments taking place in the last number of years as well that is not reflected uh, in the context of growth and revenue. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, absolutely. The, the intention of this presentation and this report is to report on the net change in uh, taxable assessments growth in 2012. In terms of the overall economic activity that's occurring in terms of uh, expansion, development, in terms of growth in sectors such as institutional, the intention of this report is not to report on the overall economic benefit of that. It's simply to identify what transpired in 2012 with respect to gross growth uh, and uh, write downs and appeals and what the net growth impact in 2012 was and how it impacts our 2013 budget. Appreciate that. Um, by 13. For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the councillor's ahead of me. Yep. I haven't oh, got to this sorry. presentation yet. <laughs> sorry, okay, so, uh, but you did talk about the, uh, the lag, lag time in regards to assessment. You got two plus years. Um, have we been talking to, because I know, uh, and, and actually we've, we discovered this through the snow removal, and I think uh, uh, I actually had a call from a little enclave that is Ancaster, which is off of uh, Upper Horning uh, in snow removal. And what, we, what was clear to me is that we got a lot of people living in new homes. They're not paying uh, um, the appropriate taxes for the, the level of home that they have. So they're already occupied, but they haven't been assessed. So how does that happen when they're what, how can we don't reconcile once occup, uh, occupancy that they're paying their full pop? So uh, through you, Mr. Big Mayor, I'll refer it to Larry and I'll ask Larry just to identify in terms of whether or not the city has any risk in terms of the leg. Uh, I don't believe we, we have any. I think it's within that accepted period, but I'll ask Larry. 
to respond. Your Deputy Mayor, uh, there's really two lags. There's the, the time lag of, of the building permit being issued. You can get a building permit today, but you may not start construction for two years. Uh, so we may show building permit revenue today, but it, we're not gonna see any assessment for two, maybe three, maybe four years. Once a building is occupied, so the, the process is the building department issues the occupancy permits, they uh, um, advise MPAC of all those permits that they've issued, then MPAC's job is to go out and pick them up. They've got three years basically to pick them up, current plus prior two. So MPAC will go out, they'll assess it, they'll give us a what we call a supplementary listing or an omitted listing. And that could be, um, we could be taxing somebody in 2014 for 2012, 2000, or yeah, 2012, 2013, and 2014. So they, they will get picked up. We watch that very carefully. We have somebody monitoring all the activity that's going on, and we monitor to make sure that things are getting picked up by MPAC. Uh, I appreciate you monitoring, but I can identify uh, a, a second phase of Carpenter Park, which is uh, probably 75% occupied, it hasn't been released, and they're not assessed, so they're paying uh, much less, even though they've been living there for probably a year or two, almost two. So uh, I didn't understand better how we performance manage that process, because I can identify clearly a significant development area that are there's occupancy, and in some cases, almost uh, over a year of occupancy, maybe even two, and they're still paying uh, a, a, a quite a reduced rate in regards to their taxes. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, they may be paying a reduced rate now, but they, we will go back, they will get billed, and they will be paying uh, for those prior years through a supplementary omitted assessment. Okay. So, so they, will, they will get a bill, uh, a large bill, um, for a catch-up, if you will. Okay, so we don't lose it, it's just we don't get it uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, as long as MPAC does their job and picks them up. If, if, they, if they miss uh, a whole subdivision, for example, and they miss it for five years, we would be out of luck for two of those five years. That's why we monitor it to make sure that um, MPAC is, is told you need to pick up this this subdivision by this date in order for us to get our full tax revenues. Okay, and I think maybe the councillors could probably facilitate and ensure that uh, if there is, appears to be uh, an area uh, that has been missed, that we catch it and, 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 not, and we catch it within that five year uh, uh, period so that we can recoup the cost. Is there interest on that, uh, uh, on the, the, the tax assessment going back three years? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, no, there is no, we don't go back and, and say, well, you should have paid um, back in 2011. I mean, it's it's not the taxpayer's fault. Uh, I think you'd be getting a lot of phone calls of people screaming and yelling if, if, we, uh, if we did that. So we bill them, we tell them, here's what your taxes are. Uh, we get a lot of screaming and yelling that we're even going back uh, a couple of years. We give them... Uh, two installments to pay it. We give them the opportunity to spread it out by joining one of our pre-auth plans. We try and accommodate the taxpayers as much as we can, but no, we, we would not go back and say, uh, you've been living here for a number of years, here's your bill, and uh, on top of that, we're gonna charge you penalty and interest. So clearly through the chair, clearly through this process, there's foregone uh, revenue as a result of this pro process, because if you're not receiving it uh, immediately and you're holding back three years, there's no interest on it, uh, uh, obviously, and I'm not asking for interest, but I'm saying because of the process, uh, the city's losing money. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that lag does translate into some foregone revenue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Councillor Marilla, second time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And uh, on the salient point that Councillor Collins has made and uh, Councillor Whitehead with respect to the heads and beds, it raises the question surrounding the collective impact of the province on the city of Hamilton when we incorporate uh, downloading, reassessment, and the heads and beds. And I'd like to know what that total impact is uh, to the residential taxpayer. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Mike, you wouldn't happen to have that 
off the top of your head, would you? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I know we reported in 2010 in terms of some options. Uh, if that institutional assessment, and more specifically, for instance, if that heads and beds was indexed in, at 2010 at $125 instead of the $75, was it about $10 million? Three, Mr. Deputy Mayor, instead of providing incorrect numbers, we'll provide committee with the numbers, but we provided some scenarios. The heads and beds, if it were to be indexed uh, up to $125, what the additional revenue would be in terms of municipal taxes. If that institutional was assessed at market values, commercial or industrial, and we can provide those different scenarios and what the additional uh, municipal tax uh, benefit would be. So on that point, so we have, if we can report back on that. Secondly, the reassessment total we know, it's 3.1 million, is that correct through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor? So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the 0.8% translates into uh, additional uh, municipal tax revenue of 5.2, the 0.4 uh, reduction translates into a reduction in municipal taxes of 3.1 million. Okay. So the heads and beds in around 10 million, but you're going to report back. The reassessment is at 3.1 million, and downloading is at in and around 120 million. So it's an incredible amount of money when we look at We're looking at over 100, nearly $140 million of our operating budget has nothing to do with the city of Hamilton and everything to do with the province, represents about 20 to 25 percent of what everyone's paying in taxes. So at the appropriate time, I'd like to move that we capture the downloading, the reassessment, and the heads and, and beds uh, number just so that we can have some sort of understanding of how we're starting every year in a deficit situation as a result of the province and not as a result of this governing body. So uh, that's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Morelli. Thank you, Councillor Marula. Councillor Whitehead. Uh, you, I think you want, might want to add PILTS to it as well. My understanding that uh, uh, on FCM there was a lot of uh, study and research. Now, PILTS doesn't impact Hamilton as much as, say, some other communities. But if I remember right, uh, the, the PILTS comes up to about uh, less than 25% of the overall value or assessment of the, uh, of the, uh, the land or property that's owned by the federal government. Uh, heads and beds, I think, is the same line. And the, uh, we don't, and I believe we can get the actual value or assessment value of the institutions and then translate what that could be in, uh, in taxes and then show what the, uh, the heads and beds we receive just so we do the comparison. I guess the other bugaboo for me is that we've, uh, certainly in our healthcare system, uh, we're serving 2.5 million people uh, uh, within a regional catchment area. They're driving and utilizing our services, our roads, and, and so forth. Taxes are supposed to pay for it. We're getting heads and beds, but we're not getting any subsidy from the province in regards to uh, the additional load they're putting in our community by identifying us as a regional center for health care. Um, so that's another issue that uh, we need to talk about and how we uh, capture that in regards to ensuring that we get some equity and fairness from the province. Uh, when uh, so many people are utilizing our services, but we're not capturing it in regards to uh, um, revenue. Just, just through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, sorry, if, if I misled committee to suggest that 2010 report focused just on heads and beds, it actually captured pills as well. So when we report, uh, provide you that copy of that report, you'll see reference to heads and beds and pills as well. You might have no further speakers, so continue on your presentation, please. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, the next uh, presentation focuses on the 2013 uh, reassessment, and uh, this is agenda item 5.5 in your agenda today, and you'll have report FCS 13022 uh, in your agenda 2013 reassessment impacts. 2013 marks a new general uh, reassessment. Uh, the reassessed values uh, Re represent the values as of January 1st, 2012. The previous reassessment uh, was in 2009, and uh, the values uh, were based on the date of January 1st, uh, 2008. And you'll see a slide uh, coming up that compares some changes in the 2013 reassessment to previous years. Uh, 
Similar to the previous reassessments, uh, assessment increases are phased in over four years, 2013 to 2016. And I will point out uh, previous, similar to the previous reassessment, if there is a decrease in reassessment, the property owner receives that benefit all in 2013. So increases are phased in over four years. If you benefit from a decrease, you receive that benefit all in 2013. It's not phased in over the four years. Uh, in the presentation, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll provide the, the overall impact, but uh, I will be very much focusing on 2013, which represents year one of the four year uh, phase in reassessment. So citywide, uh, the, this graph shows a full reassessment increases, uh, assuming there was no phase in. So if it was all uh, effective January 1st, 2012, you'll see the full reassessment uh, increase is about 13%. The commercial and industrial are just slightly below, sorry, uh, commercial and industrial are below that citywide average and residential is slightly below uh, the citywide average. Uh, Mr. Friday identified the uh, the change in multi-residential, and this uh, reflects uh, in part based on feedback from MPAC. They changed their valuation methodology. They changed it from actual rents to fair market value rents. So there's been a change in uh, MPAC's uh, methodology in uh, determining the, um, the assessed value of multi-residential, and as Mr. Friday's identified, that's been province-wide, that's been applied, that change been applied province-wide, and we're seeing similar trends province-wide. We see a significant increase in farmland. Uh, that has been um, some of the factors that have been identified that's driving that increase is uh, the recent drought and the impact that that drought has had on supply of, uh, of cash crops, more specifically, of corn and other grains, uh, as well as uh, the fact that there's limited supply of farmland and that's attributing to the change in, uh, in, in assessed value uh, as well with respect to farmland. And so in terms of the, uh, the citywide average, again, you'll see that uh, residential is just slightly below that citywide average, uh, commercial industrial below and multi-res because the change in the methodology in terms of valuation by MPAC is above that and because of some of the environmental, uh, recent environmental conditions and because of limited supply in farmland, farmland is reported above uh, that citywide average. When we take, so again, this is uh, the total change. If we take that total change and we just represent the first year recognizing that total change will be captured over four years, it's phased in over four years, so again, that 13% will be phased in over the next four years. In year one, the change is about 3.1%. And you'll see it, it isn't not necessarily exactly one quarter, as I mentioned previously, is if you increase, if you see an increase in your assessment, that's going to be phased in over the four years. If there's a decrease in your assessment, you realize that all in 2013, uh, year one of the uh, reassessment. So Mike, and probably on the couple of slides you've had now, I've had uh, Councillor Partridge, Councillor Collins, and Councillor Johnson. So Councillor Partridge, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay, Mike, if you can go back to the previous slide, and I know you're expecting this. Mm -hmm. So help me get my head around this. Are we saying that because there was a drought, because the cash crops were lower, we are assessing the taxes to be higher so we're actually charging the farmer more taxes and in effect penalizing them because they've not had the cash crops coming in, which is their part, a huge part of their income. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to try to be clear, uh, the change in assessment is driven by MPAC. MPAC is capturing in that change in assessment uh, factors such as recent droughts, the impacts of uh, the recent droughts in terms of supply of cash crops, including corn and other grains, and global demand, 
for those crops as well as limited supply of farmland. So to be clear, uh, these are the, uh, the changes in the assessed value that MPAC is capturing and they're taking into consideration these global environmental economic factors when determining those assessment changes. In terms of uh, historically what the uh, City of Hamilton has done with some of these farmland uh, changes is uh, and you'll see later in my presentation reference to our tax policies. We have tried to mitigate some of these shifts in previous years as it relates to farmland through tax policies. And similar to previous years, we would be coming back in April with our tax policies with some options in terms of uh, mitigating these uh, assessment shifts and more specifically around farmland and potentially residential uh, and so those would be local actions that council could consider in an effort to try to mitigate some of these shifts. Okay, so that will be coming back, that will be coming to us in April? For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that forms part of our tax policies that subject to the timing of the budget deliberations, we're currently targeting April to come back in April with those. Okay, thank you. So to be clear, what I heard in your answer though is that it's not the city that's assessing and penalizing, it's actually MPAC that's doing that, yeah. thank you. Um, I have to ask though, uh, in, in that number, 34.3%, I mean, that's, that's huge. How much of that has to do with monster homes being built on large parcels of agriculture land? Um, you know, $1.2 million home goes up be beside a little tiny house that uh, a farmer and, and family have lived in for 30, 40 years, sometimes even 100 years. Um, and then this, this massive home goes up and property next to it. So that has an impact on that neighborhood and in some neighborhoods that are experiencing more than our others, but how much of that is as a result of that? So, so through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I'll have to turn to Larry. I'm not sure if Larry understands how that may factor into that global change. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, when MPAC uh, assesses farms, they're looking at actual sales and it's, it's farm versus farm. Uh, they don't take into account that uh, farmland has been sold and, and developed. This is strictly farm sales that they're looking at and they've seen a huge jump in the value of farms being sold. So farms, farms are selling uh, for a lot more than they were four years ago. And I understand that. But I have to, I have to wonder, that, you know, I, I, I would probably wager that yes, the farms are being sold and yes, people are paying more for them because yes, they're putting up these huge monster homes so they can afford to pay more and to put the monster home up. But that affects, that affects all the farmland in the area. Is that accurate? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, if, if the home is on the farmland, and yes, they've gone and built a million dollar home on the farmland, then that would factor into the value, which would affect, obviously, if uh, some smaller uh, farm uh, home on a, on a smaller farm would be affected by that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. I have Councillor Collins. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and through you to Mike. Mike, I have a very large parcel of uh, property in my area, and it's um, it, the development plans were approved, I think, in the mid to late 80s. I think it's the oldest um, approved subdivision that we have in the city that's yet to be built. It's on Green Hill, and I believe it's still a an, an agricultural zoning on it, and it hasn't been farmed in maybe 15 or 20 years. And I'm wondering how the property in that in that situation would be taxed. Is it taxed still at the farm rate or would it be taxed at um, the residential rate? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I believe if, if it's assessed as agricultural, it would be taxed as... as uh, and is it an issue farming. still if it's, been far if it's actively being farmed or not? Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll have to ask Larry whether or not that's a condition of the assessment. Mr. Deputy Mayor, in order to get the farm tax rate, it has to be actively farmed. But when MPAC values uh, uh, an acre of development land, uh, if it's farm, if it's agricultural, they develop or they value that land much lower than if it's serviced, developable land. So uh, 
we'd have to take a look at that property to to see how they have it uh, assessed and why. Um, when we talked about um, some of the development lands in Highway 5 and 6, uh, MPAC went in and said, okay, it's development land, we're going to take it from 40,000 an acre to, to 150,000 an acre in value. And they came back and said, well, there's all kinds of holding provisions on this land, we can't do anything with it until roads are put in, until sewers are put in. And they won their appeal and they, and they got those big reductions. So we'd have to look to see if this piece of land in your ward is, is similar. Is, is there reasons why it's not being developed? Um, is there conservation reasons? Is there mm. uh, holding provisions on it that things need to be done? So we'd have to take a look at that. Uh, my, my question would be too that you know, there's, there's significant value, especially for residential land within the urban area. And so it, they wouldn't take into account though the are they taking into account the true value of it if it's on the market tomorrow that becomes the assessed value of it for, on a per acre basis so uh, through you mr. deputy mayor um, Larry can jump in I'm assuming if it changes uh, if uh, zoning change is brought forward and it changes from farmland agricultural to residential uh, that would be captured now whether or not there would be a lag in that uh, there may be a lag, but uh, through that that change in zoning or use it would be captured by impact uh, But again as Larry's pointed out if there are examples that councillors have where you have questions on how it's being assessed and taxed uh, Feel free to provide that information right. to Larry, and I'm sure his staff can respond. Thanks for that. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, and uh, Councillor Partridge touched on exactly what I was going for. I thought we were penalizing our farmers as well. So just to be clear, because of the global drought, not not the drought we had here, which was not best, so it's because the product that we're producing now in our agricultural lands is at a higher demand because of the drought elsewhere, correct? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, Absolutely, the drought is not limited to just this region. Right. It would include the U.S., uh, but it's the global supply for, for instance, cash crops such as corn and other grains okay. uh, that contribute to the value of that farmland, and uh, that is what is being captured in the change in reassessment and okay. as it relates to farmland. And thank you for that. And having heard this, not understanding that MPAC actually looks at the global markets in order to assess your properties. Do they do the same thing for commercial and, and industrial? Well, Walmart's doing real well, so I guess we'll, we'll tax them higher. Or, you know, coffee shops are getting a lot of business, so we'll tax them higher. I don't understand how they can look at the global market and then turn around and say, well, your land will be worth more because of that. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I don't believe that the global market factors into the commercial industrial, but there's many factors that factor into commercial industrial, and I'll let Larry speak to that in a second. But I just want to be clear, in terms of farmland, it's really the value of that farmland in the case of cash crops, corn and grain. There's an increased value in that farmland, and that increased value is being driven in part by, the, by droughts uh, outside of this re region. Okay. Um, through you, Deputy Mayor, to Larry. Larry, do you see that happening with the other sectors as well, or just this is the first time you've heard of this because it's the farming sector? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, uh, with respect to the farms, I, I, I guess it's just that they've seen increased sales because maybe we are producing some good crops here while other areas aren't producing good crops uh, due to the drought, even though we, we've had droughts here. All right. Um, I, I mean, I can't really say whether our farmers are producing good crops in the last few years or not, but there seems to be a, a demand for farmland in this area uh, in Ontario, because uh, I, I don't think this is, uh, I don't think the farm was specific to, to Hamilton. I think Ontario, across the board, uh, farmland went up. MPAC would have to uh, confirm that. So I think because there's droughts in other places, but because maybe we weren't as severely impacted, our land has increased in value to others who are looking to buy farmland. Okay, thank you for that, Larry. And through you, Deputy Mayor, and, and Deputy Mayor, you're probably itching to jump in here as well. The, 
the neg I've got property just as, as Councillor Collins has, has referred. I have that same type of problem in my area as well. We've got farmland that is south of Highway 8 that's in the Niagara Escarpment Plan within the Green Belt. We've had lots of people buy it up with the speculation that they're hoping to, to develop or, or put their monster homes on it. Uh, and they're not being developed at all. And in fact, they're laying feral. They're not even, they're not even being farmed. So you said that you're, you take a look and they have to have, they have to actually be farming before they can get the, the agricultural tax. Do we review these files? Because this, this situation came up in Ag and Rule um, in our last meeting actually that some of the farmers or some of the people that are built buying up this land are either operating businesses that they shouldn't be operating out of that or they're just letting it sit and doing nothing with it and yet they're still getting those taxes and there, my understanding is that you have to have a registered number uh, as a farmer and you have to prove you're farming it. Is that correct? Are we reviewing these files? To Deputy Mayor, uh, to, to get the actual FT rate, yes, you, you need to uh, be actively farming it. You need to apply yearly through the uh, OMAFRA, which is the uh, Ontario right. Farm Board. You have to yearly apply through OMAFRA. So the process is the farmer must prove he's farming it through OMAFRA, then OMAFRA updates MPAC, and then MPAC changes it to the uh, farm rate, the, the FT rate. Thank you for that. And, and Larry, one more question just on this topic. MPAC, you just described the entire process to me. So from start to finish, how long does it take before you get this information in your hot little hands and apply the, the proper tax? Uh, through Deputy Mayor, uh, the farmer must uh, submit his paperwork into a MAFRA by, I believe, no later than, say, mid-November so that MPAC can get the changes uh, on the roll that they deliver to us the second Tuesday in December. The next year is when we tax it. We have many situations where farmers forget to, to put their paperwork in and it comes back at, as residential and then we get those complaints. Yeah, they get, they get on the phone pretty quick, I'll bet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> the other, um, and, and just, more or less commenting on, on Councillor Partridge's earlier comment that a lot of these farmlands cannot be sold because they're restricted. They're within the greenbelt, they're within the, so a, a developer isn't gonna come by and, and pay big bucks for a farmland that they can't do anything with other than putting that big monster home on. So I'm hearing on one side that farmland has increased in value because of the active farming that's being done on it. Conversely, we have Farmers that are getting out of the business, they don't have children that want to farm anymore. Other farmers aren't, are, are tapped out. So they can't sell their land because of the restriction. So I guess that's more of a, a rant than, than a question. But it still comes back to MPAC valuing their, their property, correct? And that's usually on based on what the other farms or the other parcels of land have gone for in price in the past. So that's it in a nutshell, correct? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, somewhat in a nutshell, I mean, there, there could be, like you say, there could be someone, uh, a developer speculating that, that he's going to be able to develop this land in five or ten years. And he may go in and pay a good dollar for that land uh, on the hopes that in five or ten years he can develop it. He may be speculating, and that could drive the price up. Uh, and it does. Councillor McCaddy's seen that in, in his ward uh, with the double cohorts when, when people were coming in and buying Westdale properties left, right and center and converting them into student housing, the, the prices went through the roof. You've got uh, a couple who's been there for 40 years. They don't want to sell, but their value was impacted. Their taxes were impacted. Right. Okay, thank you for that, Larry. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. And I will jump in later on on this. So, Councillor Whitehead. I just want to make sure that, uh, well, the first thing is uh, you got 13% citywide. Um, I get 17% citywide, so I'm trying to understand how you came with 13%. Uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, 13% is citywide. I believe there's weighting that factors in, so you can't simply take these percentages and assume equal weighting if, if, if that's what the councillor is asking. Can you explain that? So uh, again, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, residential may make up more than 20%. So if you were to take these five property classes, you can't simply add these five property classes together 
and take an average. If residential uh, makes up 40% of the total weight, of the total uh, weighted reassessment, then that would have a lesser impact than if farmland made up 40% of the uh, of the weighting total weighting. So, so, and I might need to take this offline, but it simply isn't taking these five property classes, the changes, summing them up, and dividing them by five, for instance, to get to the average. Different property classes represent different percentages of the total weighting. And so uh, we, can, we can provide that information to the councillor as to how the different weighting in the property classes, uh, how we arrive at the average. Yeah, well, and I, and I guess this is where I'm having the challenge when I, because numbers uh, uh, can tell many different stories. So I, I get 17.86%. You're saying that it's actually 13% because it's weighted. But the weighted is based on uh, actual dollars generated through those assessments. Is that my understanding? Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, I'll, get, I'll, I'll ask Maria to jump in if she can more clearly uh, identify or describe the weighting. But the weighting is residential as a percentage of the total weighted assessment. If residential, for instance, was 400 million and the total assessment was a million or uh, a billion is residential would represent 40% of that total assessment. And so that weighting affects the average. So if a property, if a class like residential had more of a weighting than farmland, that change between 2008, 2012 on average would be lower because of that. So can I understand then, uh, so we're talking about a 4% difference. So obviously 4% was weighted, uh, as affected the weighting on, on, on this graph. Um, but I don't see a breakdown or understand the breakdown and how, what the methodology on that weighting is uh, and, and what was the, uh, the major contributor in that weighting in, in the context of classification. So, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, we can sit down with the councillor. It's, it's, uh, it's not that staff are applying some form of weighting. It, we're just simply taking the total weighted assessment as it's determined by MPAC. And so if residential represents more of the total weighted assessment, that change in residential is gonna have more of an impact on the citywide average than farmland will. I, I, I appreciate obviously, uh, I, I sort of get it, but I think we need, I mean, I, I guess my challenge is I wanna ch uh, challenge all premises and all methodology uh, at how we determine numbers, how things are weighted, because you know if we really wanna move forward, sometimes you have to review all these processes. Yeah. And my concern is we, uh, I don't want to just accept it anymore. I want to actually uh, challenge it uh, and understand it. And without that piece being um, um, clearly uh, um, provided to us, it's, very, it's, we, it's just like we have to sit back here and accept it. And I'm not in that mode anymore that I'm accepting every number that throws at me without clearly understanding how we arrived at it. So I would appreciate uh, the offline, but I think we need to be able to somehow provide a slide that clearly identifies how we lost 4% in this uh, weighted assessment uh, process. Sure. The other uh, question I have is, uh, on, I guess in principle, uh, and I don't know what happens to jurisdictions around the world, but obviously in, in Ontario and Canada, our assessment system is based on uh, um, property value, correct? Uh, again, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, with the exception of institutional, it's based on current, current market valuations. Great. Uh, so when we talked, for example, in the farming, we talked about the fact that uh, 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 droughts in, in other areas have dro dro driven demand and that demand is uh, uh, made more attractive to purchase uh, property in, in southern Ontario based on those, uh, uh, um, those pressures. Firstly, the same argument could be made if we end up with some climate challenge in, in southern Ontario in regards to impacting uh, farmland. Conversely, uh, it, you could see a, a, a significant drop relative to other lands based on climate. So for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the other variable would be what the global demand for the product of that farmland is. Fair enough. Um, those are all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Councillor Ferguson, please. Mike, I have a lot of situations in my community where uh, there's small homes on very large lots because they used to have septic fields in them. Wealthy people are coming in and paying a lot of money 
tearing the little 1,200 square foot bungalow down and putting up maybe six, 8,000 square feet. Impact walks into their neighbor who have been there 40 years, retired couple, and saying, well, their, their property was worth that much, then so is yours. And uh, so my question to you, the question I'm getting asked, I'm not sure of the answer. If the assessed value went up 20% for their home and the average residential went up 12.7, does that mean their taxes go up 7.3% plus whatever the adjustment is during our budget process? Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the short answer is no. Uh, I'm going to ask Larry to speak to the appeal process because you, you raised the question of, of how a infill or a redevelopment affects a property because there is a process where the property owner of that adjacent property uh, could appeal if he feels that his reassessment is unfair. Okay. Uh, if it's but if, if he doesn't appeal, but does it go up 7.3% in taxes? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if he does not appeal his assessment, that assessment change would affect his property taxes, but to be clear, a reassessment change is not going to translate into a property tax impact. Uh, it depends on whether you're above that, that citywide average right. that you may experience. So assume they're up 20% tax. and the average across the city was, is 13, 12.7, which is a 7% gap. Does that mean their taxes will go up 7%? Yeah. That, through you, Mr. Mayor, generally, I think if, uh, one of the factors would be the property class. Residential. Uh, right. So it would generally about about 7% shift. Yeah. There is a correlation between the amount they're above the average is how yes. much their taxes will go up. As it relates through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I want to be careful. As it relates to reassessment exclusive of any budget impacts, exclusive of area rating, there are other impacts that will affect total well, I get that. Total just the assessment yeah. part, there's a yeah. direct correlation between yeah. how much they're above the average to above, the impact on their yeah. taxes. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, absolutely, if they're above that citywide average, they may see an increase in property taxes as it relates to reassessment. And, and just once again, to drill down, you say may. Is it a direct correlation? Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes, there is a direct correlation to assess value, but again, relative to the citywide average. And there are you on a redevelopment or anything further to add on my question? Uh, through you, Mr. De Deputy Mayor. Um, I guess what MPAC would do is if someone went in and built a million dollar house uh, beside a house that was uh, $450,000, they wouldn't just uh, take that $450,000 home and say you're a million also. But if somebody went in and bought a $450,000 house and paid $600,000 for it and knocked it down, then chances are that the person living in the $450,000 home would see their assessment increase to six hundred thousand yeah. dollars, which that's isn't exactly a bad thing. That's exactly <laughs> uh, but if I you're going to live there for the rest of your life, yes, because you may pay more in taxes. Okay. And and that's what's happening. People are walking in and paying eight hundred thousand dollars for a little twelve hundred square foot bungalow, and then knocking it down. And they're saying the neighbor's house is also worth eight hundred thousand dollars. It's, it's uh, through you, Deputy Mayor. It's, it's the same situation I gave with Councillor McCaddy in Ward One around uh, McMaster University. Uh, okay. People were paying big dollars for for small little bungalows for student housing, and that was driving up everybody else's assessment, therefore driving up their taxes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Pearson, can you take the chair, please? <coughs> Okay, so we're seeing the large increase in assessment of farm property, and Mike is uh, is right and partially right on because the global food supply is way down because of droughts around the world. We've had our fair share in North America, particularly through the through the crop growing section of the Midwest of the states. Uh, locally, we've had our issues too. So, part of part, there's a few things here. And I'm just going to take some time to explain this so we understand a little better. Price of farmland is way up. It's costing farmers a lot more to buy it. One of the reasons is less farmers, you have to get bigger because equipment's gotten bigger. You don't buy small equipment anymore. So combines used to be fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, combine harvester to harvest your wheat, your grain, corn, your soybeans. Now you're looking at $400,000 to $500,000 for the combine itself and the heads to harvest. Tractors used to be 20000 A decent tractor now is 150000 Tillage equipment's way up. Everything is up. Your costs are way up. 
There's less family farms, but the ones that are there, they're trying to keep the kids at home. You're buying all this equipment, and in order to pay for this equipment, help to carry it, you got to expand. So you have to you have to expand in order to carry that. It's business. Leasing land has gone from thirty to forty dollars an acre. If you want to lease or rent some land because you have this equipment, it's gone up to hundred. It's gone to two hundred dollars an acre. So the farmers sit and think, well, if I'm paying two hundred dollars an acre per year for the land. I'm better off to purchase it and have security because I need that land because it's equipment. We've also got people from other countries coming here and purchasing, and particularly out west, the Chinese are coming and buying land. And the farmers here are looking at this, and we have to secure these lands because once they're gone, they're gone. We don't have them. And that's part of the, of the issue, too. And it's true. The prices are way up. Corn is up 40 percent. Soybeans are up 40 to 50 percent. But our costs are up, too. So they're not making a lot of money because the price of grains are way up. And they're going to come down eventually. But they're trying to secure land, and that's what's driving this up. I mean, we've had farmland, and, and I've got a lot of farmers right now buying land, that was four or 5,000 acres, gone now to ten and 12,000 acres. But farmers are also competing for that because we have you know, a farmer down that concession has got all the equipment, one over here. Plus, we've got people coming from other counties. We've got them coming from Wellington. We've got them coming from Waterloo. We've got them coming from Brant, Niagara, Haldeman. They're coming in here to secure lands, too, and buying it. So, and a lot of them are big elevators, grain elevators, who, who do make money because the farmers take their crop there, they get dried, storage, uh, they buy their supplies from them. So they're making a little more cash to be able to afford to pay for this land. So it's competition for land amongst ourselves as farmers too. But based on the fact that the rent is like getting up to 200 bucks an acre and you figure the carrying costs, we need to secure that land. So as far as farmers making lots of money, and we, there are some big homes on there, but Mennonite uh, country up Elmira and about down there, ten thousand dollars an acre, and there's the house is just an old house and an old barn, and it's ten thousand still going up every every day. So there's competition for it, but we're afraid as farmers of foreign foreign countries coming in and buying the land, particularly the Chinese. It's gonna it's gonna affect us one day. So we need to you know look after our farmers. Mike's gonna work on making sure we get the the right rate on this to help out, and a little bit of an understanding and. We talked about farmers and people that own farm land. They don't have to work the land. People can buy the land. They don't have to work it. Somebody else that's a farmer that makes, which is peanuts, seven thousand dollars a year, under the farm business registration, he registers that, and that property gets put onto onto him as a as the uh, VC of the land. So that's how that's done. The person that owns it doesn't have to work it. So with that, I don't think there's anything else on here. Yeah, I think I've explained that a little bit. Well, back. Thank you. I have no further speakers right now. So, Mike, if you continue, yep. please. So, just to recap quickly through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the full string. The um, this graph again captures the full uh, assessment changes between the valuation periods of January 1st, 2008, to January 1st, 2012. Again, citywide average was 13 percent. Assuming there was not a phase in, this is what. Uh, would be reflected in 2013 assessment changes, but there is a four-year phase in of increases, and I'm not sure how I just did that. And I'm not sure if Carolyn did. <laughs> <Move to receive. laughs> So I'll continue on uh, through the handouts. Um, and I think it's slide number 12 that captures the assessment changes by former municipality. And you'll see that uh, we've uh, broken down the assessment uh, changes by property class, residential, multi-res, total commercial, total industrial farmland, and then for a total across the former municipalities. And you'll see that at the bottom again, consistently, we're showing the 3.1% total change in year one. And you can see that uh, across former municipality, it ranges in Stony Creek from a change of 2.6% to uh, in Glanbrook, a change of 3.5%. And you'll see on this table, when you look at that first um, column uh, of, of numbers, that residential column, you'll see how the residential very much influences that total uh, number. Uh, and again, uh, we'll speak to Councillor 
um, Whitehead with respect to the weighting. But again, uh, the, again, across the municipality to change is 3.1, uh, but across the, um, the former municipalities, it ranges from 2.6 to 3.5%. Uh, in, did I turn it on? No. In terms of uh, 2013 changes in assessment by ward on slide 13, you'll see the uh, changes by ward. Again, the citywide average is reflected in that line across the columns at 3.1% uh, uh, for 2013. Ward one is experiencing the highest percentage increase in assessed value at 5.1% followed by Ward 2 at 4.2 percent, then Wards uh, 3 and 15 uh, are both reflecting increases of about 3.5 percent. Ward 10 is experiencing the lowest percentage increase in assessed value at uh, 2.3 percent. Uh, I just want to point out in the previous reassessment, it was Dundas, which had the highest uh, percentage increase, uh, and in the 2009 reassessment, uh, there was less deviation in the high and the low. Uh, in terms of in 2009, there was a high of 6.8%, again Dundas, and a low of 5%. Through the 2013 reassessment, we're seeing more deviation, more of a gap. Uh, so uh, again, we're seeing a high of 5.1% in Ward 1 and a low of 2.3% in Ward 10. Uh, so again, I just want to note that the changes in reassessment do not translate into changes in taxes. Uh, and again, these are just simply averages across all the wards. And again, uh, to Councillor Ferguson's point, uh, your change as it relates relative to the citywide will determine if there will be a shift, a potential shift uh, in terms of an increase or a decrease. Uh, and also, I just want to point out these are averages across the ward. Uh, I expect in each ward there will be examples where they exceed the average and also where they'll come below that ward average. So in terms of uh, the reassessed value or average citywide reassessed value, slide 14, again, you'll see the averages by ward of the uh, average uh, assessed value by ward. Uh, you'll see a new citywide average assessment at the bottom there of 266,200. That represents a 3.1% increase. You'll recall in 2012, the citywide assessed, residential assessed average was 258,200. So uh, going forward, we'll be referring to the new citywide uh, residential assessed uh, average of $266,200, again representing a 3.1% increase. So Mike, if you can go back to slide 13 of Councillor Whitehead and Councillor Collins. Uh, well, actually 13 and, and 14, um, probably the same uh, implication. Uh, in in the, uh, the these assessments, it also includes and I think we talked about this before, uh, uh, lots of vacant land that is uh, not developed, not farmed, uh, however, it's, it's still assessed, in a lot of cases it's AA. That, those properties impact those averages. Is that my understanding? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it should have been clear, slides 13 and 14 are uh, residential assessments. These are uh, the averages of residential assessments. I understand that. But I think I asked this question uh, in, in the past because, I mean, to try and find a house that's 289,000, Ward 8, good luck. So uh, if that's the average, then I need to understand, I need to understand how you arrived at that number or how assessment arrived at that number. And I was told that vacant lots, uh, land, all impact on that assessment average. For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, I'm going to turn to Maria. She'll have the answer, I expect. For you, Deputy Mayor, that average is made of all properties that are coded with the residential property code. So that would include single family homes, uh, duplexes, condos, and also vacant land. Vacant residential land. So I just wanted to highlight uh, uh, for clarification uh, on this that uh, um, that can impact on the uh, 
on these numbers, these assessment numbers that we see that uh, if it's uh, a property that's already zoned residential but it's not developed, it impacts on it, and I got a lot of that. And you have, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, land that is uh, ready for development uh, but hasn't started. Uh, it's assessed at a much lower value than uh, individual residential. That also impacts on the uh, overall average. So I just want to provide that for clarity. I, I have, uh, Maria, I have uh, Councillor Collins and then Councillor Pearson. Councillor Collins? Mike, I'm not certain how uh, challenging a process it is to uh, provide the color coded increases slash decrease map that you had provided before. It showed almost by neighborhood and by property. It was like a blue and then into the pinks for those I think that were getting the reduction. And that was several years ago. I think you did it the one time. I, I don't know if that's a, an owner's task for staff to come back and show us those trends across the wards. As you said, there'll be pockets, but those pockets are usually by neighborhood. So the color coded system that you had utilized the one year and you may have provided it at other times, I thought it was very beneficial for us to get an understanding. We're trying to explain to residents, you know, what areas are seeing the increases and decrease. Um, is, is that something we can do again in yeah. 213? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's something that uh, both taxation and our uh, current budget section uh, develop in terms of tools. And I'll turn to Maria because I know that we provide a series of tools available to property owners uh, to try to determine the trends around their property and what's transpiring around their property. <clears throat> Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and you, annually, we do uh, have maps on, uh, on our website that GIS assists us, of, us, assists us with. And uh, what we do is we show the total tax increase and you can drive down to the property level. We can do it uh, possibly just for the reassessment, but every year we do update those maps and show the, the total tax change inclusive of budget and reassessment down to the property level. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And I just wanted to clarify, because when uh, Maria was answering Councillor Whitehead's question, Maria, when you mentioned is it the agricultural that's reflected in the residential percentages? Because I think you said just vacant residential property. I just want to be sure. It's not the agricultural, but it's vacant residential. Is that correct? Correct. Through you, Deputy Mayor, that's okay. right. Just the residential vacant land. I just want to be sure that was understood. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Whitehead? Just for clarification, if you have a lot of multi-residential in your, your, your ward, that could also drive the overall, uh, overall assessment down on the uh, single-family homes. Is that correct? Through, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, they're, they're, they're captured differently in terms of uh, single family. They have a different code versus multi-res, but I'll ask Maria how it reflects in that average. Well, you're looking at an average of 289, for example, and I know that you, you, you know, you're lucky if you can find a house for 289 in Ward 8, then the question clearly becomes what's driving that number. And I'm, you know, I gave an example on the residential land, but I also understand that because I do have a lot of multi-residential, that also will impact on that overall number. Is that correct? Yeah. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll ask Maria to clarify, but the, just to be clear, single family residential is different than multi-residential in terms of these averages. Yes, through you, Deputy Mayor, multi-res is in a different class. The residential class just takes uh, into account single family and homes up to, uh, I believe it's seven units or lower, um, and condos as well. Condos but multi-res would be in a different property class. The condos ex uh, are acting here. Condominiums are in the residential yes. class, Thank correct. You. Hey, Mike, continue, please. So in terms of... <laughs> so this is the take me with you. Uh, in terms of the reassessment presentation, this is our final slide. And uh, to Councillor Ferguson's previous point, I just want to make clear that uh, the previous information to this presentation reflected changes in the assessment, not changes in property taxes or tax impacts. An increase in assessment does not necessarily mean an increase in property taxes. And so in general terms of a property whose assessment is increasing above the citywide average may see a reassessment related tax increase. Conversely, a property whose uh, assessment is, is increasing less than the citywide average. So again, it may be increasing, but increasing less than that citywide average may see a reassessment tax related decrease. And overall, the final point, I want to be clear, 
Overall, there's no additional taxes raised as a result of reassessment. So in terms, sorry, that wasn't the last slide. Apologize. In terms of some shifts between property taxes, uh, you'll see again in terms of uh, the impact on residential, again, the two classes that were increasing above the, the citywide average was multi-res uh, and farmland. And you'll see uh, the impact on residential in terms of the reassessment uh, and commercial and industrial. And to be clear, we're so assuming no mitigating measures through setting our tax ratios. Uh, when we look at the shifts between property classes, and I just want to point out here, one particular issue is education. When we incorporate education into uh, the equation, you'll see that residential is decreasing, benefiting from education uh, and, uh, and resulting in a decrease in the residential of uh, 0 0.1. And so I'll just ask you to remember that number because you'll see it in the next presentation around the 2013 uh, budget. In terms of our tax uh, ratios, we're not recommending that uh, that uh, council exercise its its option to offset the reassessment related tax shifts tax shifts between property classes by uh, establishing transition ratios. So again, the first column is our 2012 final tax ratios, uh, potential 2013 transition ratios. You'll recall the provincial threshold numbers and these factors of uh, range of fairness, and I just want to highlight why staff are not recommending uh, and any mitigating reassessment task shifts. It does not result in any benefit, it would not result in any benefit to the farm property class. Uh, it would result in the commercial class exceeding the provincial th threshold and thus would become a levy restriction for us in 2013. It further increases the uh, high industrial tax ratios. Uh, it results in a 0.1% uh, overall tax impact to the residential property classes. Uh, tax shifts were not, uh, I just, we just want to highlight that they were not uh, um, introduced by council in 2009 uh, in an effort to try to mitigate the reassessment impacts in 2009. And uh, again, there is a potential for assessment appeals, which would help mitigate some of the tax impacts within certain property classes. Uh, and those are actions that property owners could take. And finally, uh, as I pointed out previously, as we will be coming back in April with our tax policies and we'll be looking at our tax policies as instruments as, uh, in an effort to try to mitigate the multi-residential and the farm uh, tax impacts uh, again in April. So I believe that is not the end, sorry. Uh, the 2000, and I'll try to go through these uh, fairly quickly. The, uh, again, these are the residential uh, reassessment related tax impacts and I'll just provide it for your information. We're providing them, as I mentioned, uh, once we include education, the citywide average uh, residential drops to negative 0 0.1 and you can see how the various wards compare to that citywide average and can consistent to the trends in terms of uh, assessment. Again, you're seeing wards 1, 2, 3 uh, and uh, 14, 15 just above that uh, citywide average. And again, just for your information, I'll just uh, remind committee that uh, in April, the uh, issue around area rating forms part of our tax policy discussion in April. So it will be another factor that uh, contributes to the 2013 overall impact. Mike, I have Councillor Whitehead. Is there a way that you can provide uh, a weighted version of that impact? So we, uh, and I think Councillor Collins had talked about neighborhood to neighborhood, knowing that there's, there's significant shifts or, or uh, issues from neighbor to neighbor in each ward. And you talk about it, and I think you produced that a while back. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we can look at some max and means and some averages. I'm not sure that we would have it neighbor for neighbor. I'm not sure we have the capacity provided neighbor by neighbor. But in terms of the mapping, sorry, that will be one of the tools that property owners will have access to. They'll be able to look at their property and compare relative to others. But in terms of some overall trending between words, we can look at some max and some statistical. 
members. Yeah, I don't reason I'm asking is because I, mean, I, I can already foresee anything. Everything south of Mohawk will be receiving uh, um, uh, a tax increase based on that on the average. No question about that. So when you take a look at the, the, the land mass in my ward alone in regards to who would be impacted uh, uh, paying uh, taxes based on that assessment line versus who wouldn't, uh, this, 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 these numbers are, are, this graph is deceiving. And that's, and that's my concern. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, as, as I mentioned previously, they'll always be within each and every ward, properties who are above the average or below the average citywide and for those wards. Uh, and uh, we can look at uh, what's been provided in the past in terms of the numbers, the max, mins, and potentially how many numbers are above, how many properties might be above the ward average. And so we can look at uh, some statistical uh, analysis in terms of providing some further detail to each of the ward And that would be helpful, I think, because we just need to know, that, and I think each councillor uh, would like to know and understand and appreciate the scope of uh, what this represents relative to what's actually happening from household to household in our, uh, in our wards. And I find that, you know, when I start relying on this and then I start getting the feedback from the community, they don't jive. Uh, and that's why I need a better understanding uh, on how and where these areas are being impacted. Right. And so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, as Maria DeSanto pointed out, is there will be that tool, that visual tool, the, uh, the mapping that will allow property owners to do comparisons. Thank you. Councilor Duvall. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So, you know, Mike, on, on slide 20, the one you got there, when I look at, say, for instance, Ward 7, a half percent uh, below the citywide average. So, for instance, would it, if a house was valued at the average of, if it's 261000 and you, we were assessed at 207000 are we saying that these people would receive a reduction in their tax bills, or it's already been calculated at that rate? So, through, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, in terms of the overall citywide impact, uh, that is benefiting uh, residential property taxes as we go into residential property owners as we go into our 2013 budget. So you'll see in my next presentation how this impact is reducing our uh, forecast for 2013. So previously we had forecasted 2.9% uh, increase, including education now. We're at 2.2% and part of that reduction is related to the fact that the residential overall is uh, seeing some relief and that relief in part is related to education tax taxes. Okay, so I, I guess what I'm saying is on the average assessment of 261, I guess there's a rate that everybody pays. So if your house was assessed at 207, obviously you wouldn't be paying the same tax as the, the average of 261, so, correct? So, uh, yeah, there's two factors through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, your assessed value and your tax rate if you're in the same uh, neighborhood community with the same tax rate, the property with a higher assessed value will have a higher tax burden. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Duvall. Councilor McHattie, please. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And I had to step out there, so I hope I didn't, uh, I'm not asking anything that's already been asked, but just a, a quick sense of the Ward 1 uh, situation. Uh, uh, Mike or Larry, I guess, uh, in the past, and Larry touched on it earlier, we've had the student housing impact. Uh, it's my sense that it's, it's not as great as it, as it was uh, back then. Uh, so just a, a sense of what, uh, what's going on there. So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm not sure if staff have, but, but we can uh, engage impact to try to get a sense of what factors are contributing to the increase in Ward 1 relative to the other wards. No, uh, no sense at this point at all. Okay. Okay, Mike can continue. So uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that was two and a half hours of context leading up to our 2013 budget updates. So I apologize for that. But we thought, uh, <laughs> but, but staff thought it was important to provide you the uh, net uh, tax assessment impacts and the uh, reassessment impacts leading up to your uh, first day of uh, formal budget deliberations. Uh, so in, or in um, January, 
we presented a forecast uh, which represented a residential tax increase, pressures of about uh, $29.5 million, which translated into a potential tax impact of 2.9%. You'll see since that time, uh, there, it, the budget process is a fluid process. Uh, there's been continued deliberations. In the case of the police budget, what we've reflected is what the Hamilton Police Services Board approved, recognizing that uh, uh, Hamilton Police Services presented to committee and uh, committees deferred the budget and there are ongoing, um, ongoing discussions with Hamilton Police Services. Nonetheless, the uh, budget that was approved by police represents a reduction of about $1.15 million from what was presented in January. Uh, and again, I believe what January was reflected what was printed in December in terms of the budget book. Uh, through the boards and agencies' presentations, there were some further uh, recommended uh, reductions by uh, Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority and Hamilton Conservation Authority from what was printed in the budget book. And so again, those represent reductions in total of about uh, $20,000. Uh, there is a requested increase in the Legislative uh, Veterans Advisory Committee of about $8.4,000 and we've captured uh, that request. Uh, staff uh, over, uh, over the past few weeks have looked at our 2012 actual budgets. Uh, we've compared that to our 2013 forecast. We looked at trends in 2012 and staff are recommending a further $4 million in reductions or increased revenues uh, that, that, that in total brings the total reductions you'll see in this table at about $5.2 million. And that reduces the pressure from 2.9% to 2.3%. I spoke previously around reassessment and when we look at education and broad education into the analysis uh, at a residential level, that translates into a further relief of 0.1%. So our current update as it relates to the 2013 tax supported operating budget, uh, we are reflecting a uh, increase of approximately 2.2%. So Mike, I have Councilor Partridge and Councilor Pearson. Councilor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Mike, on this slide, you, you mentioned the uh, Hamilton Police Services. It's, this uh, is based on the board approved budget. Was that the one that was at 4.71%? So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we'd have to see what the percentage was. So I believe we printed the book at 4.9% inclusive, 4 uh, sorry, exclusive of capital. When we brought capital financing, we were at 4.71. So uh, I believe this reduction would bring that below that 4.71. Uh, but we'll confirm what that, that translates into for a percentage increase for Hamilton Police Services. We'll if you would please, because the, uh, the uh, uh, police services budget uh, percentages were bouncing all over the place. So I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around, you know, we, were, we, we went everywhere from 3.3% right up to 5.2% right. and, and all points in between. So I would appreciate uh, confirmation of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Councillor Pearson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I might just refresh my memory. Um, what's the what's the amount? Is it 6.9 million equals a 1% tax increase? Is that correct? Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, now we've rolled in education. So each 1% uh, represents $8.2 million. I thought there was a change. Thank you very much. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, 8.2. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. I, go ahead, Mike. So in terms of that, uh, the, the potential reductions, that total four point, uh, just short of four and a half or 4.05 million, you'll see a list of proposed amendments uh, and you have this as part of your report. Uh, and I can go through this quickly if there are any specific questions, I'm not sure if staff are available to provide any additional information. If we don't have the staff who, uh, who would have that information, we'll get it to committee. 
there is potential for some additional revenue as it relates to the airport contract, and that would provide some relief of approximately $30,000. Uh, again, there's always a opportunity to uh, look at our parking meter rates, uh, and you'll see here we aren't identifying any uh, relief to the levy. Uh, at this time in terms of a potential parking increase. You'll recall that we have half a million dollars built into the budget, a transfer from the tax stabilization reserve to provide uh, some relief as it relates to uh, a previous decision around uh, meter parking. Uh, our recommendation would be at this time, if council were to consider an increase in, mar in uh, meter parking rates, that we wean ourselves off that contribution from reserve. It's not sustainable. It's a half million from the tax stabilization. And as we've identified over the past few, past few months, we need to uh, start rebuilding the balance in that tax stabilization reserve. Uh, there's a uh, further amendment you'll see in terms of our development stabilization reserve that's considered sustainable at approximately $50,000. Uh, it's being, uh, there's a recommendation to cancel Winterfest that would generate uh, a reduction of $36,000. Uh, there are a number of accounts that staff have reviewed uh, across uh, departments. Again, we are looking at our 2012 budgets and comparing to our 2013 forecasts. Again, a number of minor reductions that total approximately $25,000. Public health uh, is, uh, is putting forward a, the reduction in terms of sign on This, I believe, is a 100% municipal uh, funded program. No, sorry, it's not. Uh, it's not 100%, sorry. But the uh, benefit to the levy, the reduction would represent $160,000 in 2013. Farmers market, there's a uh, potential amendment to the farmers market uh, budget of approximately $56,000. Uh, further amendment to the uh, social housing budgets as it relates to uh, savings through mortgage renewals of approximately $44,000. Uh, AODA, you'll recall there was a five year phase in, there is an, or five year uh, phased in enhancement. There is an option to, uh, to slow down that, that uh, enhancement. And uh, so the option would be to reduce the AODA enhancement for 2013 by 900,000. I just want to identify that there would still be an enhancement in 2013, but uh, it would be more back-ended in terms of that five-year phase-in period. Uh, biodiesel, again, Public Works, there's a uh, amendment uh, that would reduce the levy by 278,000. Uh, there's an uh, amendment as it relates to the courthouse lease with McMaster. Uh, there's a potential of approximately half a million dollars if those lease rates would reflect or were to reflect market lease rates that would uh, generate an additional half million dollars in uh, revenues in 2013. A uh, further uh, amendment of approximately $200,000 in the safety program and public works. Uh, winter season, you'll recall we have a, in our policy, a period that we base the uh, winter control budget on. If we brought in our 2012 actuals into that uh, period, we could uh, reduce our winter control budget by approximately 800,000 and I'll just remind committee, I believe our winter control reserve has a balance of about $7 million. So again, that there is uh, uh, available funding to offset any particular peaks in our winter control budget from year to year. Increase in some capital recoveries as it relates to legal services in the city manager's office and that would reduce the levy by approximately 49 thousand uh, dollars and some reductions in contractual services salaries and benefits in the city manager's office uh, again some minor reductions in various accounts and information services that translates into just short of thirty two 
$1,000, decrease in contractual services and corporate services budget uh, of about $42,000 and some lease and service contract uh, reductions in expenditures of just short of $19,000. Uh, we made some assumptions as it relates to the Canada Pension Plan and based on the prescribed rates for Canada Pension Plan, there's a potential of approximately $50,000 in reductions for 2013. The last item uh, as it relates to our non-program revenues are uh, penalties and interests. You may recall Council decided uh, I believe it was in 2009, to uh, reduce our penalties and interest rate uh, on a monthly basis from one and a quarter percent to one percent in response to the 2008 recession. And uh, Larry's uh, staff continue to track our tax arrears um, and our tax arrears while they increased in 2008 and sorry, 2009, 10, and 11, to uh, ranging from 7.65%, so our tax arrears were about 7.65% of our levy in 2009. By 2011, it had increased to 8.61%. In 2012, we're seeing a decrease of approximate, uh, of bringing it down as a percentage of the levy to about 8%. But year over year, that represents a decrease of 4.29%. This is, 2012 was the first year that we saw a decrease in our tax arrears. Prior to that, year over year, the increases ranged from approximately 7.7% to almost 10%. So there is an opportunity given the recent trends and given the fact that council decided in 2009 that it was appropriate given the recession in 2008, to uh, if, if council were to choose to increase the uh, penalty and interest rate back up to 1.25% where it was prior to 2009, that would generate some additional revenues in 2013 of about $750,000. So again, that's how we arrive at the uh, amendments that total approximately $4 million. Okay, hey Mike, we have a, I have a speaker's list here. It's Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Collins, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Pearson, and Councillor Farr. Councillor Ferguson, please. Thank you, and, and congratulations, Mike, for making a lot of moves. Congratulations to everybody in the first row. Getting down to 2.2% is, uh, you know, very encouraging. Um, you know, I think we need to focus in on, on the big areas, which I think was Public Works and during the presentation on... Uh, January the 30th, uh, Public Works was at 6.2%. And uh, I total 2.1 million is the reductions in Public Works. What's, is, am I correct at that? And if so, what is Public Works down to now as a percentage? Through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Public Works are, would, are now at 4.8%. Okay. And um, I see $800,000 of the reduction you proposed as fuel. Um, no, I'm sorry, it was uh, $278,000 was fuel, biodiesel, that's using more uh, corn from Robert Pesuta's farm is biodiesel is why you're able to see that savings. But um, originally we had proposed a $1.8 million increase to cover fuel costs. But we've never seen anything about a transit increase to offset some of that fuel cost because the buses are if not the biggest, one of the biggest consumers of fuel. Uh, where are we on your staff recommendations on transit increases? So to be clear through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, transit does not, uh, transit, a fare increase for transit is not built into this number. Uh, a 5% fare increase in transit represents an additional $750,000. A uh, one cent, sorry, five cent. A one cent increase translates into additional $1.4 million. We are not uh, at this time reflecting an amendment as it relates to a fair increase. So again, it's not reflected, a fair increase is not reflected in that 2.2 uh, figure. Okay, but we have had a significant spike in fuel. Uh, will staff, through you, Mr. Chairman, maybe probably to Jerry, will you be bringing back a recommendation on? on bus fares, I mean, we normally keep it at that 50-50, 50% for levy, 50% for the fare box. And if your costs are being spiked 1.8 million because of fuel, which buses is a huge part of that, uh, 
what do we expect to hear from you on, on fair rate compare increases? So through the chair and, and Don Hall's here as well, he can, he can jump in. So with respect to fuel, uh, we have a unique situation in that we're, fuel's at $1.8 million increase. 300,000 of that is a three cent increase from a dollar six uh, a liter to a dollar nine. 1.5 million is changing out 37 buses from uh, natural, natural gas, gas to diesel. So that's a con the, on the consumption side. With respect to the a fare increase, generally we, a fare increase is proposed to address increased service levels. And, and as per uh, Don's presentation on Monday, you know, it's something we need to look at um, citywide as we move forward. The other driving factor is the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act, AODA, which uh, we had forecast at 2.3 million. So in 20, uh, 2011, we indicated to Council the, the new legislation would impact about $5.5 million. In 2012, we implemented 875,000, and we brought forward 2.3 million uh, in this year, uh, the second year of the three-year phase-in. We have a report coming later with respect to that 2.3 million, which is the 900,000 reduction up there based on the demand for the service now that we have some, some data. So the, the two big factors, uh, fuel and AODA, uh, are, on, are driving the transit. And what I'll do is I'll let Don talk to uh, how we would address a fare increase with respect to the program. Yeah, so just in summary, just um, so of the 1.7 Seven eight seven million that you're proposing for fuel increases, and you had five main drivers of which fuel and AODA were two of them. 1.5 of that is because of the buses being transferred from natural gas into fuel into diesel, correct? Is that what that's I heard you say? Th through the chair, that's correct. 37 buses were changed out from natural gas to diesel. Diesel is five times the price of natural gas, so that's what the 1.5 million is. Okay, so through you then to Don. Don, typically in the seven years I've been around here, we always try to keep 50% fare box, 50% on the levy for the cost of operating your transit system. So will you be coming back to us with any recommendations on fare increases to cover that $1.5 million increase in fuel? Um, we'd happy to respond to the direction of council, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It, uh, uh, we've taken a fair increase to be within the purview of, of council, and uh, we do have uh, something ready in draft if that's the will of council, but it wasn't our intention to bring anything back in the absence of a direction from council. It was our hope and expectation that uh, we might uh, uh, be able to respond back perhaps with a multi-year fair increase policy, but from, the, from our perspective that that would be a means of generating uh, uh, revenue to support the some of the service enhancements we talked about in our presentation on uh, um, just the, this past couple of days on the rapid ready uh, program okay uh, because typically i recall you always would come back every year generally in december about a fair increase uh, have you lost your courage because you've lost some body parts for doing that is why you're not suggesting any fair increase uh, it's never been the it's never been the position of staff to recommend a fair increase uh, staff has always responded, in, in my recollection, to a direction from Council to bring back a, uh, a fair increase report and what the, what the uh, uh, say, a nickel or a dime or 15 cents would generate in revenue towards uh, offsetting some of the levy increase. But uh, again, our hope was that given uh, our presentation there a couple of days ago is that uh, if we do report back, uh, if we are, if it is your wish for us to report back, we can report back in terms of uh, what a fair increase would contribute towards uh, reducing the the, uh, the net levy on a citywide basis, or we could report back on uh, a fair increase strategy that could go towards uh, future transit service enhancements, or we could combine the two. We're, we're, we we serve at the pleasure of council, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I think, Mr. I would like to see something come back to us on that. Uh, not only is there the fuel issue of $1.5 million that's going directly to the levy, of course, you got the this, the recently got the 1.9 percent in uh, wage increases as a result of the collective agreement which is going through to the drivers and and, and I'd be curious to know how close we are staying to that 50 50 50 percent levy 50 percent fare box and I see Don has his hand up Mr. Chairman um, the current budget uh, <clears throat> Mr. Deputy Mayor um, is has us at about a 48 percent cost recovery we did bring a policy uh, report uh, forward two years ago for council's consideration that would drive a fair increase based on the revenue cost ratio 
and that report was uh, tabled and no further action was taken at that time. I, I can say that there are two drivers in the transit budget. Uh, one is the fuel um, as a result of the conversion of CNG to diesel and the other is the AODA which we uh, have a separate dedicated report for and of all the line items in the entire budget, if those two items were not in the transit budget, if they were in fact considered citywide, for example, the uh, expenditures for transit would be below, um, would be below uh, the increase, the collective bargaining increase that the, uh, that the employees relieve. So we've actually, those two expenses are driving the entire uh, transit budget. Other than that, we would be below um, um, 2%, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay, then, so with the 2.3 million impact of AODA, now reduced by 900, which brings us down to 1.4 million, how much of that 1.4 million is transit? And it's all uh, for the Specialized Transit Program, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, we still believe that our initial, our, our initial forecast of 5.7 million is accurate based on the city's demographics. Uh, we just uh, believe that the take-up is, is happening a little bit slower and we can take advantage of that by deferring some of the, uh, the planned expenditures to future years. There are two uh, trigger points in the AODA. Uh, one is January 1, 2013. That's to implement fair parity. That report uh, has been referred back. Staff will be reporting back to Public Works Committee on that on March the 18th. We have a, a legal obligation January 1, 2013 uh, to implement fair parity at a cost of $450,000 and harmonized service levels at a cost of $100,000. The next trigger point is January 1, 2017, uh, which allows us the flexibility to uh, defer uh, the, the uh, requested budget in 2013 of uh, 2.3 2 million and modify that down to the 1.4 million based on the take up of the first two months under the new eligibility policy. So uh, at the moment we're, we're essentially non-compliant on about 550,000 of that 5.7 million. And the next uh, legal trigger date is uh, uh, January 1, 2017. Well, um, I think it's still a little difficult to swallow having public works at $4.8 million, or 4.8%, I'm sorry. You know, we fuss quite a bit about police being up there at, uh, at that kind of number. And even with the significant reduction the jury is able to bring forward today, but of, of the, um, the balance of this lot, there's still $2.9 million of increases after the credits that are shown there today. 1.5 for fuel because of the buses coming out of service and 1.4 for AODA. It was originally at uh, 2.3. There's a $900,000 reduction out there. So we still have another uh, $2.9 million that's hitting the levy this year as a result of those two items on transit in addition to the employee-related costs. So, Mr. Chair, I would like to see that summarized and report back and where we are in this, whether it's 48 or 50 percent of fare boxes versus levy, to make sure we have that balance. Uh, I would like to see that report come back to a, a future budget meeting. And, and just moving off, and, and so, through, Mr. Chairman, how do, how do we get that? Do you need a resolution of committee or can, you know, I got in trouble last year for asking the fire department a question without having council approval. And a, a gavel slammed down pretty hard. How do we go about, he's not here today, and I understand you have a sponge gavel now, is that correct, uh, Mr. Chairman? But, um, corn cob. <laughs> so how do we get that report back on fair rate, fairing uh, uh, rates on transit in light of this $3 million impact just on AODA and on fuel? So Carolyn, we need a motion on that? Motion okay, on if that. you'll come back to me, I'd like to move that at appropriate okay. time. All right. And, and also, um, Back to you, Jerry. The um, and, and once again, thank you for the reduction you're showing today. That's that's very significant. Um, why is winter uh, control now up? It was up 1.8 on January 31st. You're now up one. Uh, when you take the average over the last three years, the last two years have been virtually no storm removal. I'm curious to know why we're still up at further one million dollars after this credit today, based on the average of the last three years when. Certainly 2012 and 2011 had virtually no snow. So through the chair, the, the council Fergus, Ferguson, the, the policy in place right now for winter maintenance is a five-year average. And so that would have been a $3 million increase. What we did in um, January when we presented our budget is we felt we could reduce that down um, by 1.2 to have a $1.8 million increase. 
And what we're looking at now is going to a continuous average. So from 05 to, to 012, we have all the data. So using that number, we can have a further reduction of $800,000. We also have a report we could, we could coming forward. Over and above the 800000 that's up there? I'm sorry? You said a further reduction of $800,000. That's in, yeah. in addition to the 800000 we see there, or is that is that it? No, that's it. Through right. the chair, that's it. So the, right now, the winter maintenance budget is a million dollars higher. If you take this reduction, it's a million dollars higher. Than, than 2012. That's correct. And what we're doing is bringing forward a report as indicated, the priority three streets, um, we want to move them up to the same service level as priority two streets. And that, there's a, there's a cost associated with that. So we have a report coming forward which outlines that. So what we want to do is change the service level, which is an increased cost. And the other side is to go to continuous average. So 05 to 012, you have high years, you have low years. Uh, you know, it, it's, we've had three storms uh, this year that are different each, each time, um, you know, we've had them. So with that report, we'll identify it. So that's, that leaves us with a million dollar increase on winter maintenance for council to review. So by continuous average, you mean going for three years to seven years then? No, doing, we're gonna go, the first, we wanna go from 05, when we started the averaging to 012. So it's an eight year average. Um, and we feel with that increase of a million, with the increased service level, and the fact that we have a healthy reserve, um, you know, moving forward, we think that that should provide uh, sufficient uh, resources for the program. Okay, and and so um, we, we have a little more work to do than in winter control. We could have further debate about that. We got the further debate about the transit cost, $2.9 million for AODA and, uh, and fuel. And the last one is the employee related um, uh, you, Mr. Integer, I think the public is wondering that, you know, we, we saw uh, the reduction of 29 employees as a result of poor performance. And, of course, the obvious question I think some of us, if not all of us, are facing, well, if they're, we're working some crews, do you, know, do you really need to replace them? So of the 29, is there, can we look at it reducing the FTEs on that road maintenance side uh, now that we're going to make sure that we get mm -hmm good productivity out of all of our employees out in on road maintenance? So through the chair, the, the issue right now is in, is in the litigation, it's in the, it's in the grievance process. So I, I prefer not to comment that, on that in open session um, because it's identifiable individuals. The second thing regarding our program is there's a number of gaps we have throughout the, the, the program. Stormwater management is one of the significant areas where we have additional stormwater management ponds, we and we don't have the resources to be uh, proactive and get in front of the the maintenance on them. So we would look at any um, resources that, if they were to come available, to put towards programs that, when we're doing just reactive maintenance, it's costing us more money as a, as opposed to proactive. So I mean that I mean we can go in camera and I can discuss the other option with you. If I, and if I can, the one other major driving factor, so we've talked about AODA, we've talked about fuel, uh, a, a fare, a transit fare is, is there, winter maintenance. The other significant impact is 1.3 million for street lighting. So again, the, these five areas I've just talked about are unique to public works. So we are at 4.8, but we have programs that other de departments don't, and that's why it's there. Street lighting is up $1.3 million. It's driven by a provincial um, regulator uh, for connection charges, and that fee has gone up. So while we're still working to try and get that reduced, that's a real cost that Public Works has to um, uh, identify. And as Don indicated, in transportation, if we didn't have these factors, we would be below the, uh, the overall yeah. average as well in Public Works. But it's the nature of the beast of all the, the, dr the key drivers that are unique to Public Works. You're right, and I'm, I'm chinking through them all. And, and so I've, I've dealt with the AODA, I've dealt with the, uh, the fuel, which are all trans related, which we're gonna look for a report back on. What can we do on fares to help offset some of that cost rather than dumping it all in the levy? Uh, deploy related, I think we got some more, yeah. We got some more explaining to do on that uh, as it relates to the employees. I understand that it is yeah, before the grievance process right now, but just the same, uh, um, I, th I think the public expects us to have some cost savings as a result of that. 
And the last is the street lighting. Jerry, we, we spent a lot of money in going to LED lighting, which was significantly reducing our energy costs, but here we see a spike of $1.3 million. Is the savings in LED, where can we see that, or is that over in that big pot called uh, energy uh, in, in, in their savings? How do we get our head around that? So the, the LED program, and Jeff Lupton's here, can talk to it. This, it, what we're paying is, it's a connection charge. It's not an energy charge, it's a connection charge for, you know, we have over 45,000 street lights. And this is a charge that uh, comes down from the province, from the energy board, Ontario Energy Board. And so what we're doing is we're working with them to see if we can get that reduced. But that's, it's a connection charge. It's over and above the energy costs and how we save money through LED. It's, it's, a, it's a hit directly on the budget. Okay, so I, I need to understand that more and I'll talk to Jerry offline about that or to Jeff offline because I don't want to dominate their discussion here. But yeah, I think we got some more work to do in Public Works and I agree, absolutely agree with Jerry, it's those five areas. But I think we've seen in all five, there's an opportunity for even better improvement. Uh, maybe not much more on winter control with the uh, 800,000 already put up to us today, but certainly the other four. And uh, I'm gonna keep coming back to those uh, in future budget meetings because 4.8% is still um, uh, a significant spike, even though it's directed to these, these five specific uh, drivers in public works. So if you'll come back, appreciate that. Will do, thank you, Councilor Ferguson. Uh, just once again, a heads up, we have Councilor Collins, Councilor Jackson, Councilor Pearson, Councilor Farr, Councilor McCaddy, Councilor Marula, Councilor Whitehead. Councilor Collins, please. Thank you, sir. And um, through you to, to Mike, Mike, the uh, airport contract number, that is one that we believe is actually here to stay. I mean, I know it's a small number with the 30,000, but we've seen the airport numbers have been up and down, and we've used a base that we've been relatively comfortable with. And I think the 30 is... In the grand scheme of things related to the airport, it's a significant increase on an annual basis. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, staff have identified that it's, a, they feel that it's a sustainable increase in revenues and uh, that we aren't at a risk of having to uh, amend in 2000, leading into 2014. It's, it's not a phantom revenue. Okay. And the parking meter issue, uh, we made a decision, I think, on the fee increase and if someone can refresh my memory what that was, that was for the metered rate across the city, is that, is that correct? Or did that include the um, taking the Stony Creek Flamborough meters out of circulation and then incurring a cost because we had incorporated a revenue source into the budget? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, it was the latter. It was that we had assumed an increase in uh, parking fair revenues, uh, council uh, changed their decision with respect to uh, certain areas uh, and to uh, to offset that decrease in revenues, we needed to transfer half a million dollars from the tax stabilization reserve to offset that decrease in budgeted revenues. And we continue to have that half million dollars reflected as a transfer from the tax stabilization reserve. So the plan here with number two on the list is to uh, cease taking it from reserve and you would supplement that with a meter increase across the city is that what's being proposed here so through you uh, mr. deputy mayor uh, the reason we're reflecting a zero net levy uh, benefit is we need to wean ourselves off that takes tax stabilization reserve uh, on today's agenda uh, agenda item 5.6 this you know we're providing uh, as per Councillor Farr's direct, or, uh, request, an update with respect to specific reserves and the status of their reserves, our tax stabilization reserve. Uh, we have pressures in our tax stabilization reserve and we need to take some concerted effort to reduce some of those contributions from the tax stabilization reserve. And that's why we're reflecting it right now as a zero net levy. Uh, impact we need to wean ourselves off that tax. So it's just a transfer then for, it's a funding source change rather than an operational right. issue through, through you Mr. Deputy Mayor assume assuming a parking meter rate increase was approved uh, we would budget for the revenue increase and have an offsetting reduction in transfer from the tax stabilization reserve not a source a funding source issue it's actually you're taking it you're, you're, stop, you're going to stop taking it from reserve through you, yeah. Mr. Chairman, 
and the money then will help us on the levy side by increasing rates. Is that parking Correct. meter rates? Mike, I've got Tim. Tim, please. Uh, if I could, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So three or four years ago, we increased uh, parking meter rates throughout the city to a dollar. So some were 50 cents before, they went up 50 cents. Some in Dundas were at 75, they went up a quarter. Um, and then that included the Stony Creek and the water down meters. Um, and then we had the other issue of the off street parking lots, meters and Astor and Stony Creek. So the budget was approved. Then council uh, um, in their, in their um, wisdom, in future deliberations, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say in your wisdom, yeah. took out the meters and the parking lot issues, uh, left us with a $500,000 liability right. to be funded from tax stabilization because that revenue was in our budget. I get that part. So, of it. so as, as part of the uh, service delivery review, it was considered a high priority look at meter rates. So this, it was recommended a 25 cent across the board meter increase which would give us $250,000 additional revenue, which would wean us 50% off the, the, uh, the tax stabilization reserve. 50 cent increase would take it off the reserve altogether. So approving this list, just to be clear, approving the second one on the list is a 50 cent increase. No. Well, you could go 50%, 50 cents to take the whole thing off well, or, or but, phase a quarter increase to take 250 off. But this this shows a five hundred thousand. So if a quarter represents two fifty, it's showing the full fifty cents, right? No, for you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we're just identifying the current liability in terms of the tax stabilization. We have a transfer from the reserve of five hundred thousand. I mean, if council had any interest, we would recommend a twenty-five cent per hour increase. Would and we'd still be below all all other comparable municipalities. Okay. So I, to be clear. Approving this, there's no increase yet. It may be a further discussion item in the budget, but this doesn't impact the rates, the metered rates. Through, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, Council has options in terms of the uh, parking meter rates, yes. Okay. And uh, the, the cancellation of Winterfest, um, that is a citywide cancellation then, or is this a re just a reduction in the budget? And that would include not just what we had at the waterfront, but m to be parochial, my area, Rosedale has a pancake breakfast, and there are other special events that happen in Ward 3 and Ward 8. That This is a citywide cancellation, or is this a reduction in the number of events through Winterfest? Through you, Mr. Chairman? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, I know there's a reduced uptake. I believe that there's right now about six, per or six events of 36 planned events where there is uptake, and I'm not sure if Tim has any additional information. Yeah, so, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I mean, let's face it, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel here to come up with ideas. This is I would, a... I would say that with this one, yes. Yeah. Yes, so... Um, um, there's little participation, uh, poor overall attendance. We're not getting a lot of return on investment. It's not worth the aggravation and the political questions of 36,000. So, uh, it was intended to be a full cancellation, though. Well, I mean, I attended some of those events this year and with some of my colleagues, and yes. And um, so I, I'm, I'm not, I, I mean, I think I would disagree with the statement that they're not well attended. We had a lot of people certainly on the waterfront this year, and I'll leave that to my colleagues to go into. But I, I'd be the first one to take this off the list at the appropriate time, and I'm assuming I have a couple of seconders. Um, in terms of the uh, farmer's market, I think the last report we received at committee was in fact, the, the budget had increased, the subsidy had increased. So my question would be, with the $56,000 savings that's represented here, I'm trying to understand how, how that works. Is that a reduction in service at the, uh, sorry, at the uh, farmer's market? And, um, and how does that coincide with the last budget update that we received, I think maybe just two weeks ago? Um, that suggested the, the subsidy at the market was actually increasing slightly. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, this relates to employee-related costs. 
the 56,000 and uh, I'm sure the staff can go offline if uh, the councillor wants some further information with respect to the 56,000. Safety program, I, I wasn't certain based on your short description there, Mike, what that represented, $200,000. For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll turn to Jerry. Uh, through the chair, in the, um, the, the traffic side, we have two staff that dedicate their time to accident uh, management. They provide details for all the, the accidents on roads um, w when we go through litigation and the risk management process. Under the red light camera reserve, which is sitting in excess of $5 million right now, um, we can fund those two staff from that from the red light camera and at 200,000 and a five million dollar balance and it grows annually anywhere from half a million to a million so it's a sustainable um, program to fund it into perpetuity so we're recommending that and I, I want to clarify because I think on the surface you know that raises some bells and whistles with certain people when you see with we're reducing the safety program so to be clear that is just a, a transfer from, of the funding source from the levy to reserve and there's no change in the program. Yeah, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, absolutely. It is just a change in the funding source from levy to reserve. Okay, those are the only questions I have at this point in time and if you can come back to me at the appropriate time to take the Winterfest off the list, I'd be happy. Thank you, Councilor Collins. Councilor Jackson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And first of all, Mike, to you and SMT, thank you for trying to be as creative as you can, bringing forward the $4 million plus list. So it's not easy, and I appreciate the fact that every department's looking to help council get the global number down as close as we can to zero as possible, or at least to match the first two-year budgets of this term of council. So I want to say thank you. I appreciate that. Um, on the transit fare, Don, when's the last time we had an increase on transit fare? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Don, please. 2010, Mr. Deputy Mayor. 2010, okay. Um, I'm not, if Councillor Ferguson and other members of council want an information report, because uh, Don is absolutely right, this is in the uh, hands of council. Uh, typically, HSR don't bring forward that kind of uh, report or recommendation. We have to direct that. If my colleagues want an information update as to how ridership's been in the last three years since the last increase, and what a nickel might mean uh, versus status quo. Uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor to Don, is that the kind of uh, chart and information, Don, at the direction of council you could bring forward? Absolutely, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay. Um, I know where my positioning is, as I'm supportive of public transit and trying to increase ridership, but you know what? If it's been about three years and the majority of colleagues want that, I'm not going to be loath to getting an information item on that. Um, just quickly, when Councillor Ferguson mentioned about the 29 from Public Works, folks, there's a process underway. I, you know, ironically, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm actually getting some uh, pushback the other way from some constituents saying about maybe, you know, the, the way the 29 was handled and that, maybe it could have been handled differently. So I'm actually getting uh, different uh, messages from my constituents on that. So let, let's let that process unfold. Let's not assume anything on that. A cancellation of Winterfest, um, i got to tell you, I was down at the waterfront with Councillors uh, Farr, Collins, and um, the mayor was the, the mayor spoke, uh, by the way, glowingly at Winterfest, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and he praised the Waterfront Trust uh, for the wonderful work they've done. I have to say that publicly. I was, I was so impressed. I was just, I, it, was, it was wonderful. And Councillor Morelli showed up as well. Yes, Councillor Morelli was there as well. Yeah, it was, Judy, honest. Uh, I was just very impressed. Hundreds of people heard his wonderful speech. Um, so if, if the thought was of cancelling Winterfest, Tim, because there was a great Winterfest jointly uh, co-hosted by the Waterfront Trust, I was going to suggest, well, then give that money over to the Waterfront Trust. But if that, this is more citywide, Tim, and it was for all the events across the city, then I'm with Councillor Collins. I'd rather just, um, uh, let's just get rid of this item right off the get-go here. So can I just ask for you to Tim, Tim, was there any thought of because, uh, did this come into your mind or staff's mind because there was a co-hosting down at the waterfront this year that maybe the waterfront trust, if we could save 36 grand out of your budget, somehow the waterfront trust could take this on? Councillor Jackson, yep. I have uh, 
Or he's going to speak. Chris sure. wants to say something, but I'm going to answer that question. So, yep. it, no, yep, that please. thought didn't come to mind. It was a citywide budget. Okay. An extensive staff, and uh, I guess it's a bad idea. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. And who else? Chris? If I can, to you, Deputy Mayor, just so as everyone around this table knows, I mean, last Thursday, SMT met to go through the list of uh, all <laughs> the items that you see here. I mean, we had discussed at that meeting a number of things, and and I mean, just to echo what Tim is saying, so this list that you see in front of you is something that's, uh, the items were presented by each GM, um, including myself last Thursday. Mm -hmm. And the Winterfest is one of those that, uh, you know, maybe we collectively, so it's not just Tim, uh, you know, probably could have uh, thought differently about it and not, uh, you know, put it on the list. But uh, uh, just so as you know that everything you see there is something that has been vetted. Oh, no, no th thank you, Chris. That's fine. Uh, no problem at all. Um, and la oh, the AOTA. I'm actually, Mike. I'm pleased. You know, I've been. I'm trying to provide caution the last couple of years on AOTA activity, provincial legislation without provincial funding, and so I've been the one saying, folks, let's go slow. Right. Uh, this type of um, legislation could easily bankrupt a city without provincial help. So. We're slowly going in that direction, so I like the fact that the line item up there reflects a more cautionary slowness to this, so I support that. And lastly, uh, Jerry, to the um, item 17 on the 800,000, uh, Jerry, just got to make sure in light of the ups and downs this year of snow clearing, some very, very good, some not so good, some in between, we just need to make sure, Jerry, if we support this, that the messaging going out isn't that, oh, Public Works and Council can save some money, and with the ups and downs of the snow clearing results through this winter season. So just an assurance from Jerry, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that won't, accept, uh, won't affect service level. Jerry? Through the, uh, the Chair, the service level reports coming forward, we, what we've implemented with the February 8th and this week's storm, with respect to Priority 3 roads, that's the what we're bringing forward that service level so that will be maintained and again the you know the winter the budget is it's our best estimate that's why we use averages you could have some six bad storms or you could have one bad storm as councillor ferguson indicated so the service levels won't be impacted if there's any variation to the budget we would report that uh, through the year when we do our variance reports and the other thing that council has done uh, which has been very strategic is establish that winter maintenance reserve um, to help us offset uh, if there is a, uh, a year where we have a deficit in the overall annual budget. Good. I accept that. So, Mike, for me, except for uh, two or three or four possible um, contentious items, small ones, I, this uh, four million at least uh, looks like for me the lion's share that I could support in helping us reduce our budget. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Pearson, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And my first and foremost, I do want to mention that I also sp stopped by at the Winterfest uh, event at the waterfront. And yes, it was very well attended. And I took visitors from outside the city, as I mentioned at a previous meeting, and they were very impressed. I think what's changed it maybe this year was kind of the uh, the um, the middle year of saying how it's going to work because in previous years, I know there's been problems because of the weather. And uh, this year, though, with having the ice rink there and that, I think that's been able to draw more, to, didn't have to depend on weather. So hopefully, uh, I do understand where, where committee members are coming from and certainly support keeping it on the books for now. My question is with regards to the um, sign -out. Um I just want to question because that's the reduction, and I guess it's based on 2012 numbers, but when I went back to the Public Health Services budget um, presentation, we actually are increasing the, uh, are expanding the sign out uh, program. Could I just get clarification how this, so how are we reflecting this to now we're increasing it? If we didn't use it, why are we increasing it? Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. There is an increase in the sign out overall because of the demand. However, when we were forecasting our initial 2013 budget, we had forecast higher than what we actually reflected. So that 160,000 is, is a reduction, but not back to, there is a, a slight re, um, increase as well. Thank you. And can I just also get the formula? Is this one of the ones that's 2575? It is 75-25 um, funded, but this 160,000 is reflective of 100% municipal. 
Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Councillor Pearson. Councillor Farr. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and uh, thank you uh, thus far for good uh, information coming at us. And uh, certainly, uh, we're not without challenges uh, <clears throat> going into this uh, conversation that has just begun today. Um, on the winter fest, my quick comments that I'm uh, relieved to hear the conversation around the table uh, thus far and obviously supportive of maintaining winter fest. It was hugely successful, thousands actually uh, at the kickoff event and, and our staff did an incredible job and I'll have to uh, uh, recognize uh, that uh, uh, right out of the gate, but also maybe uh, we could consider you maintain that number. We don't take the 36 out and look at um, uh, Paul Johnson's initiative uh, yesterday is ratified through council with respect to Threshold School of Business. Getting the um, word out on Winterfest was something I heard this year and last uh, as uh, being not as effective as we could be. Uh, sounded like a great event, Councillor. Wish I would have known about it or people that actually stumbled upon the kickoff event at the Waterfront Trust. Uh, maybe uh, similar to the model where we're partnering up at no cost with Threshold as we ratified last night with respect to the neighborhood development work, we could, through Paul, probably partner up with some Mohawk College rec kids who can work uh, towards achieving some of their academic goals uh, with respect to that curriculum, but also assisting our, our great staff in the work that they do on an annual basis. So just to comment on that, and of course I'll be uh, supporting, maintaining, and, and uh, hopefully if we can take into account uh, so that, that wonderful initiative ratified last night through neighborhood development with Threshold School of Business, that sort of model, we can even enhance Winterfest over time. On the farmer's market, um, um, I'm wondering through you to, I guess Mike, have, uh, Tony's been working hard at, uh, at a year office. The, getting back to us on the privatization issue. Um, we put it off, and, and for good reason, uh, notwithstanding Tony's massive file heading into retirement on other issues such as HECFI and others. But have we not contemplated a savings of significantly more than 56000 with respect to that just being around the corner for, for 013 through you? So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, Tony is... Um we're hoping that Tony will be able to provide an update with respect to the whole farmer's market RFP process in March. Uh, but uh, in terms of what's reflected in the amendment schedule before you today, uh, this is uh, some amendments as it relates to employee-related costs that would translate into savings above 56000 for 2013. So am I hearing that prior to the end of the budget process, we'll be able to have a firmer grasp on privatization and maybe find savings there. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, Tony may have an update as to what that update may mean in terms of any further reductions for th 2013. I can't say at this time as to where that where he sits in terms of uh, that process. Uh, but my understanding is uh, it's a very limited process he's following right now with respect to the farmer's market. There's a limited number of potential participants and uh, the intention is to come forward with an update in March in terms of okay. that RFP process. Okay, thank you, Mike. And, and you had responded it's a staffing issue and, and wanted to keep it at that and not elaborate, but at that moment in time, a few moments ago, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I did see our uh, representative uh, from Community Services actually anxious to make a comment. I don't know if she still is, but if she is and wants to, I'll reflect back on a few minutes ago and maybe offer a comment with respect to this number uh, she could at this time. And if not, I would understand as well through you. Through you, uh, Acting Deputy Mayor, I think that uh, uh, Mike has answered it uh, accurately. And as he said, if you need further information separate to that, I'd be happy to provide that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vicki. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. And uh, finally, I just want to be clear, I'm hearing, I thought I heard Mr. Zagarek say, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that it's a, uh, on the AODA-based activity uh, and the 900K, that <laughs> it's a five-year phase-in on the enhancement, and I thought I heard someone else say three years, or is there three years left in the five-year? Can I get some, some clarity on that through so, you? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, as I recall, I think the original report called for a five-year phase-in. This would be year two. Uh, I think year one was 875,000. This year's would be another 1.4. But Don may correct me. 
Respectfully, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we started with a three-year phase in to ensure we could have it all up and running in time for January 17. Uh, what we suggested last year, we could uh, extend that to a uh, four-year, and now we're moving towards a five-year so that we have everything implemented prior to January 1, 2017. So we had built in a little bit of latitude. This allows us to exercise that latitude. And uh, what really, thank you, Don and Mike, what really stands out in this slide, 24, um, is, is the public works pressures. And I'm wondering if Jerry, just one more time, if he hasn't already clearly articulated the legislative requirements with respect to these very significant uh, 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 figures. And, and, and just to use as an example, this AODA activity for 2012, taking 900K away now doesn't mean it goes away. Uh, it'll just be added pressure later. So what of this that we see here, or what are your legislated requirements, Jerry, through you? And, and basically, a nutshell or a general guess on how, what that adds up to for public works through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Through the chair, so right now, public works is sitting at 8.7 million, which is our 4.8% increase. And as we indicated, there's five main drivers. So with the 900,000 off the original 2.3 million, we have 1.4 million for AODA in, in 2013. We talked about the fuel. Again, this is, this is to provide the same level of service. The fuel is at 1.8 million. Our street lighting costs with the, uh, the increase in the um, provincial uh, fee for connection charges, and we have uh, with the increase in this, the number of uh, street lights, we're at 1.3 million. The $1 million increase in winter maintenance. So again, that's something based, we're changing the policy. We want council, we're bringing a report, change the policy, change the service level. So that's a million dollar increase. So those four items represent 5.5 million, which are um, only in the public works budget. So if you took those four items off, we would be down to about 3.2 million, which would put us below 2%, um, which is primarily the only factor that is left is our employee related costs. And you know that doesn't include if you do a fare increase for transit, which would bring that number lower. All right, thanks, Jerry. That, that uh, puts it uh, in perspective for me, at least. I appreciate that answer, and uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And thanks again, Mike. Thank you, Councillor Farr. Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Just a few quick questions. Um, I, I think I know the answer to this, but uh, just the uh, service delivery review that we looked at, Mike, and we continue to look at, is it fair to say there's there's really nothing in there that will apply to the 2013 uh, budget, the discussion we had today? Uh, I know council, council had a discussion, had some concerns, and uh, sent it back to staff, and Chris has had some discussion with councillors, uh, but just thought I'd double check uh, in the SMT discussions since that time there's there's nothing in there that really will help us in 2013 mr deputy mayor so through you uh, mr deputy mayor in terms of the service delivery review process i'll just uh, uh, remind committee when we brought forward the list of options in october they were grouped a b c d's and we were looking for some further direction the next stage in that process is a development of some executive business cases and so we hope to engage committee in the next uh, few weeks, month, in terms of getting some feedback as to which opportunities we would pursue uh, for the purpose of developing those uh, executive business cases. But as Tim identified, uh, the one option with respect to parking meter rates, that was identified as part of the uh, service delivery review as an opportunity. So in that one particular case, uh, you know, th th that is related to uh, some of the observations that came out of service delivery review. Okay, so so that is that a possibility then the uh, in terms of us picking up on the parking rate one uh, that was the downtown was it uh, to increase uh, parking rates Mr. Deputy Mayor I, I didn't bring my uh, list of uh, and I need to I'll refer back to it yeah. in the next uh, day or so. So through you Mr. Deputy Mayor I'd have to revisit that opportunity as it relates to service delivery review. Tim spoke previously uh, with respect to a 25 and 50 percent global 
uh, increase in meter parking rates, uh, and that would leverage an additional 250,000 to 500,000, whether it's the, the uh, 25 cents or 50 cent option. And there were no other business cases in that service delivery review that you think, Mike, were straightforward enough. Uh, of course, you can't tell exactly what's going to be palatable here. Here, that's a dangerous uh, work to be uh, undertaking. But I, I thought I remember some of them being more administrative in nature rather than, uh, you know, a, a real frontline battle kind of thing. But I, again, I have to go back, Mr. Deputy Mayor. It's been a while since I've looked at them. So, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I know staff are looking at those lists of opportunities, and we continue to look at those as we continue to look at our 2013 preliminary budgets to see whether or not there are any opportunities that were identified as part of that process that could be brought forward to committee for your consideration as further amendments. So there's, there's, not, there's no uh, reductions here? Specific to those opportunities, there are no, uh, none of these amendments relate specifically to those, those opportunities. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and, and the uh, often, uh, and it's, there's pluses and minuses to this, but uh, are there any one-time reductions? Uh, I think in a future slide, uh, Mike, you've got uh, what we need to get down to 0 0.9, another 2 million, I guess, uh, ballpark uh, for that. Uh, are there any one-time reductions that would be uh, deemed sustainable? Uh, I think some years ago we just did some one-time ones and we didn't really ask the question whether they were sustainable but i'll ask that question uh today with my my, my uh, point are, are anything in your mind that uh you don't you're not ecstatic about bringing forward but but you uh you could uh convince yourself that there might be some argument for that so through you uh mr deputy mayor the one uh potential opportunity that I identified at the beginning uh, of my presentation uh, relates to boards and agencies. Um, staff are uh, working through the HECFI transition and I hope to meet with staff uh, and to, in an effort to try to determine if there are any potential savings in 2013 as it relates to uh, the HECFI transition. Uh, at this time, I wouldn't recommend uh, incorporating future year savings as it relates to the HECFI transition. I'll just cite uh, an example, the uh, waste collection contract. We built those, uh, those savings into last year's budget, even though we didn't realize those savings until 2013. Uh, to do so requires drawing on the tax stabilization reserve for that one year until such time as you realize those savings. And given the status of the balance of that reserve, uh, we're not leaning towards building in future year savings at this time. <clears throat> Thanks, Mike. And just a, a quick comment, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, there was the, the question about a uh, fare increase uh, uh, to uh, offset the, uh, the fuel costs and the uh, costs that HSR has incurred this year. Uh, I, I would hope that after Monday's presentation, uh, it, it becomes very clear that uh, if, if there's any fare increases, they, the, the funds that are raised need to go to additional service on the street. We had a long presentation on Monday which talked about uh, how we're falling behind other municipalities. Don McLean was here the uh, previous week uh, who uh, talked about how our, uh, our ridership has decreased and it's all related. To, uh, it's very black and white. Uh, you put additional service on the street, your ridership goes up. It's, it's deadly simple. So. Uh, I'd be surprised that we would still be talking about uh, a fair increase for the purposes of uh, balancing budgets. Uh, if we really need to need to invest in transit for all the reasons we heard about on Monday, uh, it, it's very clear that that uh, needs to happen. Fair increase, if if a fair increase happens, it has to go to, to service improvements. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor McCanny. Councilor Marula. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. And um, first thing, I, I, I like the intent of, of trying to save as much as possible within the budget. And I appreciate Councillor Ferguson's approach on, on the public transit component. Uh, I want everyone to keep in mind that, that through you, Deputy Mayor, that the public transit is, is area rated. So the, but the, we have the most to gain and the most to, to lose with, in the inner city with respect to public transit. The suburban area um, it really has little impact on their bottom line 
as a direct result of the area rating. So with all due respect, I would, I would appreciate if, if it's a report to look at options, that's one thing. But because it doesn't have any tangible impact to a point where, uh, to a point where actually there's a bottom line effect or, or, or a positive effect for the suburban area, that it not be brought forward as a reduction. Uh, and I think everyone recognizes over the years I've been, I've been a very uh, op opposed to increases for the obvious reasons and, and them being firstly to you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the fact that um, every time you increase fares, there's a decrease in ridership. It, it literally is counterproductive. Not to mention the sustainability issues regarding environmental, uh, the environmental aspects and social aspects and those that can't afford it. And, and really it does take away from opportunity because people are living on borderline uh, income at this point. So even uh, five cents might seem as if it's not an impact on, on us or on them, but it is to them when they're already living in a deficit situation. So uh, with all due respect, it's a great uh, synergy that we have with our suburban colleagues uh, in the inner city. I would hope that we can evaluate it as one thing to look at the options, but not bring it forward as, a, as an increase because I'm willing to stand proudly in saying that I'm trying to decrease fares to increase ridership for all the benefits from a social and environmental perspective. Um, so on that front, I would, I would appreciate it. And I understand and I respect what, what Councillor Ferguson is trying to do. But I just think he's, he's targeting a wrong area at this point because there are so many other areas we should be looking at. Having said that, on, on, on that front, um, looking at, for instance, um, the, the low-lying fruit versus the, the, the those tangible issues that, we, that really matter. We spoke earlier, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and Mike, you elaborated on the, on the effects uh, that, that reassessment and, and downloading and, and the heads and beds and, and pills issue has on our taxpayer. And it's into, into around about 130, 140 million. We have a motion that you'll be reporting back. And I'm just hoping that we're getting to the, the end of our process from a budget perspective. And I'm just hoping that we keep everything in perspective because when we're dealing with $130 million impact or 25% of our, of our operating <clears throat> budget to the province where we start off in a deficit situation and we have recommendations before us um, basically eliminating Winterfest at $39,000 a year or, or we're going after public transit uh, as well. I, I think what happens is that we're actually falling prey to the provincial, um, I guess, strategy and that is to play a shell game with, with everything and to, to in essence take the focus away from them and put it on us so that we divide and conquer ourselves and not look at the real big picture. And the real big picture in this front, Mr. Deputy Mayor, uh, is, is the, pro the provincial impact in that $130 million. And in saying that, I can't support the Winterfest uh, um, elimination either. But I, I'm a little surprised. I'm a little disappointed that it's up there because in years past, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we've had these situations where we ask for budget cuts and then and we have the list and everyone, it's the shock and awe approach. This one's not so bad compared to the ones we've had in years past. But even, I just think that Winterfest just doesn't fit um, in, in what we're trying to do as, as a council and as a city. So having said that, I won't be supporting that either. But I think there are there are ways of, of, of finding savings. Uh, I look at the, the BTR as an example and, the, and these reassessments and how I feel we've been duped by the province and by the, by, by the private sector. They benefited from the BTR and now they continue to reassess and, and gain even more. So if we can, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, to Mike, could we, uh, based on the fact that we're losing through these reassessments, could we not consider um, perhaps a shift back uh, with respect to the, the commercial and industrial in order to fill that gap. We're losing $3.5 million as a result of the reassessment. Could we not justify, now that we're below the provincial average, justify an increase in the, in the industrial and commercial to offset that, to send a clear message uh, to, to the business community that we've shifted $100 million a year for I don't know how many years onto the backs of the residential taxpayer and to go through a, reass a reassessment process subsequent to benefiting so substantially from the BTR, I, I, I'm, I'm disappointed, disillusioned, and frankly, I feel betrayed by that. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, could there be a, a rationale or argument put forward that as a direct result of those reassessments that we increase the commercial and industrial sector alone uh, and we shift back as opposed to the residential component? So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the one challenge we face with respect to commercial is we're just below that, that uh, ratio. And to, uh, if we were to have amended uh, the uh, reassessment 
thresholds uh, or if we were to look at our tax rates to transfer more of the burden on to commercial industrial is by increasing commercial we would be above that threshold and then we would have levy restrictions. We would be restricted to transfer the levy pressures on to the commercial. So what we're trying to do is strike a balance to allow us to continue to, uh, to uh, pass on those levy pressures on to the commercial and with respect to industrial we've had the authority through the province to uh, to I believe levy 50 percent of the levy pressures onto the industrial. Uh, so just pointing out in terms of some of our tax policies and around the uh, our reassessment options we're trying to ensure that we can continue to levy the full levy impact on commercial and not face a situation where because we're above that threshold we're restricted and then we're levying more of the levy pressure on to residential. So on that point, so are you telling me that we have no room whatsoever within the industrial sector to increase minimally to, to address the 3.5 million? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, that's, uh, we, we always look at our tax policies uh, in April in terms of our opportunities to shift some of that burden and we'll be coming uh, back in April but uh, we have a significant challenge around commercial because we're just at right. that ratio. And, and if My point is with a $3.5 million impact residentially is far greater an impact than shifting it among the industrial and commercial classes where it would probably be negligible. If, if I know it would be. Um, so through you, Mr. Deputy, because it would be negligible, why don't we approach that, approach, uh, that, that route rather than including the 3.5 and shifting more onto the residential taxpayer. So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, again, uh, and maybe Maria can jump in if I'm missing out on something else, it's that commercial, uh, we're trying to avoid any restrictions on levying onto the commercial. So but when we look at our tax policies that? or thresholds, is if we are restricted, we have no capacity to transfer any of that levy capacity. onto the commercial. Not even 3.5 million? Uh, unless uh, we have authority to distribute half a percent as we are under uh, the provincial legislation for industrial, but I believe that legislation comes forward each and every year. It's something that comes forward in March or April that forms part of our tax policy. Okay, report. so the, there is a probability then, or possibly, that uh, we'll, we'll be in a position to, to have that shift <coughs> built into the commercial and industrial base as opposed to the residential. So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, let me ask Maria in terms of previous years where we were above that threshold, what authority we had with respect to commercial. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, the City of Hamilton's above the uh, provincial range of fairness, so we can't increase our ratios on the commercial industrial. The only way you could do that is to offset the reassessment, what we've shown um, setting the transition ratios, but that has uh, an impact of a 0.1 to the res class. I'm sorry, on... On the residential class. On the residential class. Okay, and that's actually great. You, Mr. Deputy Mayor, because you need to accept the whole bundle of ratios. You okay, can't so, pick and choose. So what's so the alternative is 0.1 percent versus what's the 3.5 percent represent globally to the residential taxpayer? Um, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, do we know what 3.5 percent per I residential? I guess my point is, which one's lower? The 0.1, if we were to take that route, or 3.5 million on the residential tax base. Through you, Deputy Mayor. Sir, I don't know what the 3.5 million dollars coming from. So we can we can take this uh, could, could we, uh, offline okay. because okay. we just want to be clear as to what our restrictions would be. My point in is terms that 3.5 million is more than the point than the point one that's being referred to. Then obviously I just. Would, would like to pursue the lowest impact um, from a rational or reasonable perspective and so do I need do we need to formally ask for that or will direction be uh, suffice yeah. through you uh, mr. deputy mayor we can meet with the councillor but uh, as Maria identified the reason we were not recommending uh, implementing any of the mitigating reassessment shields is if we were to do so it would actually translate into an additional shift onto the residential uh, point one. So we want to meet with the councillor so okay. that the councillor has an understanding on on the measures that we have available, the tools that we have available 
what those shifts would mean between the property classes, and we can do so with the, with the Council prior to our next well, GIC. Again, so going back to the motion, it's all based on the provincial legislation, the fact that we're boxed is, is really comes for, down. For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, there are restrictions with respect to our reassessment tax shifts, and those reassessments would drive some of these uh, consequences and, and outcomes in terms of shifts between our property classes in the case of the reassessment uh, tools that we have uh, available to us, it would actually drive a 0.1% uh, increase to the residential. I, I find that unbelievable, but um, uh, okay. And, and lastly, and again, not because of you, Mike, but the, the way the province has, uh, has, uh, has boxed us. Um, uh, that's fine. I, I guess at the appropriate time, I'll move what uh, Councilor Morley and I will be moving, or we moved earlier uh, to you, to Madam Clerk. When would you like me to uh, pursue the motion? Was that at the end of the presentation that you said? Okay, thank you. So I'll do that at the appropriate time. Thanks, Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Marilla. Councilor Whitehead. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, just on the transit side, I mean, I, you know, I, so long I've been hearing uh, this shouldn't be a social service. It, it should be a, a service that inspires everybody to utilize. And so whenever I hear this 5% Nichols uh, impact, uh, I, I shake my head and going, well, is this a social service or is, is it a service we want to drive many people on to, onto and uh and that is uh maybe a philosophical discussion we need to have but we continue thinking it as a social service then you're not going to get more ridership so we've got to be careful in how we address this issue second piece is um it's pretty clear that the the, the uh, level of service and transit varies from uh, from the lower city to the mountain but yet the mountain residents are paying uh, a heavier fee for a lesser service than the lower city. And I'm suggesting uh, it's an issue. I'll, 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 we'd love to see the, uh, the service increased on, on the mountain, but there's inequity. There's no question about that. And it, and it behooves us to ensure that if we're going to ask those taxpayers on the mountain who has a lesser service to pay a higher level of tax or at the same level of tax as somebody's getting a better service, at the very least we should be considering uh, uh, an increase in the, uh, in the, uh, the rates of the, uh, the pay box. Uh, so that, that offsets the uh, the ever increasing uh, levy on those those homeowners. So I just want to address that from a philosophical point of view. The uh, and I do agree with Councillor McCaddy that uh, we might want to, it may not be just about lowering the levy. It might be reinvesting in our transit system. But first of all, I want to just deal with the uh, the inequity issue and why I think we need to look at the at the fare box and we need to understand where our fare box is relative to many other comparables uh, across this great country. The, uh, the other thing is the Winterfest. The Winterfest, uh, from my perspective, uh, we, we had Gorley that always ties in their Winterfest uh, activities with the broader Winterfest. So this, this activity, first of all, maybe I can ask for the Deputy Mayor to, to, uh, to um, staff. How many festivals take place in the wintertime in the city of Hamilton? In terms of Winterfest? No, no, just how many festivals right. do we fund in the wintertime? I don't know. Okay, so uh, would, it, would it be safe to say this is probably the only one that uh, uh, we, we have going on in the wintertime? Well, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, so we as a department, as a culture group, we coordinate and are responsible for Canada Day and Remembrance Day and Winterfest. So that's all we're responsible for. Otherwise, it's all funded through the special events of the SEAT program. Fair enough. So I, I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to raise here is t there's actually two points. One is uh, that w the, the, we have abundance of festivals in the summertime, but in the winter months to draw people, uh, we have very few. Uh, so to take the very few that we have and start uh, uh, cutting it, I just don't think it's prudent. And not only that, but that 36,000 uh, uh, leverages a lot of goodwill in regards to communities that plug into the broader uh, uh, program for for Winterfest, and I think it should be grown. Quite frankly, when we're talking about 120,000 for a one-day event downtown that only packs one specific geographic area versus Winterfest, which is something that could be expanded through the whole community to celebrate, I just I, I can't understand the philosophy. Um, but that's something that uh, you know we need to have a further discussion on. Uh, but I don't criticize staff for having it up there. I mean, in fact, this is probably one of the uh, the, uh, the the fairest. In regards to not cutting frontline services, one of the first uh, uh, um, recommendations I've seen. So I'm not going to be critical because I, I commend the staff 
for bringing something for the most part is very palatable. And you're not, we're never going to get this perfect. So I, wanna, I don't want to be critical at all. I think this is actually a good start, no question about it. The other one is uh, that I need clarification on is the, uh, uh, the public works. I mean, I, I hate to say this, but if we're going to put pressure on our police services, we better damn well get uh, public works below uh, the, the same target that we're going to target on, on police service at the very least. So when I talk here, the, the pressure on the, uh, the energy piece, I need to understand that a little better. So uh, do we not get charged to Horizons, which is regulated by the Energy Board? Is that how it works? So through, through the chair, that's correct. For use of energy, we, we pay through Hydro One and uh, Hamilton Utilities. Horizon Utilities, sorry. Okay, so it's our, we're, we're, we're the main shareholder of Horizons. Horizons is, our, Horizons is charging us this additional fee that obviously we haven't had to pay before, is that correct? Since the, uh, this is a change in the energy board? No, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if, if the question is, is it the distribution rates that, that make up part of the, our energy bill related to Horizon utilities, I don't believe this the pressure that Jerry has spoken to relates to our distribution rates. I think it's the global adjustment factor. That's something determined by Ontario Energy Board, and that's something that's collected by Horizon, but flows on to... Well, no, I understand uh, that. I understand that. But I, I, what I'm trying to get to is, uh, I, I understand this was for hookup. This is not the, power, the actual power. This is actually a hookup for our lighting. I, I think I heard that earlier. Is that correct? Through the deputy so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I see uh, Jeff Lupton's here, so maybe he can identify the factor that's driving the pressure. Through you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, over the last few years, we've seen uh, ongoing increases to the uh, city street lighting account. It's been a combination of, of uh, various factors, one of them being uh, a legislated uh, connection charge increases from the Ontario Energy Board, which is based on an overall cost of service study. Part of the increase is also due to uh, increases in global adjustment rates. Uh, global adjustment rates, have, uh, along with the hourly Ontario price that represent the commodity portion of the bill, the global adjustment rates have essentially more than doubled the last couple years. That have also contributed to that increase that we've seen for street lighting. Um, what that means for uh, the city with the street lighting account used to be in the old days that uh, you would see a benefit using off-peak uh, energy prices, uh, but because a global adjustment is constant uh, and is applied through every kilowatt hour, you don't see that net benefit the same that we would have in, in past years. The other piece to that increase is also, I think about $200,000 worth is, is due to the increase in uh, the uh, service contract that was uh, 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 retendered, I believe, in the last year. So those combination of factors have contributed to that overall uh, increase that we've seen in street lighting. Yeah, could I, could I understand um, what portion of that could be uh, or, or would be growth related uh, uh, versus uh, uh, lighting that currently uh, we provide in an already established area? Through, through you, Deputy Mayor, um, very little. Uh, a small portion of it would be contributed to gross. I don't know the exact numbers of, of that, Councillor, but most of it would be related to uh, regulated uncontrollable costs that uh, uh, all municipalities have faced with uh, uh, their street lighting accounts and sentinel lighting accounts. So, um, help me understand, if you're already hooked up in an established area, why is, there, why, you already, is that a, an annualized fee for the hookup? Uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, what they do in, in terms of the hookups, we, we refer to that in the street lighting as connection charges, or, or uh, and they're essentially for each connection that we have with our street lighting, uh, we receive a rate or a connection rate. I think today it's about two dollars and thirty-nine cents a connection fee. Uh, going back several years ago, uh, before we saw the, the steep increases in street lighting the last two or three years, our connection charges were. I think somewhere around 30 or 40 cents a, a, a hookup. So what's happened over the, the last few years is that particular piece that connection charges has increased 
that's a regulated OEB approved rate, uh, and that's been, uh, as I touched on earlier, is related to overall cost of service studies that were done in utilities over the last few years that mandated that to uh, that the connection charges had to be increased. Mr. Uh, if, I, if I understand what's saying, uh, what's being said by staff, I'm, I'm hearing that we get, <clears throat> if this is being incorporated as one of the pressures in that 1.3, I'm hearing that the, the connection is a, an annualized cost. So we're getting recharged and recharged and recharged for a connection that may have taken place several years ago. Is that correct? Uh, through you, uh, Deputy, Deputy Mayor. In, in regards to street lighting, they, the, part of the reason that they have a connection charge is, is they don't have a meter uh, per se for each each point of contact. Because if we had a meter for each point of contact, the cost would be uh, astronomical uh, for the street lighting class. The connection fee represents the distribution cost to not only uh, 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 do the initial hookup of, of the service, but also the ongoing uh, uh, maintenance of, of that particular uh, uh, service. So but could, it does stay on an annual so, basis. So could it not be argued then that we're getting double charged? Uh, I, I don't believe so. Well, we're getting double charged on the connection because if it's, it's the same rate, uh, the same formula from year to year to year, it's not just the, the power that re, that's being utilized, but what's also uh, built in there is the actual connection, which doesn't go away. So, uh, a couple things for you, Deputy Mayor. Um, uh, one, uh, that uh, we have, uh, we're sitting on a, a subcommittee right now with the OEB, along with Horizon Utilities in the City of Toronto and uh, the City of Brampton that are looking at this whole metering uh, 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 issue or, or street lighting issue and a uh, non-metered load issue to see if there's any opportunity for change there. But in terms of the connection charge, if you think about it in terms of, of uh, uh, you've, uh, similar to what we have in, in district energy, where the initial capital investment was made into uh, providing a service, and over time you continue to pay back the initial capital investment through uh, what we would refer to as a uh, capacity charge or a fixed rate. So this connection charge is really that similar kind of situation where you're paying that fixed rate or, or that for that initial capital outlay uh, from year to year. When I pay, get my cable hooked up, I get an annual uh, or monthly bill. I get original uh, hookup bill. But I don't get that hookup bill built into my monthly rate going forward. So I guess that's where I'm having a disconnect with the connection. So, so, excuse, excuse the fun. So, so to, to maybe this can help, help clarify a bit. It's not due to the, the, the charge isn't due to the initial hookup. It's due to the, the ongoing connection to the utility system. It's the same thing that you pay for in your utility bill uh, uh, under a distribution rate piece or a transmission rate piece for your house. So you still have that ongoing piece of your, your monthly hydro bill that, that goes towards uh, distribution costs. Okay, so maybe it's just the, 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 the terminology being used versus uh, the, the function. So can I ask uh, through the Deputy Mayor if we can have uh, um, that 1.3, I, I don't know if it was in the actual report, but can we break it down uh, clearly so we understand uh, from a component perspective, what, that, what, what what's contributing to that 1.3? I mean, I understand the connection is one component, but there's other components. Is that correct? So through the, the deputy mayor, the 1.3 is made up of 800,000. The connection charges, as Jeff has indicated, 200,000 for the increase in the, the maintenance contract to the third party that provides the service, and 300,000. Last year, we we had a $600,000 transfer from the energy reserve because we were we thought we could get the global adjustment reduced and we were unsuccessful and we're recommending that that reserve isn't sustainable into the future so we're recommending only taking 300,000 this year so I, I can provide that in an email to all members of council but they're the three components of the 1.3 I appreciate it. I certainly want to uh, to uh, look at that a little, uh, uh, closer but it seems to me that emo must be looking at this as well because obviously this is growing pressure for all municipalities and uh, so that we it used to be, we have to be unison in, in our approach. The other pressure, the big pressure, uh, 
Jerry, you said in, 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 in public works, that was one component. What was the other one? Well, the, the five areas were the AODA, uh, 1.4 million, fuel, 1.8 million, the street lighting, 1.3, winter maintenance, 1 million, and then the, a transit fare increase that right now is not, there's no revenue built into the budget at all. So it's 5.5 million of the, the 8.7 million that public works is over the 2012 base. Can you remind me what the uh, public works overall budget is? The, the gross budget is approximately 270 million. The net budget is, well, there, there it is. The net budget last year was 182.4 million. So of the 8.7 you see there driving the 4.8, the numbers I just described are 5.5. If we didn't have those, and they're unique to the public works department. They're not, other departments don't have those charges. If you didn't have that 5.5, we would be down at uh, what 3.1, 3.2, which would represent a 1.8 percent increase on our bottom line for public works. Okay, but I'm I, I just when I look at the magnitude of, of, of the budget, it seems to me, and I understand there's a uh, uh, significant po component of it is again salary and benefits. It seems to me that there's there there's the old saying is, you go greater the budget, more clients to scale, uh, uh, probably better uh, opportunity to find uh, savings. So uh, understanding some of the pressures you've identified, I still think that uh, when you've got a budget of that size and that magnitude, um, and I think some of the councillors around here have already spoken to uh, efficiencies and operation and, you know, do we need all the men on the street that we have? Obviously, uh, you know, some, some would suggest we don't. Um, but obviously there's some uh, opportunity on that front to alleviate some of these other pressures that you, you can't control. And, and through the Jared Councillor, we, we have reduced six FTE, we eliminated two senior directors, director of support service and their associated support staff. So we have cut the, in overall in public works, including the, the, the rates budget, over $700,000 in employee cost this year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor, and uh, we did find that resolution for Ag and Roll. So if you would just bear with me for a second, I am going to dig it up because I don't want to lose sight of this and I want to make sure that we include this on advice from uh, Councillor Powers. Okay. It was October 16th, Ag and Rural Affairs meeting and moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Partridge that the Agricultural Rules Affairs Committee Advisory Committee requests for an increase in Agriculture and Rules Affairs Advisory Committee grants funding, whereas the amount of the funds available for the rural grants has stayed the same for over six years. Therefore, it be resolved that the Agricultural and Rules Affairs rural grant funding be increased by $5,000 to a total developed for $20,000 altogether. And that is the request sent forward to the 2013 budget deliberations. And again, additional grass cutting in the rural area and uh, our friend Mr. Uh, Davis already picked up on that. So according to Councillor Powers, we need to capture that somewhere, whether it be in the CPP grants or whether it be nodding up there. So, so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, can I just suggest that we'll take this Thank and you. we'll... Uh, We'll capture it as to where it should properly no, be reflected. And that's fine. I just didn't want to lose sight of this. Thank you very much. I have no further speakers, Mike, so okay, continue, please. Uh, again, uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, um, having heard the discussion with respect to the amendments, if we were to net off the uh, Winterfest, we would still uh, be at approximately $4 million in amendments that would reduce uh, the 2013 uh, levy. Uh, I'll just point out that uh, this, the parking rates uh, were spoken to, but there hasn't been any direction with respect to reporting back on any uh, options as it relates to uh, parking meter rates. The $4 million, if we take the $4 million, uh, you'll, you'll see that in terms of where we started, the 2013 operating budget process. We started in September with a levy pressure of uh, just short of $45 million, which translates into a residential impact of 5 
and a half percent since that time. Staff continue to review the 13 uh, budgets. Uh, there have been some updates through boards and agencies as well that uh, have reduced the levy increase. And again, we stand at approximately 2.2% residential impact or approximately $24.3 million. So uh, at a minimum, we're trending in the right direction since the start of this process in September. You're familiar with uh, this table. It's a table that uh, you've seen over the last few years. We've broken down the municipal taxes uh, by city departments, uh, the provincial funding loss. Again, this is the final year. We're assuming a phase out of the $2 million in special funding. Uh, and so that would translate on the, uh, on the average residential property about $8. Boards and agencies uh, represents about $17 or 0.6% and that's principally the uh, Hamilton Police Services budget. Capital Council approved a uh, half percent capital levy increase. That translates into about uh, $15 for an average household. City departments is coming in at uh, approximately 1.4%. And I just don't want to lose sight of the fact that while city departments are coming in at 1.4%, the previous two years, city departments came in below zero. In 2012, city departments came in at uh, negative 0.5% and negative uh, 1.9%. And so uh, while, while staff across all departments and senior management team continue to review their 2013 budget, uh, I think it's been cited a number of times today, is we're challenged in terms of identifying options that do not relate into service level impacts and that are sustainable in terms of the levy. And uh, again, we are not assuming any one-time transfers that will alleviate the budget pressure in 2013 that will translate into pressures 2014. I just want to be very careful that we're trying to develop a sustainable budget for 2013. Uh, so you'll see the total municipal tax change is approximately $81 for our average household or 2.8%. Now when we combine in, I mentioned previously, uh, the education taxes are providing some relief. When we combined in that relief from our education portion of the property taxes, uh, you'll see that the total tax change is about $75 for an average household, or about 2.2%. When we look at the uh, total, uh, total average household uh, bill, you'll see in 2013, based on an average assessed household, and then I'll just remind committee you heard earlier today that our average assessed households now 266,200. Uh, the total municipal taxes again are increasing by $81. Uh, the total municipal portion of the tax bill would amount to 2,981. Education it would be decreasing by $6 uh, to 564. So the total uh, property tax bill for that average assessed household uh, would be approximately uh, $3,545, again, an increase of $75 or 2.2%. Uh, we've uh, spoken to uh, Public Works in terms of those amendments, and again, I just want to highlight that this table actually reflects those amendments, the $4 million in amendments, and this table is uh, specific to city departments, uh, city expen expenditures. We do not, do not have boards and agencies as part of this table, but we're just highlighting uh, the uh, changes uh, with the updated amendments uh, in terms of each of the departments and you'll see the range in the departments uh, and you'll see total city expenditures are increasing by approximately 3% or 13.2 uh, million. Uh, I'm sure Tim wants me to highlight that while uh, planning economic development is increasing by 1.8%, if we net it off, enhancement that was approved in 2012 as it relates to the interest costs of the downtown program, planning economic developments budget is increasing by 0.9%. What we've shown up above with respect to community services is if you applied the upload benefits to community services, they are coming in below zero, zero point, uh, minus 0.7%. If you were to exclude the upload benefits, and were not to apply it against community services, 
their, their budget would be increasing by about two and a half million dollars or 1.9 percent. So again, information that's, uh, that may be familiar to you, it's been part of previous presentations, we're just updating it to reflect that four million dollars in uh, potential amendments. In terms of the total, uh, total tax impacts, uh, again, uh, we are, we've updated this uh, graph to show our current update at 2.2%. You may recall in January, we were at 2.9%, and we were at the far right end of our comparator group. We're now towards the middle of that comparator group, but I want to point out there's not a lot of deviation between the range here. Uh, in case of uh, CP, if it's difficult to read, the uh, footnote CP stands for uh, current position. So uh, in the case of Halton, and, and we're capturing both the upper tier and lower tier to capture the full impact, they're at the far end in terms of 1.9% uh, current position, Guelph, is at the other end of the spectrum at 3%. Uh, but again, we were 2.9% in January. We were still within the range, but now we're towards the lower mid uh, of our range of compared to municipalities. And we're seeing municipalities all within that range of 1.9 to 3%. We continue to try to update this information, but again, uh, we're updating this on a uh, regular basis based on uh, information we can access through web media or through our treasurer's group and that information is updated periodically and this is the most up-to-date information we have at this time. In terms of, uh, I, I, I should uh, highlight that the 2.2 percent uh, does not include uh, enhancements, either council referred enhancements or uh, other requested enhancements. So there were 28 items referred by council to the 2013 budget process. The uh, net impact of those are approximately $4.8 million with an annualized FTE impact of 10.8 FTEs. That uh, would contribute an additional 0.6% in terms of total tax impact. Uh, and there would, if all of those um, enhancements were approved, it would add an additional uh, just short of half a million dollars in pressures to our 2014 budget process. In addition to those council referred items, there are uh, four requested items that were submitted as part of the 2013 budget process. Uh, the net impact of those are approximately uh, $206,000 uh, and an annualized FDE of approximately eight the total tax impact of all of those enhancements would add an additional 0 0.03. I just want to point out that uh, there's a significant difference in the gross and net, and as you may recall, as part of the planning economic development presentation, one of the options was sustainable in that the funding would come from a reserve and would not add any pressures on to the net levy. So if you're questioning that uh, difference between gross and net, uh, that's one of the uh, enhancements that would not add to the levy, uh, but nonetheless uh, would represent an increase in gross expenditure in FTEs. In terms of uh, some ranges, um, again, we stand at 2.2%, which represents a levy increase of approximately $24.3 million. Uh, the previous comparator slide showed Halton Burlington at 1.9%. Uh, to achieve a target of 1.9%. Uh, again, that 2.2 is exclusive in, of enhancements. To uh, arrive at a total of 1.9% exclusive of enhancements requires further reductions of $2.1 million. To arrive at a 1% target exclusive of enhancements requires further reductions of $9.5 million. And you'll see the final scenario of a 0% requires further reductions of $17.7 .7 million. Uh, again, 1% now including education translates into additional $8.2 million in revenues. 1% of the municipal portion excluding the education uh, represents a further $6.9 million. So in terms of the process, 
Uh, Mike, I've got uh, maybe a speaker's list here. Councillor Partridge, Councillor Pearson, Councillor Johnson, Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Duvall, and Councillor Collins. Councillor Partridge, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, Mike, could you please go to slide number 14, I think it is? 14? 14, I think. Hang on, let me put my glasses on. No, I'm sorry. Not that far back. 26. That's better. Put my glasses on now. Thank you. <laughs> I thought if we were going to 14, I might need a defibrillator. <laughs> No, no, we can't move backwards. We just got to keep going forwards here. Um, so my, my question is, when I, when I look at this, and you did say that, um, you know, that, that, that total is based on uh, uh, the average assessment per home, and is that, the, I'm assuming that's the new average that's assessment? That's the city, new citywide through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, new citywide average of 266, 200. 266, 200, and I appreciate that. Um, in previous years, what we have done is we have broken it down. Uh, we've had a breakdown of per ward what the average would be because it certainly is going to be different in Ancaster and Flamborough and, and Glanbrook and, and you know all, all of our wards exactly what that assessment's going to be. The $75 for my residence is not going to be $75. It's going so through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we can take the information that's actually on slide 14 as uh, where the councillor started the discussion, yes, which is yes. the average assessments by ward, and we can provide you a uh, sense of what the tax impacts would be by ward, and at some point we'll have to combine the other factors that will impact on the total tax impact, including some of our tax policies, area rating, and other op other factors into the into the final. Final. Okay, and, and uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, I appreciate that because that certainly, um, I, th I think it's helpful for, for all of us. Um, the other thing too is that it, it does show our residents. Uh, I don't like to guess and say, well, if it's 266 and the average home in Flamborough, so it could be two times, it could be three times. Um, I'd rather be accurate on, on that. So I appreciate if you could do that. Um, on slide number 29, I just want to confirm or I guess my question through you, how many, uh, we're in the, uh, well, a little below the middle of the pack there, but how many of the cities that are up there have actually approved all those budgets? So again, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we've tried to capture that with the reference to A, and I see one, two, three uh, of this group that are reflected as their current position, so they would not have uh, approved their budgets. Again. We're trying to track this information. We don't have a formal process where we're all reporting this information. And so again, we're looking at uh, a series of tools available, including web media and through our association, Treasurer's Association. And I appreciate that um, because I know certainly within Burlington, um, they're looking at anything from 3.5 to 4.2% uh, increase. So I think they're, they're, they're definitely still uh, deliberating on that. So I think that's important though, because you know, certainly for people um, in many areas of the city, we're con continually being compared to Burlington, and I don't think that's a fair comparison. Uh, we just need to be clear on, on um, where they are in that process. So thank you, those are my questions. So just, just through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, because the councillor made reference to Burlington. Again, we've tried to capture the lower tier and upper tier for the total impact. And as you may recall from our previous presentations, the upper tier in the case of Halton continues to benefit from the phasing out of GTA pooling. So there may be some efficiencies when you're looking at that combined taxation bill uh, with respect to that region and that particular municipality. Right, and I appreciate that point being made, Mike, because again, another reason why it's not a fair comparison uh, between, uh, for Hamilton certainly, to be compared to Burlington um, and Halton region. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Councillor Pearson, please. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. A couple of my questions have been answered, but Mike, I just wanted to verify also whatever is finalized now does not incorporate for the um, outlying areas our area rating charge. So for Stony Creek, 1.4% would be added on to whatever our final so, bill is. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we aren't uh, making any assumptions. We bring that back in April as part of our tax policies report, and we will reflect that, but we can provide that information as we start developing the ward impacts and share that information with you. Thank you, Councilor Pearson. Councilor Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Mike, I'm glad you left it on that slide. Thank you. My ward borders two other municipalities. 
West Lincoln and Haldeman County. Having said that, I'm assuming that West Lincoln has been captured under the Niagara region. So through you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I believe we're in this case, uh, we were challenged in getting information, so we're just capturing the regional number, not the lower tier number. Okay, so is that the same for the Haldeman County? Because it seems to me that if we're gonna capture other um, municipalities, can we not capture the ones that are right next door to us? Because I'm often given and challenged with, if I lived in Caledonia, here's where my taxes would be. So we can try to provide uh, that, that community. And uh, again, we do try to provide the total impact as we've had, uh, have with respect to Halton and Burlington. We can look at Niagara region. I know we were challenged to get the lower tier uh, figures for Niagara region. And at a minimum, we've presented the regional figure. Okay, and thank you for that. And through you, Deputy Mayor, um, I remember last year and the year before, there were a couple of municipalities that actually came in at the zero. Was London not one of them? For you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'd have to look at uh, 2012 actuals as to whether or not uh, London. And can you also look to see whether or not, I, I don't see Windsor up there. I thought Windsor was part of that collection as well. Um, and there, there just seems to be some, some municipalities that are missing in my mind, like Barrie and, and, uh, um, and Windsor. And to me, is there any other municipality that is going for the zero and maintaining it at the zero? Because I know that's a challenge in itself, but I've seen that a lot of them that were at zero are not, right. unless we've got a totally different slate of cities here. So in terms of, uh, again, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we continue to look at this information as of yesterday, our staff identified that London's website confirms their current position at 2.5% with options to reduce to zero. Uh, Windsor indicates a target of zero. But okay, not so Windsor zero. was on, I believe it a was on there last zero, year. Though. So they're targeting zero as well. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Whitehead was next. So he has, his keys are still here, so he hasn't left the house. Councillor Duvall, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mike, the um, counselor's enhancements that we had, um, I understand in, in October the 10th, 2012, uh, there was a three-part motion that was put on and had to do with the FTEs for Ward 7 and Ward 8. And then there was a second part, uh, and the third part was to look back, uh, coming back into 2013, for uh, FTEs uh, for the other counselor's office. Have we married this all into one uh, um, on your report? So uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I believe the enhancement uh, is a bundled uh, enhancement, but within the details of that enhancement, we've tried to isolate, as, as the counselors described, specific to those two wards, what the enhancement uh, relates to, and then with respect to the uh, full legislative budget, what the uh, enhancement relates to. So so it's all bundled as one enhancement, but the uh, breakdown to, to, I think, we're trying to capture the breakdown as best as we can within that enhancement form. So can we, can we put it so that exactly what the motion had said, that the two FTEs would be considered in 2013, and then there was a Part C where another enhancement was asked for. So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we will uh, visit the motion, the wording in the motion, and if we need to amend that enhancement, we'll amend that enhancement. Okay, so approving, uh, nothing would change then as of today. We can, we can go forward and we still have discussion yep. on this issue. Through you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, the enhancements through the process. We will get to the enhancements, uh, and if it requires an update to that enhancement form, we'll bring that forward at our next GIC. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duvall. Councillor Whitehead. I just want to, on that note, just make the distinction. Those two uh, staff people are already in place. So uh, as opposed to one that's been considered uh, and this one, it has implications in the context of people that are already in place uh, doing the work and um, and obviously in a bubble uh, until we resolve this. So I just want to highlight that that is an issue. 
And secondly, uh, I'm just curious, because you got the right slide up. Where's Windsor? So, so yeah, so again, uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, the, uh, <laughs> as of yesterday, Windsor is targeting a 0%, uh, but Windsor has some very significant pressures around reassessment. And so uh, earlier today, we cited our pressures around industrial and commercial, and uh, Windsor is having some significant pressures around reassessment and assessment growth and assessment appeals. The one we're all familiar with is their casino appeal uh, that's contributing to pressure. So while their target is zero, they're fighting a uh, uphill uh, challenge with respect to assessment and assessment and appeals and breakdowns. Did they not come in at zero last year? For you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'd have to revisit where the communities came in. Uh, I'm just taking a look at uh, Windsor because, uh, I mean, it's still one of the significant communities in Ontario. Uh, it, is, it has gone through uh, a lot what we've went through in regards to industrial, uh, um, erosion of the industrial uh, uh, assessment. Um, and employment, quite frankly. So I look at the pressures in Windsor, and yet uh, they continue to deliver. Uh, you know, whether it's the police services uh, uh, budget, usually around zero, I think it was zero last year. Uh, I think it's zero again this year. Uh, they, they deliver on, um, on their budget last year, I believe it was zero, and I think the year before it was one of the lowest in Ontario as well. So I'm trying to understand what is Windsor doing differently, or what is different about Windsor in the context of achieving uh, these laudable goals that we can't, can't meet? I, I'm having real trouble understanding that. So, so through you, Mr. Mayor, and our experience is each municipality have different circumstances each and every year. Um, in the case of uh, Windsor, uh, in previous years, they benefited from provincial transfers. They, they received higher provincial transfers as they were going through some uh, pressures around their caseload and other social services related costs. And uh, they might have been uh, more favorable to Windsor than um, other communities, as the councillor cited, as Windsor went through a significant decrease in an assessment. Some of those transfer payments uh, were based on the change in your assessment. So your assessment was a proxy for your ability to pay. And so if you had a decrease in assessment and a increase in social related, social services related costs, you received increased, an increased level of, of transfer funding. So I'm just citing that as one example where communities uh, receive different relief as it relates to uh, different pressure. Employee related costs vary uh, across uh, municipalities. Growth rates, uh, assessment growth rates uh, vary and that provides some relief in some communities. We've cited on numerous occasions uh, to the GTA pooling benefits that uh, those municipalities have realized over the last seven years that have uh, contributed to uh, offsetting the levy increase and allowing them some enhancements in their capital program. Some municipalities have deferred capital, which while that's an option for one year, that's not sustainable on a uh, regular basis. So some municipalities have deferred capital for one year to achieve a, uh, a budget target in that particular year, but not a sustainable strategy. And in fact, some of those municipalities like Hamilton have significant infrastructure deficits. So they're just adding on to their pressures on a go forward basis. So again, there are different circumstances in different municipalities, uh, different pressures, sometimes different uh, levels of financial uh, assistance that helps alleviate the need to turn to the levy for increases. Uh, but as it relates to 2012, we can try to provide you a summary of where some of those municipalities uh, landed their 2012 tax increases. I understand that, but I, I, the point I'm making and uh, a one-off, that's fine, but Windsor's been able to do it with all their challenges over the last three years. And I guess my concern or my challenge is, especially when I go out to the community who keep uh, telling me how, how well Windsor is doing in regards to their, their, their tax increases. Uh, I mean, I heard the province say that Hamilton was getting special treatment and they couldn't continue giving a special treatment, yet I'm hearing that maybe Windsor was receiving a higher level of funding 
than, than Hamilton. So I'm, now I'm trying to reconcile my own mind. How come Hamilton was being isolated as getting special treatment when you're indicating that Windsor was probably getting a, a higher level of, of funding in regards to uh, the assessment versus uh, population growth and so forth? So uh, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, specific to Windsor, in the case of the uh, transfer funding, it wasn't special funding. It's a prescribed formula that applies to all municipalities. It just happens that uh, Windsor's assessment was decreasing at the time, and so consequently their level of subsidy transfer payment was increasing because the province used your assessment base as a proxy of the community's ability to pay and support social services. In the case of some previous years, and I can share some examples on how Windsor achieved some of those previous uh, tax uh, targets, is that they in fact affected service levels. They've they closed some childcare facilities and made, uh, you know, some difficult decisions around uh, services. And so, uh, similar to the difficult decisions some communities make with respect to deferring capital, Windsor made some difficult decisions with respect to their service levels. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Collins. I wanted to uh, pick up where Councillor Duval left off and. I'm rereading the October motion that read, um, for you, Mr. Chairman, that we would fund the, uh, the two FTEs in wards seven and eight, and that was to deal with the population discrepancy that we had noted through our review. And it was, it was funded temporarily through reserve to get us through the latter portion of 2012. And then it was referred to 213 in order to find a permanent funding source, obviously through the budget and through the levy. And um, so somehow then it's, as Councillor Duvall noted, it's been, it's been added to the um, enhancement request that was put through another committee and at a separate time. So it, is there a way to separate those two then, Mike? I th think I heard your answer was yes, but I, we currently have two positions now that are unfunded, and I think the intent was to fund them. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we'll look at that enhancement form, and if it means unbundling, uh, those two particular issues, we'll do that and we'll bring that forward at a future budget GIC as an amendment to the enhancements. All right, those are my only questions. If you can come back to me then, Mr. Chairman, on the, um, on the other motions that we were going to put earlier in the meeting, I have a couple here still waiting for us to approve. I'll be doing that later on, so okay. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Mike, uh, I don't have anybody else on speaker's list, so will continue, please. Sorry. So in terms of the budget process, as I mentioned previously, this represents the beginning of the uh, deliberations. Uh, you have before you all of the recommendations through the uh, staff report. Um, and uh, council, it's being uh, suggested by staff that council can deliberate each of the submissions. We've tried to, uh, to organize the staff report in such a way that uh, it allows you to deliberate, for instance, uh, and, and I'll refer to the next slide, to the uh, volunteer advisory committee budgets, boards and agencies, and city budgets. Um, in talking with clerks, uh, we do suggest that if, uh, if there are any amendments to the volunteer advisory committee budgets, is that uh, it could be deferred if committee uh, has no issues with the volunteer advisory committee budgets, uh, committee could go ahead and refer those on to council. With respect to boards and agencies, we have a, a uh, couple of, of agencies or areas within boards of agencies that are still being considered, including Hamilton Police Services, uh, as well as the CPP, uh, uh, Community Partnership Program, uh, and as well I mentioned that uh, I will still be meeting with the transition, HECFI transition team to, uh, in an effort to try to determine if there are any potential savings through the HECFI transition that can be considered as part of our 2013 tax supported budget process. So it may be appropriate to uh, defer the boards and agencies at this time until we have some of those uh, additional updates uh, to avoid any need for that reconsideration. Um, with respect to the city budgets, we would uh, recommend uh, that until such time as uh, committee is comfortable with the global uh, tax impact, 
is that you defer the departmental budgets. Again, what we're trying to avoid is uh, the need for a reconsideration. So for instance, if you were to approve the community services or corporate services budget, uh, and then you were looking for some further amendments, uh, then you would have to have a reconsideration uh, of the corporate services budget. So again, uh, we've tried to organize it in such a way that you could move forward with uh, some of the budgets, including the volunteer advisory committee budgets. Uh, we're hoping that the boards and agencies, there'll be some updates that allow you to, uh, to consider those budgets uh, as well as the departmental budgets or uh, city budgets. Uh, so again, you'll have, uh, there are again, a, a number of amendments that were highlighted today, recon recognizing that uh, there was one particular amendment that committee was not supportive of, and uh, it would be helpful if at some point there was a motion to move uh, those amendments forward and so that we could continue to, to reflect where we stand in terms of the 2.2%. Uh, so again, there was approximately $4 million in amendments. Uh, if committee could move forward with uh, those amendments, it would help us in moving forward with respect to the overall uh, tax impact or increase. So in addition, uh, again, I cited in my presentation, there's a number of uh, council referred items and a number of requested items, and those will have to be uh, deliberated by committee uh, going forward as well. So again, those are captured as enhancements in your book, and we'll have to revisit the particular issue that was identified with respect to the legislative enhancement, and we'll uh, make the necessary amendments to that enhancement form to properly reflect the wording uh, of the motion. So again, uh, you have with before you today as part of your your agenda, the staff report, and again, we've tried to organize a staff report in such a way to assist you and clerks with respect to the deliberations. So again, uh, today uh, marks the start of the deliberations, uh, and uh, we have additional budget GIC scheduled for March 4th, which is Monday, the 7th, uh, March 21st, <coughs> recognizing March break falls between the 7th and 21st. The, uh, we, we're currently targeting council approval on March 27th, and we would bring back the tax policies in April. <coughs> and thank you for your patience today. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I have Councillor Jackson and Councillor Collins. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Um, in your uh, first go around, uh, Mike, as acting general manager, Mike, you're doing an outstanding job. I really appreciate what you're doing, Mike. Thank you. And um, so thank you for bringing us thus far. So, Mike, I just, uh, I'm just in my mind doing a little mental summary here. The volunteer committees and their budgets, now I serve on three of them, and the three that I, and the three that I serve on um, are all coming in with uh, maintenance budgets. Um, just the youth advisories asking for a one-time uh, couple of thousand extra because they're putting on a, a youth week here in Hamilton in May um, with workshops and that. But So I'm relying on the rest of my colleagues who serve on the other volunteer committees because they, they know their budgets best, they know the volunteers and their work best. As far as I'm concerned, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm happy to move on the volunteer budget request today. So that's item one, uh, Mike. Um, Item two, Mike, the proposed city amendments that you put up there on slide 24 it was, I believe. Was it slide 24? Yes. No, slide 20. Yes, I believe it was slide 24. Thank you. Outside of the cancellation of the Winterfest, which at the appropriate time, I would hope Councillor Collins, somebody will move deletion of that. Uh, the rest of that list, approximate four million, I'd be happy to move that forward and adopt that, minus the cancellation of Winterfest. Um, item three, Mike, the ABCs and uh, the departmental budgets, uh, I would prefer to hold those off and not make any determination on those today. A lot of the ABCs uh, came in with zero requests from 13 over 2012. So that's wonderful. I, I respect that. That's uh, much appreciated. 
Um, but um, in light of uh, some of, like you said, a few others that we need some updated information on, of course, the police budget, that's almost its own animal in terms of where that's going to end up. So I'd like to just continue to park the ABCs and the tax supported operating budget of the various departments, which is your report 5.3 today, um, Mike. Again, um, procedurally, it says planning and economic development, public health, community services, corporate services, all these uh, to be approved. Um, I know we could undo them down the road, but uh, to approve them basically gives almost taking them to that next step of uh, we're going to adopt them. And I just worry that by just approving them today, looking at the global number of 2.2, there might be still some individual departments and or collectively across SMT that we could hopefully get that 2.2 down further. So, Mike, uh, those are generally my comments. And, Mike, if we, if council wanted to try to match the 0 0.9 it had in the first year of this term of council, we had 0 0.9, we had 0 0.8, we're sitting at 2.2 approximately. So I see on this slide 32, you're saying roughly about another 9.5 million reduces by 1%, that gets us down to 1.2. So give or take, we're looking at maybe 10 to 11 million dollars to get us down to a 0 0.9, Mike. That'd through be an accurate you, assessment. Through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, yes. Exclusive of enhancements. Again, the enhancements aren't reflected in yes. these numbers. Thank you. Okay, um, so I still want to continue working towards reducing the 2.2, and the enhancements are still before us as well. I think there's going to have to be some give and take amongst uh, uh, council over the next uh, two to three weeks. I want to still have opportunity and time to confer with my colleagues. I want to have opportunity to sit down with uh, various department heads just to uh, go over their budgets if I need to. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'm happy to move today on the volunteer budgets, assuming that my colleagues who sit on the other volunteer committees say that they, their, uh, their requests are prudent. Um, I'd still rather park the overall ABCs. I'd like to park the departmental budgets. And I'd like to move on the proposed amendment slide 24 uh, with the deletion of the Winterfest and keep the enhancements parked as well. And I still think overall, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Mike, you've done a great job and through our city manager and SMT, get us from 5.5 down to 2.2 in about four months. I still think we can do better from the 2.2. Those are my comments. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor Collins. Yeah, Mr. Sorry, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, just Councillor Jackson referred to parking the items, and I know that clerks is uh, making reference to deferring them to avoid having to lift these items back at future uh, committee. Oh, works. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Councillor Collins? Yep, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And along the same lines, uh, we still have some work to do to cross the budget finish line, so to speak. And But I, I would be in a position, as uh, Councillor Jackson mentioned earlier, to... Uh, to approve the volunteer committees. I, I don't see anything there that jumps off the page that suggests that we're going to make uh, further cuts or any cuts, in fact, to, to those lines. And so I'd be uh, supportive of that. And um, in terms of the uh, boards and agencies, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the only outstanding one that we have currently is the, um, is the police budget. Is that not? So uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, we have the police department. Uh, community partnership program is captured in boards and agencies. There's an enhancement request as it relates to uh, police uh, costing of 64000 And then with respect to HECFI, it's captured there. We can move forward. I believe the HECFI budget is reflecting the 2012 HECFI budget. But if there are any opportunities to apply some savings through the transition to 2013, I was hoping to engage the HECFI transition team in the next over the next two weeks in an effort to try to identify if there are any savings, sustainable savings, that can be applied in 2013 to reduce the levy. Okay. Then we can leave those, I guess, till the next meeting. And, and that brings me to my next question for the Monday meeting. Now that we sort of have a, a good understanding now from all departments, um, boards and agencies and beyond what the 2013 budget landscape looks like. And, and so Monday's meeting, we're, we anticipate seeing what, Mike, at this point in time? So uh, through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, recognizing that today's Thursday and uh, it doesn't allow us a lot of time, 
to report back. There were some items, uh, I believe, and there may be some motions uh, coming out today. I'm not sure that we'll be able to provide that information by Monday. Uh, we may be challenged in bringing new information uh, unless council or committee wishes to to convene on uh, Monday on the 4th and have some further deliberations. The alternative is uh, I, we're trying to target bringing a preliminary forecast of our 2012 year end to the March 7th budget GIC. And again, we're just trying to provide you information as you go through your deliberations as we have today with respect to our uh, net growth number and reassessment. Uh, I, I know my staff have developed a preliminary report and I'll be meeting with them and if possible, we would try to bring that forward at the March 7th for your information as well. Okay, so maybe between now and then, if, if it seems like that information that you referenced is not available, maybe there's something that uh, through your department and clerks, we can look at the status of Monday's meeting and whether it's needed at all, but maybe we can make that determination over the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. Um, I think that's, that's about the extent of my questions at this point in time. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Councillor Powers. Thank you, Raj. Uh, like my councillor colleagues, I would support this. Um, the only thing I had a challenge with was obviously there wasn't a spreadsheet with regards to the volunteer groups. You had to go through every one of them and figure out, you know, what their allowance, what their budget was last year, what their ask was this year, and that. But kind of going through them, um, there's a minimal deviation in, in in all of them. So I I support that. Certainly, Councillor Jackson's motion. The sooner we can get on that one, with regards to the uh, the reductions, exclusive of the, um, uh, the the winter fest, because it goes beyond just the waterfront. I mean, the uh, road tree, winter carnival in Dundas, has been programmed to take advantage of the win the uh, winter fest going on in that. So it's uh, it, it's something that we should invest in this year. Continue to have the dialogue that we can either make it better with better partners, but it's a, it's a minimal uh, adjustment. Um, the same thing with the with the uh, boards and agencies. Senate. Let's go and uh, go ahead and approve what we already know and uh, and uh, at least get that in place. And um, you know, wait for the police to come back. Their their discussions and, uh, and and those particular ones. So let's let's not waste the day. Let's make some decisions and um, and uh, and move on to the next step whenever that happens to be. Thank you, Councillor Powers. Yeah, just the, uh, the, sh the just, shop and Sorry, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. We have a spreadsheet of the boards and agencies here, and so if it's the, uh, the uh, WISHIP committee to defer the police uh, services, you could defer that one, and the CPP program. You can, in fact, move ahead with the HECFI, and we could try to capture any potential savings uh, Tom Hewitt since identified that we could capture that in our corporate financials so you can move ahead with the HECFI and we could try to still incorporate any potential HECFI related savings through our uh, corporate financials budget. So we've just done that is as Councillor Jackson alluded to is you know we don't finalize we finalize the budget as, or as soon as we possibly can but we'll have that breather probably over the next month or six weeks in that and uh, and obviously with your dialogue over the next couple of weeks in that you'll uh, you'll get a better uh, idea of how ECFI is playing out, and you may come back to us uh, towards the last minute to, uh, to make some further adjustments. So um, my suggestion is we include the number for ECFI because it's, it's mirror the number of last year. And uh, anyway. Thank you, Councilor Powers. Councilor McCaddy. Thanks, Mr. Deaf Mayor. And just a clarification, Mike, because I was a bit confused by your ECFI comments. Uh, the uh, the savings that uh, were promised to us by the new operators, uh, you're not talking about that. You're talking about additional savings, are you, that uh, that would be found within the HECFI operations? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, it's actually the savings from the transition. <clears throat> so recognizing there's operating uh, savings, but there were some subsidy uh, figures. If you recall, uh, through HECFI, there was a subsidy to the Bulldogs. Uh, which again, we uh, want to have some further discussions with the transition team as to whether or not those are potential savings in part in 2013 that would have an annualized impact in 2014. So again, we're looking for some sustainable savings occurring through that transition. Okay, thanks for the clarification. 
Thank you, Councilor McCaddy. Councilor Park. No, oh, it's Councilor Whitehead. Missed him. Sorry. Can I? Uh, could I just ask um, two things? One is I, I certainly support uh, um, what you know what my colleagues have indicated so far. I mean, the winter fest we take off. Uh, I don't really have a problem with. Uh, uh, the conservation authorities, for example, I, think, I don't think we're going to see any changes. We know we can be challenged, so I don't have a problem moving quicker on, on, on the, one, the easy ones, the ones that we know there's not going to be any, uh, any changes. The other piece that I want to identify that, and I think I'm going to have to sit down with the general manager of uh, uh, social services, uh, Joanne Priel, uh, what sometimes we overlook is because of the uploading, uh, it, it, the, the, the budget looked very uh, um, um, laudable, but when you look at uh, without the uploading, it's actually a 1.9 percent increase, which is about two million dollars, if I remember right. Yeah, on slide 28. So we haven't really focused on it because we look at that 0.7 percent uh, minus, and we're going, okay, well, you know, we don't have to work, focus on that. Well, now I'm looking at the 1.9, saying, well, maybe there's some room, uh, and maybe we should put a little uh, healthy tension in that division to see if we can bring that down. So my question to Michael, if uh, we do that. The uploading has no impact on it, so that would be a direct levy uh, a benefit, would it not? Yeah. Through uh, you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I know that uh, uh, Joanne is away and uh, Vicky and their DMT continue to look at their 2013 budget as all SMT members are. In terms of the, um, the exclusive of the upload, the two and a half million dollar uh, pressure. I'm not sure that uh, any reductions in those would translate into any foregone uh, subsidy uh, sharing. But again, that would be something I'm sure that community services would consider as we continue to move forward through our GIC. So maybe on March 7th, they'll provide, be able to provide whether or not any of those pressures, uh, if council. Uh, were to look to amend those pressures, whether or not there would be any partial offsetting in subsidy. And I guess my, my point is, is that uh, certainly from my perspective, I saw the point seven, I said, okay, well, let's focus on the ones that are, you know, like public works that are much higher. But when I look at it again, I, I, I see that we need to put some healthy tension there because I think there might perhaps be, and we may not be big, but I think there's still savings to be had even in that division. And it's a significant division. So. Uh, uh, I would want to lose sight of that, uh, and I just want to say for the benefit of my colleagues that uh, I think it's at least worth uh, doing that. So thanks. Okay, a couple things on the go here. I was looking for Carolyn for some guidance here because I think we're steering off here. We're not, we got to finish up Mike's presentation. But Carolyn, please for a moment. Yes, through the chair. In terms of process, I'd just like to clarify for the committee that at this point. Um, the committee is still in discussion of, of the presentation that is being provided by Mike. Um, following receipt of that presentation and motions that uh, a number of councillors would like to put forward as a result of the presentation, then the committee would go into discussion of the actual reports that are in the agenda, starting with 5.1, which is the advisory committee budgets, and then moving on to 5.2 and so on. In terms of what is approved at today's meeting, um, as in previous years with budget meetings, um, all of the approvals, all of the recommendations will go in one final report at the end of the budget process, which would be the March 27th Council meeting. So whatever is approved today, it, it, it's an ongoing process. Um, and as in previous years, anything that is put in the, in the parking lot is so noted and brought forward at the appropriate time at a future meeting of the committee. So, just okay. Thanks, Carolyn. Chris, if I can be help to, uh, helpful here, uh, Deputy Mayor, if if the leaning is to uh, council uh, Monday's meeting. Uh, I was just conferring with uh, the GMs. I mean, we'll all be here Monday. Um, so if you want to, if individually you wish to book some time with, uh, you know, any one of the GMs and myself, then just as soon as you can let us know so that we could start to set up times. If you want to have some one-on-one -on -one discussions with any one of us, um, we could use Monday as a way to uh, answer any other questions that come to you over the course of the weekend. 
and that way when we go into uh, the meeting on the 7th, we will have a better idea of what it is that you were thinking might work. Uh, we're going to continue working on our budget if that's the direction that you give us, and I suspect you will. So um, that's, a, that's a way for us to get even closer to where, you know, ultimately I think you guys want to be. So uh, I'm just going to put that out if you so choose to Council Monday. Okay, so Carolyn, we have to deal with the motions before we receive Mike's presentation, though, to get that included into the package. No? Okay. No, the, the presentation can be received. Okay. And then the individual motions can right. be dealt with uh, Which we have as they're put forward. Okay. Also, in terms of Monday's meeting, in, um, procedurally, we would require 48 hours to notify if that meeting is going to be cancelled. So it would be appreciated if the decision for that meeting could be made today, whether it's required or not. Please. Okay, thank you. And I have to, we do motions, I have to do Lloyd, Lloyd. Councillor Ferguson's first because he has to be out of here. So, back to it. So, move to receive Mike's presentation. Ooh, yep, I've got, I've got you. So, Councillor Farr and seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Thank you. Now, we're on to motions. And Councillor Ferguson is the first one. We have, I have Councillor Marula twice down here, Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Collins twice, so whatever you have for motions, but we'll, we'll see how we go along here. This Councillor Ferguson, Thank please. You. And, and I just first also want to congratulate Mike. He walked into a tough spot here, we had a budget time taking over this job. And it's easy to follow, it's succinct, he has all the answers. I just, as Councillor Jackson, to just recognize Mike for the great work he's done so far. <laughs> Great job, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> that's the Coles version. Yeah, that's the Coles version. Okay, I'd like to move, seconded by Councillor Powers, the staff be directed to report back at a future General Issues Committee meeting on the implications of the Accessibility for Ontario's Ontarians with Disabilities Act and with fuel costs as it relates to transit rates, including their area rating implications and the equitability, equitable balance of fare increases versus the levy and B, that the report also include ridership numbers over the last three years and show potential revenue generation that result from incremental transit fare increases. And just briefly, I, I, I heard Councilor Marula talk about the area rating, and, and uh, he's right. And so that's why I've included the area rating analysis, just so we can see the impact. It did, it, it did concern me earlier in the week when I heard another member of Council talk about we still got to deal with the area rating with transit, which will eventually, if that happened, it would cascade through to all of us. So, I'm anxious to see these numbers. Um, we, we heard $3.4 million is the implications of the fuel because the buses are being taken out of service for the, uh, the, the natural gas and the $1.4 million for the uh, AODA implications. And, and so uh, working in, uh, with that equitable balance, I called it in the motion, which is that 48, 52% funding model, what's that look like? Just so we can see it and we can make the right decision. So. Uh, so hence, I, I put the motion forward. Okay, Council McHattie. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor, I, I just want to be clear that I can't support this motion. Uh, it, it, uh, I was hoping we were uh, turning a page uh, this past Monday when we had our uh, LRT report and the report. It, it spoke to uh, additional transit investments that we need to make across the city. To, uh, to increase our ridership and uh, reflecting on the uh, presentation the previous week by Don McLean and uh, during the citizens part of the budget presentations, we, uh, we have fallen uh, some distance in our ridership numbers compared to other municipalities. Uh, simple reason, we, we just haven't uh, uh, made the investments in uh, increasing transit service on, on the ground. In fact, during my decade here now, my 10 years on council, uh, we have not made any uh, contributions to uh, improving uh, transit uh, service uh, from the levy. We've, we've contributed through provincial gas tax, that's fairly easy to do, thanks province and uh, contributing that way, uh, but we've uh, made no contributions uh, from the levy uh, to improving the, the transit service. I think the time is now uh, for us to do that uh, and uh, to carry on uh, past practice of uh, backfilling the, uh, the public works budget i.e. the HSR component of the public works budget uh, through uh, fare increases is the wrong way to go. Uh, the levy should be picking up costs for fuel and uh, the same way they do for the fleet at the city, uh, other parts of the fleet. 
So I, uh, I disagree strongly with this approach and to me it's something I hope that we were uh, past this kind of debate uh, when we heard Monday's uh, presentation, but we've got some additional work to do. Thanks. Councillor McHattie. Councillor Partridge. Um, actually, I'm on the, after all of the motions, I would prefer to remain on the list, but to speak at the end of all this. Thanks. At the end of all this. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. So, as I said an hour ago, if this is for information, this motion is, in light of the fact that I haven't had an increase in three years, but we just want to see how ridership's doing, the whole area rated thing with the suburbs, which transit still is. Uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, through to Don. Don, do you understand the intent of the motion, please, just for a comment from you? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I've been taking notes, trying to capture everything that members of council are looking for. If I could, could I read back through my list just to confirm that uh, yep. what council is expecting? Please. Uh, we would bring in um, a report that would include our original maintenance budget submission. That would be the cost of providing the same service in 2013 that we did in 2012. That would include the uh, revenue cost ratio. We would include um, all mitigation efforts up to and including March 1. And then we would provide another budget slide to indicate where we are after mitigation. And then we would provide a current budget request less the impact of fuel, a current budget request less the impact of AODA. And then we would provide uh, some information on a fare increase, the history of a fare increase that council is familiar with seeing, um, a current Hamilton comparison to the rest of the GTA, and the annualized impact, revenue impact of a 5, 10, and 15 percent, or 15 cent fare increase. And a new slide that maybe you haven't seen in the past that I think you're asking for is transit's historical uh, fare uh, revenue uh, performance uh, over, the, uh, over the last couple of years and, uh, and a summary of investments in transit over the past decade. Would that meet Council's expectations, Mr. Deputy Mayor? So that sounds like a robust um, interpretation of uh, the motion and as far as I'm concerned that sounds like that's going to have even more information than um, maybe was initially requested but Don um, I'm okay with that I just want to stay on this motion and stay right now I want to get ridership up and anytime you increase the fares usually ridership goes down and it has a negative impact so but if my colleagues want that information since we haven't had it for two or three years I'm okay getting the information uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, but I just want to stay where I'm where I'll be uh, positioning myself down the road on this matter. Thank you Thank you, Councillor Jackson. I have Councillor Marilla then Councillor Powers. Councillor Marilla. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor And just along the same lines, I think just as a point of clarification uh, Council Ferguson and I spoke offline and originally uh, the intent was to come back Asking staff for a recommendation potentially as, a, as an increase what he is asking for however now is not for that but just the the breakdown of, of the general levy costs versus that of the fare box and what percentage we're at uh, with respect to that information. I, I think that's a valuable exercise to, to evaluate. Um, everyone recognizes that I will never support an increase. I believe it should be going the other way where we're decreasing fares and increasing ridership. And, and it's not about uh, social assistance, it's about equity with respect to the, the money we spend on, on capital with respect to roads and vehicular traffic and the lack of investment from the general levy for those that are that are on the HSR who are basically double taxed. So in essence, not only are they paying residential taxes, but they're also paying a fare within within the HSR, which to me is double taxation and it's not equitable considering the tens of millions of dollars. And there is a legitimate um, there's a legitimate argument to be said about tolling the the expressway, which I would never support, based on the same premise. Because if we're going to go down the road of, of really being equitable, then we should look at the general levy paying the entire bill for, for public transit uh, or look at tolling uh, highways and roads because it's, the same, because it's basically the same principle. So why would we, why would we uh, be so inequitable is really the question. So having said that, I think this is, a, I, I want to thank Council Ferguson uh, for basically evaluating the information as opposed to uh, pushing the agenda, particularly on the area rating issue. I'm not prepared to, to support the elimination of area rating in public transit 
where people in flame rule uh, that don't have it are paying for it. I'm not, I'm not at that point. So having said that, I, I think it's fair to acknowledge that if we're willing to pay for it, then I think because of the synergy that exists between the suburbs and the inner city, that we, we continue in an amicable fashion. And, and I, I believe by allowing us to, to, to be empowered throughout that process does just that. And I appreciate your time, Mr. Deputy Mayor, and I will support uh, the recommendation as it's before us. Thank you for those comments, Councillor Marula. Councillor Powers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Could I direct a question to Mr. Hull, please? Mr. Hull? Sorry, Mr. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Sorry. Um, in your summation of the uh, the intentions raised by members of council and, and Councillor uh, Ferguson's motion, I did not hear you mention area rating at all, even though that's part of the uh, of, of the thing, or I just missed that in your comments. Um, good catch, Mr. Deputy Mayor. I wrote it down and then didn't speak it when, but entirely we will provide a breakout by ward and we'll work with uh, Mike's department on that. Thank and you very much. Thank you. Good catch, Councillor Powers. Councillor Whitehead. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I certainly support the, uh, the, the, the intent and the principle. I think we need all the information. I just want to be careful. Uh, when we talk about the vehicle, they get uh, heavily taxed on gas. They get heavily taxed on tire tax. Uh, there's tax on, on, on the purchase of vehicles. Uh, so the car owner actually gets taxed significantly uh, to own it, not to, mention, not to mention the jobs that it creates in the economy. Uh, it's one of the major drivers in southern Ontario, quite frankly, is the, the auto industry. So I just be careful about uh, uh, vilifying uh, the vehicle. The second piece is uh, when, I talk, when we talk about equity, uh, my issue and concern is, is that there has to be a balanced approach. I, I don't have a problem with Councillor McCaddy's uh, issue that we need to reinvest in, in services. The services are obviously, in certain areas of the city, uh, dismal. And uh, we talked about Rymer Road, for example, and the frequency on Rymer Road is, uh, is just not adequate. Uh, we have an hour to get from McMaster University to Garth and Stone Church for any resident that wants to travel, and yet they're paying the same amount on their house levy as the people that have a B line and get a service every 15 minutes. So obviously there's an equity in regards to who's paying for what and the service level that they receive. So I, 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 the only reason I say that because it's, 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 it's the backdrop, it's the context. It's not like I'm looking for uh, to alleviate the taxpayers in my community from the service, but there needs to be a balance in the context of uh, who's taking the transit and what the cost uh, is being, or sorry, the, the revenue that's been generated at the, uh, the fare box. And that has to be balanced with those kinds of issues because it's great when you're in a lower city and you have uh, a great le level of service. Yeah, you, yeah, you want, you got the service, you're prepared to pay for it, but we don't have that level of service. We need to reinvest that in, in, into uh, areas where we don't, but you can't continue asking uh, taxpayers to pay disproportionately amount of money on their levy for a service they don't receive so that others can get a better benefit without going to the fare box and asking for an equitable, uh, an equitable uh, uh, distribution of those dollars as well. So uh, I support the intent. It'll be another debate when we uh, deal with those issues. Uh, but again, to treat so, uh, transit like it's a social service uh, uh, a piece what it really is about providing a service for all then we have to we have to address that in that with that lens and uh, so going forward I look forward to that debate thank you Councillor Whitehead Councillor Partridge yes thank you I'm hoping I can save about another hour or two of debate here could we uh, call the motion please Okay. On the motion, Councillor Ferguson, seconded by Councillor Powers. All in favor? Carried. Any opposed? Carries. Thank oh, you. Councillor Powers. Oops. Councillor Farr and Councillor. We just voted on the motion. We vote on the motion. You're opposed. Councillor McKay's opposed, and Councillor Farr. Anybody else? None. Okay. Record that, please, Carol. Let's Carol. Move along. Move along. Sam. Councillor Ferguson. Do you want me to move the $4 million in savings less the um, Winterfest? I'd be happy to do that to keep, to keep moving. We're not there Place. yet. Yes, you do. We're not there yet. Right now, we're still dealing with the motions. Right. And then 
Correct. And then you would be dealing with the staff reports in the order of, of the agenda. And the first one is the advisory committees, the budgets. The second would be the boards and agencies. And then the third is the staff report on the department budgets. And that's where Appendix A exists with the enhancements that has the um, savings. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. So, with motions, then we've got Councillor. Well, I've got Councillor Collins and Councillor Marula. Whoever wishes to go first. I can go first. Councillor Collins. Uh, okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor okay. Collins. Uh, move by myself, seconded by Councillor Morelli. Move by myself, seconded by Councillor Morelli, that staff be directed uh, to bring a report back to the General Issues Committee which details the city's financial obligations as a result of downloading, reassessment, heads and beds, and pills to provide an understanding of how and why the budget starts in a deficit situation each and every year. And just a brief synopsis, um, as we unfolded the, this budgetary period, clearly over and above the $120 million of downloading, there are other uh, relationship issues with the province which are in financially abusive to the residential taxpayer. That being, uh, as as it was stated clearly by uh, by Councillor Collins, with respect to this reassessment issue, which is a three point three point one million dollar impact in this budgetary period, which uh, and then boxes boxes this municipality into accepting, because even if we try to shift it back onto the commercial and industrial, we're prevented through legislation. The heads and beds and, and pills issue, which Councillor White and I uh, brought uh, forward a couple of years back, also acknowledges it's a potentially $10 million. So collectively, we're looking at about $130 million every year to restart off in a deficit situation as a result of provincial legislation and nothing to do with this, this council or the city. And for that, needs, this needs to be addressed, but we also need to highlight it to the public, most importantly, because uh, a change in legislation always occurs from political pressure, and the only way we can create this political pressure is by creating awareness, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Carrie. Thank you, Councilor Morello. That motion moved by you, second by Councilor Morelli. All in favor? Carrie. Any opposed? Thank you, Carries. Uh, we're good. Okay, Councilor Collins. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Jackson that staff be directed to bring a report back to the General Issues Committee outlining what measures can be taken both through internal staff resources and through AMO and inquiries of other municipalities to address the challenge issue to address, the, to address and challenge issues that are detrimental to municipalities with respect to restricting assessment growth. Councillor Collins that's moved by yourself and seconded by Councillor Jackson. Any discussion? Councillor Council Powers? Right, I'd, I'd appreciate if Councillor Collins could help me in what he's asking for. I think staff are nodding their heads too. Basically it was the, um, the whole issue related to the, the appeals process. And so I had originally written um, with, all the of appeals yeah, that with all the appeals and the money we're losing through that. Right. Um, Everybody's good? Okay. On that motion, all in favor? Carry. Any opposed? Thank you. That carries. Councillor Collins, do you have another motion there? That was the Winterfest motion, but I'm not certain based I'm on Carolyn sure, yeah. when we want you wanted. Okay, I'm just looking down here. Councillor Jackson. Mr. Deputy Mayor, I'll get us moving on all the volunteer committee budget requests, all the 5.1s through to 5.15. I will move them in their entirety. Seconded by Councillor Jason Farr. Thank you. We're moving all of those in entirety. That's good. Second. So moved by yourself, Councillor Jackson, and seconded by Councillor Farr. All in favor? Carry. Any opposed? Five. Carries. Thank you. I'm moving faster than I can keep up here. On to five point. Councillor Jackson. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, on boards and agencies, Carolyn, we're on 5.2. So, with the chart Mike Zagarek has up here, I would just ask that item one, item three, and item 20 
be deferred, and I would move the balance of the ABCs, Mr. Deputy Mayor. One, three, and 20. One being Hamilton Police Services, three being HECFI, and 20 being Community Partnership Program. You're moving that, seconded by? Councillor Partridge. Councillor Farr. I thought I heard uh, Mr. Zagarek say we could move on HECFI just through you, just for clarity. I'm very supportive of the motion. So if Mike, you can be clear on that. Mike. So through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, you have two options. Uh, given that the objective uh, with respect to HECFI is to determine whether or not there's any potential savings as it relates to 2013, you could defer HECFI or you could approve HECFI and we would incorporate any savings in our corporate financials. So again, you have two options. You could either defer it or you can approve HECFI and we would incorporate any potential savings in our corporate financials. Given the first half of that answer, I think I understand where the mover is coming from, what the intentions are. So he would probably wish to keep number three in the motion. Yes, so so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, keep it at that then. Thank you. Councilor Partridge? Yeah, no, I'm seconding the motion and I would agree too. We need to keep HECFI um, in, in that motion. My question through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor, if anyone would care to listen. Um, not a problem. Um, through you to Mike. Okay, thank you. Yes. Council through Parker, through you, you to Mike. Floor. Go yes, ahead. I do. Thank you. Mike, um, with regards to the transition funding with HECFI, what date are we looking at for the cutoff to realize if there is any savings? What is that date? So through you, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor, I would look to try to engage members from that team before March 21st. That's our last scheduled budget GIC before uh, we're scheduled to take it to Council on March 27th. If we have an update by March 7th, we could bring it forward to uh, budget GIC on March 7th. Okay, that's fine. I think, I think um, hearing those dates and particularly as we're getting close to the end of March to really know if there's any uh, transitional savings there, um, I would prefer to keep it in the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Partridge. Councillor Whitehead. As to our illustrious president of the AMO, um, MPAC, my understanding is number 19 is legislated. Um, can I just have an understanding, because I mean, these costs are seem to be going up fairly significantly as well. Where are we at with the province on dealing with this particular issue? We meet, uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, AMO, the board of directors meets on an annual basis. In fact, our next meeting is uh, coming up within, uh, within the next six weeks, I think it is. Uh, we raise the issues. Uh, one of the challenges that we have is the uh, is the ability of MPAC just to unilaterally increase their fees uh, to municipalities for uh, services that we say are, um, I'm going to say, not accountable. It's just deemed to be automatic increases. So uh, we're having a meeting with the, the chairman of the board and the president of uh, MPAC uh, to discuss these things along with the issues raised such as Councillor Collins did, the uh, the elements of, uh, of forestry lands, changing those. So we've got a quite an outstanding list of items that we have uh, forwarded to uh, MPAC. We'll include the issue of Councillor Collins. I'm sure it's already there so that when we meet with him in the six week period and that, I'll report back on, we had a, um, we get a response, a written response from MPAC that is, uh, that is uh, um, public, it's usually, uh, published afterwards in the, uh, in the, in the AMO um, um, things, but uh, I'll make sure that we get a report back on that. Okay, I appreciate it. So uh, then would it be your opinion that we should uh, also uh, uh, remove 19 until that report comes back, or should we uh, uh, endorse it today? Um, knowing the uh, speed of turtles that uh, MPAC operates on, I would suggest you leave that figure in right now. Um, the likelihood of anything changing during our fiscal year may very well ch change in the provincial fiscal year may happen, but um, rather in, in, in reality, just leave it the way it is and, uh, and there may be some savings. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. So, Councillor Jackson. Deputy Mayor, I'm moving all the ABCs except for item 1, 3, and 20 for a further time. One, three, Thank you. Councillor, Second. uh, seconded by Councillor Partridge. Councillor Partridge. All in favor? Carry. Any opposed? It carries. Thank you. On to 
Members of the committee have before item 5.3 respect to the 2013 tax support operating budget. No? Councillor Collins. Madam Clerk. Oh, sorry. Can you come back to that one? Can you give us the go ahead? Yes. Back so up. I'll move to take the Winterfest uh, cut off the list, please. Moved by Councillor Collins. Moving the balance of the. Councillor Marula seconding that. Councillor. Second, okay. Councillor Whitehead. I got 5.3 report in front of me, and it says that the planning and economic development operating budget appendix to do exclusive amendments as per. So is that what we're moving today? So is there two different 5.3s? No, I think we're still back on the reduction. Okay, I, well, I, I just heard it was alluded, alluded to that we're dealing with 5.3, no, and I have 5.3 in front of me, and that's we're not we're back consistent. Up. I understand Sorry. that, but is that, how is it 5.3 then? How is we're, that 5.3? Backing, I'm backing up. We're finishing the motion. So, Carolyn, help me. For clarification, what um, is being moved at the moment is item Appendix A to the report in item 5.3. So this, this, this list is being approved in isolation of the balance of the budget okay. items in the report. Thank you. I just want that clarity because I didn't, I wasn't supporting the balance of 5.3. Thank you. So back, Councillor Farr. That this uh, Winterfest issue, but I do have a question with respect to something else in the confines of 5.3 of this report. Okay, let's back up. Councillor Collins. Taking Winterfest off and moving the balance of the reduction right, package. That's Winterfest coming off, second by yeah. Councilor Marilla, and second removing the, like, the balance, okay? All in favor? Very. Any opposed? None. Thank you. Councilor Farr. Um, yeah, on uh, Appendix B, page 104, uh, the Planning and Economic Development uh, B5 item, Super Crawl Funding. I don't, I don't uh, want to, uh, uh, just to be privy to the time, I just wanted to be clear, maybe through you to the clerk, uh, with respect to a motion that I've worked on with Neil Everson and, um, and a conversation that I actually had with Carolyn yesterday and the assistance I received from Carolyn yesterday. I'm just trying to get an idea on the appropriate time through you, Mr. Deputy uh, Mayor. Carolyn? Um. Through the chair, at, at the point that the committee is prepared to discuss each of the items in Appendix B, uh, if they choose to go line by line to discuss each one, at that point, when you reach, when you get to B5, then the motion on super call can be put forward at that time. Wonderful. Now, I, I'm understanding that the, just based on previous discussion and a whisper just now, it looks like we're going to defer 5-3 anyway. Um, so that's uh, good to know, and thank you very much. Drew Blank, sorry. <laughs> no. Balance is being Councillor Jackson. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, on 5 3, except for what we unanimously approve with Councillor uh, Collins and Marula's motion on the reductions, except okay. for Winterfest, I would move that we defer the rest of 5.3, which is the departmental budgets at okay. this time. All right. Thank you. Councillor Jackson moved deferred, second by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor of that? Yes. All right. Five point four. Received, Councillor Jackson. Seconded by Count. Second by Councillor Johnson. Oh, any discussion? All in favor? Okay. Five point five. Councillor Jackson. Seconded by Councillor Whitehead. All in favor? Thank you. Five point six. Councillor pen is heavy. Councillor <laughs> Far. I want to thank uh, staff for the uh, information they gathered with uh, 5.6. I'm uh, predicting that everyone just wanted to receive it, so I wanted to jump on that and uh, an answer to uh, my question from uh, much earlier in these budget deliberations. So just an opportunity at this uh, point to say thanks to Mike and his staff for putting this together. I will move to receive it. Move to receive it. Seconded by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? Thank you. And then 5.7. 
Councillor Jackson. So, Mr. Deputy Mayor, with Councillor Powers as our Chair of Grants Committee, just putting all members of Council on notice, I'd be happy to defer this at this time, letting Community Partnership Program and the Grants Subcommittee do its work, but we may be coming back if the police aren't more cooperative with their costs for our special events in our community that they're passing on to volunteers, that we're just putting a, a, members of Council on notice, we may need a 2% increase in order to cover off those police costs, but at this time I'll move to defer 5.7. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Okay. Moved by Councillor. Second up, Councillor Pearson was ahead. Councillor Pearson second that. All in favor? Deferring? Thank you. Um, we're on to motions now. Members of the committee, any motions? Do I need to ask if I need to put a motion about the agricultural and rural affairs, or is that just direction that was given? Thank you, Mike. It's direction on that, okay. Um, okay. Members of committee, as previously advised, we have we have a delegation request from John Sloblosian, Minister of Transportation, is requesting to present on March the 20th, GIC meeting, provide an update on Niagara to GTA corridor. What is the committee's pleasure? Moved by Councillor Partridge, seconded by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? Thank you. Any other items of general information or business here today? Councillor Powers? Being the last day of the month, it's the last day for you as Deputy Dog, and on behalf of all of us, uh, we want to thank you for your leadership. Uh, um, it's been a real fun experience, certainly for us here, maybe not for you and that, but, uh, but certainly with the assistance of the clerk's department and yourself going through some um, multiple long and very intense meetings, we appreciate your leadership on this and getting us to this point and uh, and uh, we'll feel for the uh, counselor who assumes the responsibilities in the month of March and just get it out of the way because I take over in April. If I could please ask for a motion to cancel Monday's GIC meeting formally, please. Okay, moved by Councillor Parker, second by Councillor Pearson to cancel Monday's GIC motion. All in favor? Okay, and uh, Councillor Powers, thank you. I thought when I was taking on on uh, February, it looked pretty lean, and uh, I tried to get a vacation in January, but it has been uh, time-consuming. It's been somewhat fun and, and confusing at times, too, but uh, i try my best, but I appreciate the, the confidence. So, motion to stand adjourned. Moved by Councillor Powers, seconded by Councillor Pearson. All in favor? Thank you.